Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Clerk. Government business notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Leader of the Government of the Senate relating to an apology to the stolen generation. Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I have uh, great uh, pleasure in moving the motion. Mr. President, I first want to acknowledge all the traditional owners on the land upon we meet today. I wish to acknowledge the presence of many Indigenous peoples in the Parliament and its surrounds who are part of what we know as the Stolen Generations. I also want to acknowledge the many Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous across Australia who are listening or watching the Parliament this morning although probably more likely the House of Representatives. Mr President, today is a very important occasion in the history of our nation and this parliament. Today is not just about our past, it's also about our future. For many Australians, today means confronting and accepting what has gone before and acknowledging our values of civility, fairness and compassion that hopefully will guide us in our future endeavours. The motion uh, we move today, Mr Chairman, uh, Mr President, says that we honour the Indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in, in, in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations, this blemished chapter in our nation's history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on those our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for the families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. We, the Parliament of Australia, respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered, as part of the healing of the nation. For the future we take heart, resolving that this new page in the history of our great continent can now be written. We today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians, a future where this parliament resolves that the injustices of the past must never, never happen again, a future where we harness the determination of all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us in life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity, a future where we embrace the possibility of new solutions to enduring problems where old approaches have failed, a future based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility, a future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country, Australia. Mr President, uh, nearly 10 years ago, on the 27th of May 1997, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission released its report, Bringing Them Home. The report was a result of a national inquiry which was established by the Keating government in August 1995. The report was dedicated <coughs> to the generations of Aboriginal children taken from their families and communities who are still searching for home and to the memory of the children who will never return. The inquiry visited every state and territory 
and most regions of Australia. It took evidence in public and private from Indigenous people, government and church representatives, former mission staff, foster and adoptive parents, doctors and health professionals, academics, police and others. Most hearings were conducted by Sir Ronald Wilson, the Heriot President, and Mick Dodson, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. We are indebted to these two great Australians. In each major region throughout Australia, an Indigenous Commissioner was appointed to assist with the hearings. An Indigenous Advisory Council with representatives from all the regions also assisted the inquiry. A total of 770 people and organisations provided evidence or a submission. Some 535 were Indigenous people. Most had been removed as children. Others were parents of siblings or children of removed children. The report found that somewhere between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families between 1910 and 1970. We do not know how many were separated prior to 1910. Indeed, we do not know with certainty how many children were removed from their families. But we do know that Indigenous children were placed in institutions, church missions, adopted or fostered, and were at risk of physical and sexual abuse. And many, of course, did not receive wages for their labour. The practice was on such a large scale and over such a long <coughs> period, continuing so close to the present day, that its effect cannot be dismissed as olden times. It is our responsibility. The truth is in the past and is very much with us today in the effects on the lives of Indigenous Australians. There are some, I know, who still believe that the removal of Indigenous children was good. Some removals, uh, it is argued, were part of a broad welfare system which decided what was in the best interests of the children. But the truth is, the stolen generation were removed from their families because of their culture, their colour and their race, because they were considered inferior, because non-Indigenous Australians thought that they could do better. Thousands of Indigenous people grew up without the love of their parents or the love of their brothers and sisters. Many never knew who they were or where they came from. These policies did break down families, clans and tribes, and played a key role in dislocating communities, depriving many of them the bonds that bind communities and depriving them of family and cultural legacies. After the release of the report, many of the stolen generations made a request for an apology. They said that this would have meaning by showing that Australians recognised their hurt and pain and accepted that what had been done to them was wrong. It was a heartfelt request because they said this would help the healing process. <coughs> the stolen generations are real people. Let's think of them as individuals as well. It is to them that we belatedly offer our apology. Since that time, apologies were given in state parliaments in New South Wales, Queensland, WA, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania, and in the parliaments of the ACT and Northern Territory. Words of apology have been said in churches, in public meetings and in private conversations. They have been discussed and debated Australia-wide. But until now, no apology has been offered in this place by an Australian government. And that has been wrong. The stolen generations have been deeply damaged by the decisions of this parliament and of governments. Their suffering was a product of the deliberate policies of the state as reflected in the explicit powers given under statute. There are countless moving stories from many thousands of Aboriginal people who were taken from their families involuntarily. I was particularly touched by the story of Sandra Hill, who says today's apology from the Parliament will be the biggest thing to happen in her life. I'd like to recount part of her story, which was uh, published in the Sunday Times of Perth last weekend for the benefit of the Senate today. Sandra is a professional artist, a mother of three children and grandmother to five children who lives in the southwest of uh, WA in Ballingup. Sandra is also a strong, resilient and proud Noongar woman who was forcibly taken from her parents in 1958 at the age of six. <coughs> Along with her two sisters and younger brother, Sandra was taken uh, to Sister Kate's children's home where they lived for two years before being fostered out to a white family. It would be 27 years before those children saw their parents again. And I'd like to recount some of Sandra's story as only her words can do justice to the experiences that her and her family endured. 
and she says, you can't begin to imagine the sense of loss that I and so many like me have experienced. My children were the first free children born into my family for four generations, and I celebrate every day that we share together as a family. My heart aches for my mum and dad. To lose a child is bad enough. To lose four young children in one fell, fell swoop is incomprehensible. Our removal forced mum to not only relive her experiences, but also that of her father and grandfather. Both were surrendered to the monks at Nunosia. In 1933, the native welfare swooped down on my grandparents' camp in Caversham. They took my mother, Doreen, and her sister, Hilda, who were seven and ten at the time. She was taken to Moore River Native Settlement and then transferred, due to her fair skin, to Sister Kate's home for half-castes at Buckland Hill. The authorities changed her name and her birth date so that her parents couldn't trace her. Over a period of 23 years, from 1933, my grandparents lost six children to the welfare authorities, ending in 1956 with their youngest daughter, Baronia. Mum could barely talk about the family's experience without enormous distress, even after 60 years. No education, material gain, or so-called opportunities could or would ever be a fair trade-off for losing the ones you love. My family was my world, and it was stolen from me and my siblings. And if I could go back in time, I would choose to stay where I belonged, where my spirit and my heart still live with my beloved mum and dad. She goes on to say, we don't want to relegate blame or guilt. That would be counterproductive. However, recognition and acknowledgement of the profound and far-reaching effects <laughs> that past policies have had on my people is critical in helping us to move forward into a more positive and inclusive future. I've listened to many of the stolen generations tell us their stories over the years while working on committees of this parliament and, and uh, in moving around the electorate. You're always struck by the dignity with which those stories are told. And the thing that strikes me most is the lack of bitterness, the lack of thought of vengeance. Uh, and I defy anyone not to be moved by those stories. Don't think of them as a generation or, or, or under the title we give them. Think of them as individual people. It's been written uh, that, the, the, that the pain and suffering cannot be addressed unless the whole community listens with an open heart and mind to the stories of what happened and having listened and understood, commits itself to repair the damage. It's awful to comp comprehend the pain and suffering of the children who were removed and the anguish of their parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles. The trauma of a removal is indescribable. Every parent fears the death of their children. The forcible separation from their children must have been equally traumatic. To have such a policy organised and sanctioned by the national government would only have added to the trauma and the feeling of helplessness. The past is always with us. It shapes the present and the future. It shapes who we are and how we behave. It determines the colour of our thinking, and we can only progress when we acknowledge the good and the bad that has happened. It's taken nearly 11 years since the report was published, but this morning, in the other place, the Prime Minister, on behalf of the Australian Parliament, offered an apology to the stolen generations. There is no more important place for these words to be said, because this parliament speaks for the nation. The Prime Minister apologised for the laws and policies of past governments, which caused profound grief and loss on many Indigenous Australians. And he promised that this will never happen again. He has committed us to a new beginning, a new national effort, and we must succeed. The response of the nation to today's apology has been wonderful. People are embracing the opportunity to do the right thing, to do what we teach our children to do, today to say sorry for doing something hurtful, and more important, importantly, to mean it. Non-Indigenous Australians should be proud that we are strong enough as a people to admit the wrong and to say sorry. I know that this is a day that many Indigenous Australians believed they would never live to see. It has been far too long coming. For that, I am sorry too. And we acknowledge that those who did not live to see this day, to their descendants we say sorry for the pain and hurt 
suffered over generations and the loss of identity, family and country that can never be restored. Now much has been said and written in the past few weeks about the symbolism of an apology and its significance. Some people have argued that the symbolic act of saying sorry will somehow undermine or even replace the practical reforms needed to fix the huge gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I believe the opposite is true, and I'm mindful of what Sir William Dean said, and I'd like to quote him. It is simply to assert our identity as a nation and the basic fact that national shame, as well as national pride, can and should exist in relation to past acts and omissions, at least when done or made in the name of the community or with the authority of government. When there is no room for national pride or national shame about the past, there can be no national soul. Mr President, saying sorry gives us the impetus to move on. It reminds us of our responsibilities as citizens, as members of the Australian community, to help those in society less well off. It's the next step in the huge task of closing the gap. Yes, it's arguably a symbolic gesture, but symbols are important by definition in sending a strong message which I believe will help us tackle the substance of the issue, removing the inequalities that exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. We know that the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Australians remains dramatically worse than the rest of the community as a whole. Many still endure inadequate health services, overcrowded and substandard housing, poor access to education and barriers in getting a job. Alcohol and drugs are crippling communities and child abuse is evident. Entrenched health problems are denying Indigenous Australians a future and progress to improve their health status has been slow under successive governments. The inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is stark. The 17-year life expectancy gap remains one of the starkest indicators of inequality in Australian society. Current rates of Indigenous life expectancy are comparable to those of other Australians in the 1920s. Third, worlds like, third world diseases like rheumatic fever and trachoma <coughs> persist, and there are high rates of chronic disease, including renal failure, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Now, the government, and I think the parliament, comprehends the enormity of closing this gap, and we know it can only be done in a mutually responsible partnership with Indigenous Australians. That's why we seek the support of the whole parliament. The government is making a concerted effort to ensure the fundamentals of a decent life are shared by Indigenous Australians. Good health, nutrition, a safe and comfortable home, a high quality education and the opportunity to share in the dividends of our, econ our economy through work. We are determined to make sure that all children, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, have the same healthy future. Within a decade, we pledge to halve the gap in mortality rates between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children under the age of five. Such goals, such targets are important. And in the same period, we want to bridge, halve the gap in reading, writing and numeracy. To do this, we are providing comprehensive funding for child and maternal health services, early development and parenting support, and literacy and numeracy in the early years. Health services have been ex expanded and improved. The government is prioritising the expansion of alcohol detoxification and rehabilitation services across the Northern Territory. And we're also expanding sobering up shelters in Catherine and Tennant Creek so that alcohol abusers can be accommodated in a safe environment. Giving Indigenous children the best chance for a bright future requires a sound foundation of education and training. Literacy and numeracy are the building blocks, but currently the performance of Indigenous children often falls far behind. Now this won't still be good enough. We have no illusions about the extent and complexity of the challenges before us. But we must close the gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, and we must close the infant mortality gap for young Indigenous children. What we must understand from the past is that we cannot do this for Indigenous Australians. Paternalism, new or old, does not work. We must find solutions together with Indigenous Australians and empower them to overcome the enormous barriers to equal opportunity in our society. Now, today's motion is uh, much different from the way we normally conduct business. The motion will be supported by the alternative government and other senators around the chamber. <coughs> I think that's vital for Indigenous Australians to accept this, this apology. 
has to be from all of us and it has to be meant. Hopefully the broad support for the apology will be a platform for a more bipartisan approach to attack, attack the inequalities between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. It's with regret in the past that Indigenous policy became an ideological issue to be fought over. It would be good to think that today marks an end to the ideological battles of the past and a willingness on all sides to work together with Indigenous Australians. For too long, the ideological battles of politicians have been at the expense of Indigenous people. These are our challenges for the future. The responsibility for a just and equitable future for Indigenous Australians falls on all our shoulders. Today, this parliament on behalf of the nation has taken a powerful step in this regard. The apology today is not about imposing guilt or shame on this generation of Australians. It's not about attributing personal blame. It is the acknowledgement of the injustices and mistakes of the past and its ex an acceptance of what has happened. And it can also be the next step in reconciliation. It's now up to us as a nation to write, as the Prime Minister pledged in the other place this morning, to bring together Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, government and opposition, Commonwealth and state, to write a new chapter in our nation's story. I commend the motion to the Senate. Senator Minchin. I rise to speak to the motion uh, just moved by Senator Evans in relation to an apology to those Indigenous Australians that were forcibly removed from their families and communities under laws of past uh, state and federal governments. Uh, while the coalition does support the motion, I must say at the outset that we do have strong objections to the way in which the government has handled uh, this matter. Uh, an apology has been Labor policy for many years, and they've now been in government for nearly three months. But it was only last night that MPs and senators were able to see the wording of the motion to be put to the House and Senate. And not only that, the government has insisted that a vote be taken on the motion after only a limited number of speakers and before everyone who wants to speak has had that opportunity. Uh, the government's handling of this sensitive matter, uh, frankly, has been arrogant in our view and disrespectful of the parliament in, whom, who, in whose name this apology is to be made. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as we have announced, the Coalition will support this motion. Uh, we have given a very lengthy consideration of this matter in our party room. We admit it has not been an easy issue for any of us or for the millions of Australians that we represent. The debate about an apology has, of course, um, been held previously in this parliament, and state parliaments across the country have made some form of apology or statement of regret for the actions of the past. As parliamentarians, I think we have a big responsibility to ensure that these issues are debated for the right reasons. And in this case, it is about making sure that we see better outcomes for Indigenous Australians and we all work to overcome obvious Indigenous disadvantage. As I say, we've given a lot of thought to this matter for a decade. Uh, when uh, our government responded to the Bringing Them Home report in 1997, the then Prime Minister John Howard expressed his profound personal sorrow but stated that the coalition did not believe, and I quote, that Australians of this generation should be required to accept guilt and blame for past actions and policies over which they had no control. That was a view sincerely held by our government and which was, I think, shared by many Australians at that time. And I must say that one should always approach with caution any proposition which involves judging past actions by contemporary standards or seeking to hold one generation responsible for the actions of those who came before. And I should also state for the record that our government was concerned that a formal statement of apology could trigger a substantial number of claims for compensation, which we felt then would be both very divisive and, if successful, an unjustified burden on current taxpayers. We remain of that view in relation to the issue of compensation. Uh, we note that while the government has ruled out any compensation, uh, this motion is silent on that matter. Uh, I note that Senator Brown proposes to move an amendment on that matter, and I give notice now of our opposition to an amendment relating to compensation. But in light of our reservations about a formal apology, in 1999 the then Prime Minister moved a statement of regret in the House of Representatives. That statement reaffirmed the Parliament's commitment to reconciliation, acknowledged the mistreatment of many Indigenous Australians over a significant period that represents the most blemished chapter in our national history and expressed the Parliament's deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practice of past generations. 
and for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continued to feel as a consequence of those practices. The intent of that statement remains as relevant today as it was nearly 10 years ago, but we do acknowledge that Indigenous Australians affected by the policies of the past need more than our sympathies and regret in order for them to accept the sincerity of our nation's remorse for past practices. It's been a long road since that national inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, the Bringing Them Home report. May I say that Brendan Nelson's contribution to that debate after the release of that report is as poignant and emotive today as it was then. His strong sense of humanity and commitment to our Indigenous Australians helped to ensure that the Coalition would move to support this motion today. Dr Nelson is to be commended for his leadership on this issue which, as I said, is not an easy one for the men and women of the Liberal and National Parties and the millions of Australians we do represent. But Dr Nelson was right when he stated back then that this is not a question of our generation or those subsequent carrying guilt. It is about understanding what was done and the consequences of it. We now understand and accept that this apology is the right thing to do. We accept that the Australian people want this parliament to come together to settle this matter. Our policy on this matter has evolved against the background of our strong faith in the importance of families and the impact on families of the policies of forced removal does not sit well with what our parties fundamentally believe in. And when we look at the individual stories of those affected by separations, we do find hurt, damage, regrets and in many cases justifiable anger. But we also find that those who implemented these policies were in many cases acting in what they then believed were in the best interests of the children at the time. And of course, any civilised society has laws to provide for the protection of children from harm, including from their own families. Such laws exist today in Australia, but regrettably do not always operate to protect Australia's vulnerable children. And this is a fundamental argument about who knows what is best for children in our society, and it's a debate still ongoing. We trust that even today state government officers around the country do act appropriately when they remove children at risk, even from their parents. The danger, of course, is in creating a perception that removal is always wrong. Ultimately, authorities must act to protect, to protect children at risk. So the balance between the sanctity of the family on the one hand and the state's responsibility for the protection of children is never easy to achieve, and of course especially so in the case of Aboriginal children. Mr President, the last decade has seen uh, much action and many programs <coughs> in relation to Indigenous affairs, and this chamber has been very active in that matter, and the former government implemented a number of significant reforms as we turned away from what we perceived to be political correctness to focus on real results. The former government had at the forefront of its policy for Indigenous Australians, ensuring better outcomes. Our policies were admittedly about substance. They weren't about symbolism. And John, John Howard was not the barrier to an apology. It cannot be said of our government in any way that we did not do our utmost to ensure that Indigenous people in this country received adequate support or that our reforms did not help reduce the disadvantage facing our Indigenous communities. I personally had the privilege of spending a considerable amount of time in our Indigenous communities during the first three years of our government when I had executive responsibility for native title. And I therefore experienced firsthand the enormous disadvantage suffered by people in many of our more remote Indigenous communities. And negotiating native title reform with Indigenous leaders in their communities was a difficult but personally very enriching experience. Native title, I think, is just one aspect of Indigenous affairs where our determination to implement practical improvements were of course met with hostility, but which we can now see have resulted in real advances. Our reforms to the way in which we deal with native title claims have resulted in much better outcomes for all involved. And as a coalition, we are proud of our overall achievements in Indigenous affairs. Expenditure on Indigenous-specific programs and services in our last budget um, was set at $3.5 billion for the current financial year, a 39 per cent real increase uh, from the levels of 95-96 when we came to office. More Indigenous Australians are participating in our strong economy, including a fall in the unemployment rate among them from 30 per cent 
1994 to just 12.8 per cent in 0405. Over the same period, Indigenous long-term unemployment has fallen from 14.2 per cent to 5.1 per cent. And although more improvements need to be made in the fields of health and education, there are some positive signs, including a 16 per cent decrease in the Indigenous mortality rate in the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia from 1991 to 2003. So we have seen some real and significant improvements, but of course we acknowledge that there's a very long way to go to ensure that Indigenous Australians are on an equal footing and no longer feel shamed by past policies. One of the most significant steps of our government was the introduction of emergency measures in the Northern Territory just last year to protect Aboriginal children from abuse in their own communities. Our government launched this drastic but decisive action after the release of the Little Children a Sacred report to the Northern Territory Government. Like many here, I am a parent and particularly felt the repulsion caused by the revelations in that report. This is a most significant intervention. We must act to stop such abhorrent crimes against children in Indigenous communities and must establish the protection of the law. The measures in that intervention are worth noting. They were to increase police levels in prescribed townships, including secondments from other jurisdictions funded by the Australian government, introducing comprehensive voluntary health checks for all Aboriginal children, providing treatment and making referrals where necessary, improving governance by appointing managers of all government business in prescribed townships, widespread alcohol restrictions, banning the possession of X-rated pornography and introducing audits of publicly funded computers to identify illegal material, welfare reforms to stem the flow of cash going towards substance abuse and gambling, and to ensure funds meant to be for children's welfare are used for that purpose, enforcing school attendance, improving housing in townships through increased funding and introduction of market-based rents and tenancy arrangements. They are a very comprehensive set of interventions, and they were initiated by, initiated by our government in its single-minded pursuit of ensuring that Indigenous children no longer suffer abuse of any description. And that's why the Northern Territory intervention launched by John Howard is just so important. We do need to ensure that children in these communities can grow up without fear and grow up to reach their full potential. The intervention in the Northern Territory, I think, has also been pivotal in focusing the public's attention on the plight of Indigenous communities, and particularly of their children, and this intervention, its aims, its early successes, have helped bring us, the coalition, and I think the parliament and the nation, to where we are today. And of course, it raises broader questions about a community. Every one of us is and must be concerned about child abuse in every Australian community. And we need to ensure that all jurisdictions continue to work together to counter child abuse. I was a part of a government that may not have proposed a formal apology but did make sure that our Indigenous communities received assistance when and where they needed it most. If there was any failure on our part, it was in relation to the significance of symbolism in helping our Indigenous communities to move forward. We were unashamedly focused on practical outcomes, but we can now acknowledge that that was at the expense of important symbolic acts. The transition to support an apology for us and I think the people we represent has been a gradual process, but the report to the Northern Territory Government, that Little Children a Sacred report, was yet another wake-up call that I think did capture the attention of our population. The fact that such horrific abuse of children could be so prevalent today required that intervention, and it did require the nation's attention. There is, as Senator Evans has rightly said, so much more to be done, and I do hope this debate focuses the new government on ensuring funding to Indigenous communities is well managed and does deliver the results we all want. It is vitally important that the new government presses ahead with the measures adopted by the emergency intervention and doesn't just rest with the symbolism, important as it is, of today. We do accept that the lack of a formal apology from the federal government has been an impediment to better relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The coalition now recognises that this apology is very important to Indigenous Australians and that the parliament should adopt this motion in the interests of enhancing their hopes, their aspirations and their opportunities. But as important as this motion may be, our parliaments and governments must remain focused on delivering real results on the ground 
for disadvantaged Indigenous Australians. We can only do that by maximising their chances to take advantage of all the opportunities offered by this great country to lead a rich and rewarding life. So, Mr President, on behalf of Coalition Senators, I re-emphasise our commitment to our 1999 statement of regret, and I do now offer our support for the motion put by Senator Evans today as we apologise to all those Indigenous Australians affected by the policies of the past. Senator Scullion. And Mr President, uh, as, as I rise to speak to this motion, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of, the, of this country and their ancestors uh, that this motion is being put. Uh, like many people uh, in this place, Mr President, uh, their life's journey has been very varied before they became a senator. I was very lucky before entering the, senator, the Senate as a senator for the Northern Territory uh, to be engaged as both a commercial fisherman and a professional shooter. And as part of that process, I was uh, very privileged to work alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, not only working alongside them, but uh, living together as a family and often playing together. Um, as, as we worked together, many of these circumstances were fairly remote circumstances, so I had the opportunity at night where there's no television, normally around a fire, uh, for, many, for often many months at a time. And there's a two or three hours where we had an opportunity as the fire was dying down to just simply discuss things. That's all we had. And as people do, we discussed each other's life experiences. And uh, I had the great privilege to hear uh, a very different stories. Many people where I worked in Arnhem Land in particular, um, uh, the people were, have not been dispossessed. They had always had their own country. They always had connection to country. But there were also, also there were many people who had uh, been, were part of the stolen generation, uh, had been dispossessed, and many of them had a variety of views about, uh, about uh, a number of issues, but particularly an apology. And I have to say uh, that I have uh, been an apology cynic through much of that time, and as mates we had pretty robust discussions about uh, the practical applications of an apology and how that would have an effect on, on their lives. And I think it's important that I make that confession. Uh, I also had an, an opportunity last year to speak, uh, Mr President, uh, with a group of over 100 Indigenous men who were part of the Attorney-General's uh, leadership group. And there was a, an older group of men and a younger group of men. We met in, uh, in, in one of the, uh, the rooms in Parliament. And they'd asked me to give them a, uh, a presentation on my leadership journey. And as a pragmatist, I said, look, uh, you're not going to get often to get a pretty frank and forthright discussion with Chatham House rules with a minister in government. You should possibly spend more of your time discuss having a crack at that. And of course, it wasn't long into the conversation and someone said, well, if you were the Prime Minister, Nigel, and likely though it would ever be, would you, uh, would you say sorry? And uh, to declare myself as a cynic, and I said, no. And I went through and we had this discussion that, uh, as a pragmatist, I didn't really understand how it would help. We went through these processes and it was a bit of a distraction. Now, thanks to a long-term relationship with many people in that room and discussions we had after that, um, a number of people were able to convince me by their own stories of just how important this was. And though whilst it wasn't a practical step, um, the way that people felt, and it is so difficult, I believe now through this experience, to put yourselves in the feet of others, in the shoes of others. And uh, through, that, through that process, I have to say that uh, recognition of the past practices and the harm and the hurt uh, that have happened to many Indigenous people need to be acknowledged and we need to say sorry. The exact number of uh, children that have been involved and the exact number of people bearing internal wounds as a result of the removal under past government policies and practice may never be known, Mr President, and nor may the true number of people that shared that pain through not knowing their ancestral history or the fate of other family members. What I do know is that it is very important that we acknowledge the pain and suffering that resulted from those policies, and for that I say sorry. I'm also sincerely sorry that any individual or family has suffered through past government policies and practices, however well-intentioned or otherwise they may have been seen at the time by that government. I must also acknowledge that not all past Indigenous policies and practices of past and current governments of all persuasions have necessarily failed. And I would again cite the intervention, whilst it was fairly controversial. Uh, I think there are elements that everybody would agree that are very important policies. Uh, that uh, will be very positive to Indigenous communities. And I think there are positive aspects of policies in the past 
that we need, we need to look to uh, for the future. I think it's really important that uh, we learn from the past that we never repeat the failures and we must also, as I've said, learn from the positive aspects in, in, in regard to any future policies. I view today's significant motion as a very important acknowledgement and acceptance of previous actions and as a sincere apology to those personally who have suffered. Today's debate is a further step towards our collective better future and I believe should signal an end to the focus on the past and a step towards a new future. From here we must continue to move forward and it's so important that we move to forward together. And as the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. The policies of removing children from their families ended about 25 years ago. But I think it is so important, Mr President, that we recognise, unfortunately, and we acknowledge, unfortunately, that the rate at which Aboriginal children are now being removed from their families by welfare authorities has actually increased since then. And it and it's also should be acknowledged that the way in which they're removed is far better, and we've managed to ameliorate that. We've got a lot better communication. Normally, the time that they're removed is they are being removed uh, for a period of time until the environment they've been taken from has been, has been restored. But if you're going to be uh, fair dinkum uh, about this uh, apology and about this debate, um, I would hope that people don't take this as an assault against anyone or shouldn't really tarnish our, our, our future endeavours. And that's certainly not my intention here today. But unless we're honest with ourselves and accept the realities that many Indigenous communities still find themselves in, um, then I, I, I don't think we can move forward in a way that we should. Indigenous health, Indigenous education, social opportunity, uh, em employment opportunity still lag so far behind what is experienced and expected by many other Australians. The exposure to and uh, actual neglect and abuse is still far more prevalent in Indigenous communities than with other sectors of our community. These are real issues that confront not only, other, not only Indigenous uh, uh, in Australians but all Australians. Now, we must acknowledge these facts in order to address the underlying issues that have led to the present reality confronting many Indigenous people today. And I think we also need to acknowledge the policies that are happening today are having a similar effect to the policies of the past. And I would cite uh, the need to acknowledge that the contribution of unconditional welfare has had to the cycle of substance abuse and poverty in many of the Indigenous communities we have today. And I think if we fail from today to develop and implement effective policies that look very carefully at the past and, in fact, failures of the present, then I feel that some stage in the future there will be another generation of Australians apologising for our failures. Now, my vision for Australia is to have a nation where everyone is encouraged to add to our richness and collective cultural wealth while being unified as a single proud nation, sharing equally in the opportunities that this wonderful country has to offer. We are never going to achieve anything close to this vision if we refuse to accept that there are serious problems that are still present within some of our Indigenous communities. These problems will never be resolved without first accepting that they exist. We can no longer deny the problem simply because we don't see them, and as we move around through our daily lives we only read about them. They are real and that they exist, and they deserve to be dealt with immediately. To do, if we deny that this is happening, we we'll deny a future for the next generation of, of, of children, and this is totally unacceptable. Today's apology is recognition of the past and acceptance of the outcomes that resulted from those policies. More importantly, today's apology must constitute a significant step towards the future. Our rhetoric of today must be matched by all of our actions of tomorrow. Only then will we truly have a stake in our collective future. I and the Nationals are fully committed to doing everything that we can to make our future a brighter one for all Australians. Senator Allison. Mr President, I begin by acknowledging country and the Indigenous peoples of this land, particularly those who are here with us today. I congratulate the government on arranging yesterday's long overdue welcome to country for the opening of parliament, and I thank Matilda House for her deeply moving words and the Indigenous dancers and performers for their deadly performance. 
I acknowledge the patient but persistent efforts of our colleague, former Democrat Senator Aidan Ridgway, uh, for welcome to country to be included in the ceremonies that mark events such as the opening of parliament. And I think it's a great shame that we are having this debate without a contribution from an Indigenous member of parliament or senator in this place. My colleagues and I, without reservation, join the Rudd federal government in offering an official Australian parliament apology to those Indigenous Australians who were taken from their mothers, their fathers, their siblings, their communities and their land, and placed in institutions and in the charge of complete strangers. We are sorry for the lifetime of damage that this did to them and to their families. We are sorry for the ongoing damage that this causes to Indigenous communities, and we are sorry that the principle of self-determination was so completely denied by this and other acts of political, cultural, economic and physical domination by our forebears. We say sorry for the ignorance and the prejudice and the misguided attempts to improve the uh, opportunities and lives of in Indigenous children that gave rise to more than 60 years, three generations of people dispossessed of their kin and their dignity. The precise numbers are not known, but from 1910 to 1970, between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were taken. We are sorry that the removal of children was so often brutal. They put us in the police ute and said they were taking us to Broome. They put, in, put the mums in there as well, but when we'd gone about 10 miles, they stopped and threw the mothers out of the car. We jumped on our mothers' backs, crying, trying not to be left behind, but the policeman pulled us off and threw us back in the car. They pushed the mothers away and drove off while our mothers were chasing the car, running and crying after us. We were screaming in the back of that car. We are sorry that Aboriginal children and their parents were deliberately kept apart and denied the truth of their heritage. I remember this woman saying to me, your mother's dead, you've got no mother now, that's why you're here with us. Then about two years after my mother and my mother's sister came uh, to the bungalow, but they weren't allowed to visit us because we were black. We say sorry that it took another 30 years after the child stealing stopped to ask Aboriginal Australians to tell us their story. And we are moved by the courage uh, shown by the stolen generations in doing so. We have read Bringing Them Home and to the extent to which this is humanly possible, we try to understand their pain. We acknowledge that to remove a baby, a small child, even an adolescent from its parents, whatever their circumstances, whatever their culture, is the cause of deep hurt, sorrow and grief to both parent and child. There was a time when white children were more readily taken away from their families than is the case now. However, it was mandatory for children of Aboriginal women and white fathers. Lots of kids do get taken away, but that's for a reason. Not like us. We just, we just got taken away because we were black kids. I suppose half-caste kids. If they wouldn't like it, they shouldn't do it to Aboriginal children. And they were lied, lied to um, so that the separation, as some prefer to call it, would have an awful, painful finality. Your family don't care about you anymore. They wouldn't, give you, they wouldn't have given you away. They don't love you. All they are are just dirty, drunken blacks. You heard this daily. We're sorry that many children were abused and exploited and emotionally, physically, educationally and culturally deprived in institutions and at the hands of some heartless men and women when the state held that they were being protected. I was sent out when I was 11 years old to a pastoral station. I worked there for seven and a half years, never got paid anything. I was best in the class. I came first in all subjects. I was 15 when I got into second year and I wanted to continue school but I wasn't allowed to because they didn't think I had the brains. So I was taken out of school and that's when I was sent out to farms just to do housework. Punishment was routine. Young men and women at Moore River Settlement constantly ran away. Not only were they separated from their families, but they were regimented and they were locked up like animals. They were locked in dormitory uh, after supper for the night. They were given severe punishments, including solitary confinements for minor um, misdeeds. 
Dormitory life was like living in hell. It was not a life. The only thing that sort of came out of it was how to work, how to be clean, you know, and hygiene, that sort of thing. But we got a lot of bashings. One in ten boys and three in ten girls report that they were sexually abused in foster placements. The probability is that most went unreported because those who did report were not believed. One in ten girls reported sexual abuse in the work placement organised by protection boards or institutions. The thing that hurts the most is that they didn't care about who they put us with. As long as it looked like they were doing their job, it just didn't matter. They put me with one family and the man of the house used to come down and use me whenever he wanted to. Being raped over and over again and there was no one I could turn to. They were supposed to look after me and protect me, but no one ever did. The New South Wales Protection Board recorded in 1940. It has been known for years that these unfortunate people are exploited. Girls of 12, 14 and 15 years of age have been hired out to stations and have become pregnant. So their children too were removed and with them often the responsibility of the men who sired them. The distinction between being stolen and being separated will be argued by some, and it's true that some were not forcibly removed. Some Aboriginal children removed, were removed because of neglect, but for the most part their circumstances were totally irrelevant. Some parents were coerced into giving up their children to institutions to avoid them being taken by force. Others were tricked into signing documents so that the official record will always be unreliable. Some hoped their children would be better off away from the poverty and the squalor. However, we now know that removed children were less likely to have a post-secondary uh, education, much less likely to have stable living conditions, less likely to be in a stable, confiding, uh, confiding relationship with a partner, twice as likely to be arrested by police and convicted of an offence, three times as likely to have been in jail and much more likely to have used illicit substances. The institutions that took Aboriginal children received only minimal funding and as a consequence they were constantly hungry and denied basic facilities and medical treatment. In any case, the objective of taking so-called half-caste children, whatever their circumstances, was clear and it was official. The policy in the earliest times of settlement was, and I quote, to inculcate European values and work habits in children who would then be employed in, in the service of colonial settlers. The theory by the late 19th century was that children of mixed descent would be merged and absorbed into white society and other indigenous people would be forced onto reserves and missions and over time they would die out. This generation of parliamentarians must make this apology because we are the ones who are confronted by the evidence. Many of us were here in the parliament in 1997 when the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission presented its report and I want to acknowledge here the great work of the commission and particularly Sir Ronald Wilson who briefed us on those awful findings. We learned the depth of racial discrimination, the arbitrary deprivation of liberty, the pain and suffering, the abuse, the disruption of family life, the loss of cultural rights and fulfilment, the exploitation and the loss of opportunities. That report tells us, for the majority of witnesses to the inquiry, the effects have been multiple and profoundly disabling. Psychological and emotional damage renders many people less able to learn social skills and survival skills. Their ability to operate successfully in the world is impaired, causing low educational achievement and unemployment and consequent poverty. These in turn cause our own emotional distress, leading to some to leading, sorry, lead their own emotional distress, leading some to perpetrate violence, self-harm, substance abuse and antisocial behaviour. This apology must be official and it must come from the highest level and it needs to be heartfelt and heard by those who were hurt if it is to make a difference. Ten years were lost and yet more of the stolen generation died without hearing this, this apology. State and territory governments have apologised, churches have apologised. As Australian Democrats and as individuals we have said sorry, but saying sorry as members of our federal parliament matters more. I regret that it took 10 years and a change of government to say sorry. 
The Commission made 54 sets of recommendations, one of which was acknowledgement and apology from parliaments, from state and uh, territory police forces, from churches and other non-government organisations. This done, this done, we should move to the rest. The guarantees that there will be no repetition, the measures of restitution, uh, the measures of rehabilitation and money, monetary compensation. Mr Ted Lovett, a member of the Gunditjmara Nation and the Stolen Generation, uh, says, no apology to the Victorian Aboriginal community or to the, the members of the Stolen Generations could ever be adequate without compensation for what's been lost. Of all the things that were stolen, the loss of our country, language, culture, traditional law and family have been the most hurtful. The removal and dispersal of family members from our traditional lands and government policies that controlled our lives, even the relationships that we were allowed to enter into, have caused enormous pain for all of our people. As a boy, I was made a state ward in Victoria during the 1950s and late 1960s. I was put into Tirana Boys' Home in Melbourne and then the Salvation Army Boys' Home at Bayswater. During that time, I was subjected to inhumane and unjust treatment as if I was a criminal even though my only crime was to have been born into an Aboriginal family. I was subsequently prevented from being in their care. Up to this time, I had not committed even a minor offence of a criminal nature. We are sorry that incarceration for Indigenous youth has been, even recently, a mandatory first resort, and many lives and opportunities have been lost as a consequence. We are disappointed uh, that the Rudd government has so far rejected compensation. Um, however, we will not support Senator Brown's amendment today. An apology is a distinct action and uh, we consider that it should be uh, there to stand on its own. The Democrats have for many years called for compensation and have uh, legislation before the Senate that would achieve this. And I've learned, uh, anything, if I've learned anything in this place, it is that governments must be persuaded to change position and that a last-minute simplistic amendment won't do that. I also know that the more multi-partisan the debate and the vote on this motion is, the more complete and the more meaningful it will be to those for whom it was intended. What's so exciting about today is the fact that the coalition has reversed its long-held public opposition to making an apology, and I acknowledge the political courage that it takes to do that. I hope this change of heart and the consensus vote it delivers is uh, so much the sweeter and so much more healing to the stolen generations as a result. My commitment uh, during the short time that remains for us in the Senate is to push not only for compensation, eventually the government I think will see that this is uh, the right course of action, uh, after all Tasmania and WA have done that, but for a truly collaborative all-party effort to solve the problems that give rise to such serious disadvantage to Indigenous Australians. Reparation must include family reunion, collecting and communicating the oral histories and the experiences of the stolen generation. We need properly funded, long-term, soundly based goals and strategies to tackle drug and alcohol dependence, incarceration and deaths in custody, child mortality and poor levels of education, health and economic endeavour. And Indigenous Australians should get a better deal for what they've given up, the housing crisis. Uh, would be solved if profits and royalties from mining operations alone were more, f more fairly shared with the traditional owners of the land. And we must all listen intently, carefully and respectfully, or the strategies will be totally worthless and the money again wasted. Forcing a baby from the arms of its Indigenous mother because white people know what's best for that child proved very stupid and very wrong. It was a sorry business, and we say sorry. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, uh, President. I, I begin uh, on behalf of the Australian Greens by recognising the first Australians, the traditional owners, right across this great country of ours. And I congratulate the Rudd government both for yesterday's affording of the welcome to country and thank the Indigenous people for that welcome and uh, the government for providing this important moment in our nation's history. 
Now, the Greens wholeheartedly support this motion. Were it the Greens, we would have representatives of the stolen generations with us here on the central floor of this Senate to receive our apologies and to respond, because that in human terms how, is how apologies should be and that's how they work best. When I was a little boy, my loving but somewhat exasperated mother, wanting to let me know that she was a human being with her own limits, once told me she would go away and leave me if I didn't behave. And she closed the door. Well, of course, she didn't go. And she lived to 73 and was the mother I adored. Yet that shock of worn separation is seared into my mind here at 63. I can't express my debt to her and my father. What then if at that dreadful moment she had in fact gone? Or worse, complete strangers had arrived as if from Mars and taken her from me, or me from her. My life would have been taken too, and I certainly would not be standing here in the Senate today. But now I stand here in the Senate and with the parliament as a whole look back in horror at the fact that thousands of other little girls and boys were in fact taken from their mothers and their fathers. Not by strangers from Mars, but by Australian governments. Thousands of mothers and fathers, because they were Aboriginal, because they were black, and therefore not understood or valued by the perpetrators, had their little boys and girls, many just babies, taken from them by strangers in the name of our nation. It doesn't matter what the reason was, personal or official. Governments not only allowed but directed this racist separation of the innocent indigenous infants from their powerless, numberless parents in unaccountable fear and agony, an agony that would not, for all of life, let go its grip. Today in this Parliament of Australia, we acknowledge that heart-wrenching wrong of the stolen generations. We express our sorrow, unencumbered by attempts to excuse or rationalise such behaviour. This nation let its authorities trespass against a fundamental law of nature, that every child deserves and must have the love of parents who have love to give, and that no parent who loves a child should have that love denied. We know the facts. We try to understand the pain and we reach out not just for forgiveness but towards whatever restitution there can now be given to those who suffered and are suffering so much. And in reaching out all of us may rest a little better in the name of humanity and in the name of our nation, Australia. We Greens welcome this day in Australia's parliament. But we urge the government to logically move from sorrow through to just and fair compensation. To be sure, no government check will ever make up for the dispossession of Indigenous Australians taken from their parents, just as no compensation ever makes up for an eye lost in an accident or even a job lost in a corporate collapse. Yet logic and compassion make it clear that the national parliament should now move and move speedily to compensate the stolen generations, just as the Tasmanian parliament, with the Labor and Liberal and Greens parties working together, did last year. President, I move the foreshadowed amendment to the tenth sentence of the government's national apology motion so that that sentence now reads, we, the Parliament of Australia, commit to offering just compensation to all those who suffered loss, 
and respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered as part of the healing of the nation. This is not a last-minute amendment. This amendment came as a first-minute response to uh, this great motion and a logical follow-through down the road we must take as a nation towards reconciliation. We Greens advocate to the Rudd government that all of the 54 recommendations of the Bringing Them Home inquiry should be implemented. The report's recommendations on monetary reparations are critical to re redressing the terrible wrongs of, to quote from this motion, the blemished chapter of our history. In particular, that re report recommended to this parliament that appropriate reparations, including monetary reparations, be made in recognition of the history of gross violations of human rights. That reparation be made to all who suffered because of forcible removal policies, including those who were forcibly removed as children, their family members, their communities and their descendants, who as a result have been deprived of community ties, of culture and language, and links with and entitlements to their traditional lands. That the Council of Australian Governments establish a, national, a joint national compensation fund managed by a board chaired by an Indigenous person and made up of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. President, I commend this amendment to the Senate, to all parties in the Senate, because it incorporates the, ins the essential practical component to this historic gesture we are making here today. It moves us closer to a nation reconciled between the first Australians and all other Australians. That the, the 97 per cent majority of us who have come or whose forefathers and mothers came to these shores since 1797. 1787. That reconciliation, President, requires that all the people understand the history of dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Australians from their land. These were acts of consideration by the colonial there were acts of consideration by the colonialists, but they were too few. Australia's true history reveals that through the ravages of European disease, official and unofficial military or vigilante operations, and even poisoning of food and water holes, the first peoples of this continent were cruelly decimated along with their cultures and their languages. That history has not yet been put in full reverse, but we are challenged to reverse it as best we can. Former Prime Minister John Howard rejected what he called the black armband version of Australia's history and put on blinkers instead. But he could not in the end defy the truth or the more mature aspiration of Australians as a whole to honestly fa face the past and to deal with it. So as the sun set on his government, he lit some candles of reconciliation by calling for acknowledgement of Indigenous Australians at the head of our constitution and by moving, however crudely, unprecedented resources into addressing the plight of Aborigines in the Northern Territory. Like the Australian Greens now, the new government of Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, in consultation with First Australians, is committed to pursuing constitutional change and undertaking the work of ending the broad-scale disadvantages which First Australians still suffer. We Greens are committed to accelerating that course of action. President saying sorry is a step along the road to true reconciliation and recognition of the original sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples in Australia. In 1997 in this Senate, as my Greens colleague uh, Senator Milne was uh, with the a Liberal government and Labor opposition of the day bringing Indigenous people onto the floor of the Tasmanian parliament 
to receive and respond to an apology. I rise in this Senate to say sorry to the stolen generations on behalf of the Australian Greens. Here, a decade later, I congratulate the new Rudd Labor government for giving the nation this day when sorry is truly said by all of us. We all understand that the dispossession and cruelty of the past cannot go away, but that this simple act of heartfelt sorrow is an essential step to heal our nation's history and to help, therefore, ensure that Australia's future will be safer, securer, fairer and happier for all of us. So at last, in 2008, this nation says to its first Australians, we are sorry. Now, Mr President, from sorrow, let us move to fair and just reparation to the stolen generations for the betterment of all Australians. Senator Fielding. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Today, Australia's parliament will deliver a long overdue apology to Australia's Indigenous people. It will be an historic and emotional day for many who have waited a long time to hear these words. Saying sorry shouldn't be so hard. In families, just like any relationship, we know that we should be quick to say sorry when we do something wrong and mend any hurt we have caused. It is not about blame. It is about genuinely being sorry that the other person has been hurt and even if that action or that hurt was unintentional. Every parent knows and understands the importance of teaching our children to say sorry when something goes wrong. There is no doubt that something has gone wrong for the children and families of the stolen generations. But what exactly do we mean by this term, the stolen generations? I think many Australians may not understand the wrong that was done to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children. That it was Australian government official policy from the mid-1800s right through to the 1970s to remove children from their parents in order to assimilate the Indigenous population to the wider community. Family First does not believe that Australian governments 50 years ago or even 100 years ago intended harm to any child or family. These governments and authorities acted in a manner that they thought was right at the time and in the best interest of the children involved. But removing children from their parents just because they were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' children, not on genuine welfare grounds, was wrong. The parents were hurt. The children got hurt. A report found that many of the children taken from their families fell victim to physical and sexual abuse. They got hurt, and everybody should be sorry, very sorry, for the hurt caused to these children. We should show compassion and empathy. These children are now adults, while many others have passed on. But the unresolved hurt continues in them and their families and their communities. Unresolved, unacknowledged hurt in any family or relationship just festers and never really goes away. We wouldn't wait to say sorry if this was our family. We'd want to fix the rift and restore the relationship. When we don't resolve past hurts, we find that resentment builds and there really is little possibility of an ongoing healthy relationship. However, sorry often seems to be the hardest word to say, yet it is one of the most important words in any family, marriage or relationship. Saying sorry allows our kids and us as parents to move past our mistakes and our failures. Saying sorry is a part of life because we all do and say things at times we shouldn't. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes out of ignorance or out of carelessness, hurts are made. But we need to fix 
and we need forgiveness. There is responsibility on both parties here. And it's no different in the relationship between the Australian government and the Indigenous order. people. Senator Fielding, order for a minute. There is far too many people uh, walking around the chamber in audible conversations. Senator Fielding deserves to be heard in silence. Senator Fielding. Thank you. And it's no different in the relationships between the Australian government and Indigenous people, which was torn apart by the government's policy to remove Indigenous children from their parents, their families and their communities. In our family, we also teach that when someone says sorry, they must also ask for forgiveness. Sometimes we can say sorry as a throwaway line just to get us off the hook. But my wife Sue and I have taught our kids that a proper apology comes with the words, I'm sorry, please will you forgive me? The child who has had been hurt, even in an unattended situation, then feels their hurt has been acknowledged and also importantly they are part of the healing by actively forgiving their brother or sister. We reckon that saying sorry and being forgiven go hand in hand. Relationships get restored, friendships are mended and fences are rebuilt. As I said before, sorry can be the hardest word to say but forgiving can be the hardest thing to do. Forgiveness is not an easy thing. As a nation today, we are sincerely sorry for the great hurt and pain caused, and we admit the Australian governments have treated Indigenous Australians badly. In turn, I hope Indigenous Australians can open to a process of forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean condoning what happened. We can't change the past, but we can forgive it. There are real positive effects from letting go of the hurt by forgiving. It enables all of us to move forward. Most importantly, forgiving makes room for hope. Hope for the future. Hope for a better life for the kids. Hope for a united Australia. As a nation, we need to help the process of forgiveness by really committing to deal with the complex and long-standing problems facing the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. We need to close the 17-year life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children. Who can hope for a future without knowing your kids will get good schooling and decent health care? It is a scandal that Indigenous Australians are so far behind other Australians with the standard of education and health care provided to them and the outcomes from those key services. The big task for government is to make sure that schooling, health, other services are provided at an equal uh, level to the broader Australian community and the challenge for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is to make the most of those opportunities. Family First agrees the Australian Parliament should say sorry for the past. I hope the children and families that have been hurt can accept that apology and forgive us. The debt must finally be cancelled so we can all move on together and build a united family of Australians. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Bob Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Bob Brown be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair, and I appoint Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Weber, teller for the noes. Order. As a result of the division, there being four ayes and 65 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now put the question that the motion moved by Senator Evans be agreed to.
Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senators, will leave the chamber as quickly as possible, those that are leaving. Or him, yeah, just a minute, yeah. Uh, Clark? Government Business Order of the Day number one, consideration of the Governor-General's opening speech. Senator Wortley. I move that the following address in reply be agreed to. To His Excellency the Governor-General, may it please Your Excellency, we, the Senate of the Commonwealth of Australia in Parliament assembled, desire to express our loyalty to our most gracious Sovereign and to thank Your Excellency for the speech which you have been pleased to address to Parliament. I welcome the opportunity to move the address in reply to His Excellency, the Governor-General's speech given at the opening of the 42nd Parliament. On November 24, 2007, the people of Australia voted in a new government. They voted for a government with a plan, a plan that as a nation we will move forward to write a new page in our nation's history, a plan to make this country of ours even greater. As His Excellency said yesterday, as one of the world's oldest democracies, it is easy for us to take elections for granted. But all Australians can celebrate the success of our democracy when such changes can occur so seamlessly and with such goodwill. This week and those ahead of this parliament are history in the making, a precursor to change, renewal and moving forward. There will be new directions, advancements and progress important to our nation, and today I will focus on just some of these. They include workplace relations, the environment, climate change and water, education and health, skills training and re reconciliation and Indigenous affairs. Mr Deputy President, it is significant that yesterday, the day we opened the 42nd Parliament, we were, for the first time, officially welcomed by the traditional owners of this land, by Indigenous Australians, welcomed to country. The Rudd government has made a commitment, a commitment to our future as a nation, and this was a small but a significant step. The tasks ahead are challenging. We are faced with the bleak reality of climate change. The fact that owning a house is beyond the reach of many Australian families and many young people. The frustrations of a skills crisis. The lack of adequate childcare places. The confrontation that many hard-working Australian families are being denied fairness in the workplace. A wide gap between health and educational outcomes for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. On that Saturday in November, less than three months ago, the Australian people made a stand on these and other issues in the ballot box. And it is now fair to say that the recovery of the Australian soul, the restoration of our national spirit, is underway with a fair go for all. Admittedly, admittedly there are mountains to climb, but each step takes us closer to delivering to the Australian people the commitments made by this government. The seeds of compassion, once again, being sown. And today we take a step forward, a step forward by honouring the Indigenous peoples of this land and in apologising for the wrongs they have worn, in apologising for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on them, in apologising for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their communities in saying sorry for the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, 
their descendants and for their families left behind, and for the indignity and degradation inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture. In the words of the Prime Minister, we today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians. When I entered the parliament in July 2005, I included the following words in my first speech. Today I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land where we stand and I pay tribute to all Indigenous people of Australia. For the tragedy suffered by them and their ancestors, I am truly sorry, as are the 55,000 people with whom I marched in Adelaide on that long weekend in June 2000. More than 240,000 people around Australia walked for reconciliation with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It is a shame that reconciliation has not progressed as it could have, and we now know that as a nation it will not reflect, reflect kindly on us in the history books. Almost three years on, and with a new government in office, today, as a nation, we arrive at a place from which to progress reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. Optimism and hope are returning to these halls. Today we find ourselves at a place from which to start building better relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, a better future. It is a cornerstone on which we can all begin to establish mutual respect, from which we can work towards achieving other meaningful goals. Now we must take the opportunity to move forward, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, learning from the mistakes of the past and ensuring they are never repeated. As Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said at yesterday's historic Welcome to Country opening of Parliament, our challenge this week then is to write a new page in the country's history, and this is one small step. But for that page to be truly written, it must be written between ourselves and in Indigenous Australia and within this Parliament between those who are government and those who are opposition. There remains much to be done across the Australian community to bring about reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Through consultation and collaboration with Indigenous people and communities, the government will seek to build a relationship based on respect. We must translate our words of apology into actions via meaningful and effective policy, legislation and law. The government will continue developing and implementing a range of initiatives to help close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians in the area of health outcomes and educational achievement. These include, but are not limited to, within a generation, closing the 17-year life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, halving the gap in infant mortality rate between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australian, non Australians in the next decade, and halving the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children in their reading, writing and numeracy achievements also within a decade. It is important that individually and as a nation we recognise the true and full value of Indigenous culture and we must move towards this end. As a government, we will address this and other examples of oversight and neglect of our Indigenous peoples. The Rudd government believes every Australian child deserves a world-class education. It is promised an education revolution, and that is what we are working towards delivering. Submissions already have been made to Cabinet regarding the $1 billion National Secondary School Computer Fund and the $2.5 billion Trades Training Centres initiatives. Real commitments have been made through the Council of Australian Governments to drive the productivity agenda through substantial reform in education, skills and early childhood development. The government will raise standards in education by increasing standards in our schools, improving the quality of teaching through a grand reform agenda, the education revolution. Added to our education measures is Labor's 50 per cent education tax refund, which is designed to boost Australia's productivity and ease cost of living pressures for working families. Indeed, Australia needs an education revolution with new measures and innovations from early childhood years through primary and high school and on to tertiary study. As His Excellency noted in his address yesterday, the government wants parents to have access to affordable, high-quality childcare that helps them balance their work and family responsibilities. 
Another innovation will be universal access to early childhood education for all four-year-olds for 15 hours per week, 40 weeks of the year. A national curriculum will be introduced to streamline education in key learning areas for older children. And the government will establish trades training centres in thousands of high schools around the country as a central plank on addressing the schools shortage. There is no doubt a school shortage is impacting on our economy. Therefore, the government will commit a 1.17 billion skills package over four years. Its establishment of the Skills Australia body is being fast-tracked to assist in fighting the inflationary pressures in the economy and improving productivity. An independent statutory body made up of members from a range of backgrounds, including ep economics, industry and academia, to be known as Skills Australia, will oversee the government's pledge to provide an extra 450,000 training places in the next four years. Over the coming decade, this number will grow to 820,000. To emphasise the government's seriousness in this matter, the plan is to have the first 20,000 of these training places available by April this year. The goal of this program is to better match the demand for skills with skills training in Australia. When it comes to our nation's health systems, we need to end the state and territory versus Commonwealth government's bl blame game referred to in his speech yesterday by His Excellency. The Rudd government, in cooperation with the states and territories, will direct resources towards medical and health research, boost nursing numbers, establish GP super clinics and put in place strategies to slash elective surgery waiting lists at our hospitals. And there will be more attention paid too to the seriously under-resourced sectors of rural, women's and Indigenous health. Aged care will take its turn in the spotlight during this parliamentary term, as will dental health, preventative health policies and meeting the challenge presented by the obesity epidemic confronting Australians of all ages. As a government, we will address this and other areas that urgently require attention, including the environment, climate change and our most fragile and vital resource, water. Australians know we cannot afford to be sluggish when it comes to issues of our environment. What we do or do not do now and in the coming years will help shape the health of our planet for generations to come. To what extent the globe continues to be hospitable may well depend on us. We cannot afford to leave things to those who come after us. While worldwide, through the media, we have seen the spectacular and even terrifying evidence of the toll of climate change, there are also are clear signs in our own backyard. Environmental wonders, including rainforests, reefs and unique natural wildlife sanctuaries, such as Kakadu National Park, are under threat. Bushfires pose more of a threat to life and livelihood than before, and our river systems are being choked by drought. For these reasons and more, that is why on December 3, on the day the government was sworn in as one of the first acts of this government, the Prime Minister signed the instrument of ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. It was the first official act of the newly elected Rudd Labor government, and in doing so, we have now gained a place at the world's negotiating table. And so now, Australia will become a full member of the Kyoto Protocol next month. And this government intends to be actively involved in developing a comprehensive new agreement to address the very serious issue of climate change. As a government, we want to be helping to drive the international dialogue on climate change rather than remaining in the back seat, criticising those at the wheel. The government also is committed to slashing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by 60 per cent on 2000 levels by 2050. There will also be a $500 million renewable energy fund to develop, commercialise and deploy renewable energy technologies in Australia. This will aim to generate a further $1 billion private sector investment in such technologies. The government is committed to a national emissions trading scheme, which will provide incentives to cut greenhouse gas emissions across the country. Caring for the environment is everyone's responsibility. But we believe that the government must lead the way. Only the government can legislate change, and so this administration 
has embarked on a range of initiatives designed to preserve our precious environment. We want to conserve whales in our waters and around the world, and to that end we have upped diplomatic efforts, looked seriously at our international legal options, and overseen an unprecedented level of monitoring of the Japanese whaling fleet in the Southern Ocean. We are also working to help Australians make their homes greener and more sustainable. The range of measures include green loans, energy efficient insulation and cost saving new standards for household appliances. The solar cities concept will be expanded and every school will become a solar school. When it comes to action on the urgent issue of water and particularly the drought ravaged lifeblood Murray Darling Basin, the government will implement its election commitments to secure a sustainable future for the basin. With some of, while some of the nation has suffered through floods in recent weeks, much of it remains terribly parched. Because of this fact, special water sharing arrangements in the Murray-Darling Basin will continue in 2009. Nowhere is the need for a new spirit of cooperation between the federal and state governments in the area of water more evident than in my home state of South Australia. Through cooperation, we need to find a long-term and sustainable solution for the River Murray and the communities who depend on it. For the first time in many years, real progress is being made in the area of consolidating a national approach to this crisis. How we deal with this challenge now will affect our people and environment for many years to come. As with climate change, the voting public's verdict on workplace relations from last November is clear. Australians want a fair go for themselves, their families and others in the workplace. They want to be treated with respect and even-handedness, and that's an entirely reasonable expectation. When Australians voted last November for Labor's fair and balanced workplace relations system, we promised them there would be no new Australian workplace agreements. This government's commitment in this area is to give working families a better, simpler industrial relations system than the one it will replace. Essential to establishing a better system is to have a modern safety net. Our 10 national employment standards will form the integral part of that safety net. We will modernise and simplify our award system and we will begin this process with the transition bill promised before the election. People who want to make individual agreements can make common law agreements, which must give them more than the safety nets, rather than overriding and undermining that safety net. The purpose of these measures is clear. We want to restore job security and satisfaction to our workforce. The forward with fairness reforms that this government will introduce are designed to establish just and fair relationships between employers and employees and revive worker confidence and family certainty. Better morale and more reasonable conditions within the workforce also will foster improved productivity. Happier workers also are healthier workers with less stress and the associated social problems that it brings. Our legislation will implement a genuine no disadvantage test for workplace agreements, protect workers against being unfairly dismissed and halt the stripping away of pay and conditions, including public holidays and overtime, without any appropriate remuneration. This government will promote family-friendly policy developments, such as giving women the right to ask their employer for an extended period of maternity leave or to return to work under part-time or more flexible conditions. There also will be a Productivity Commission inquiry looking into possibilities for paid maternity leave as a priority of this administration. However, it is not only on the environment, working families, education, health and Indigenous issues that we will see benefits from a new way of thinking, thinking and a different course of action for our government. The government's policies and their implementation are working towards delivering a more just society, a more united society, a more productive society and a more sustainable society in which all Australians can share. Thank you. Senator McEwen. Mr Acting Deputy President, I second the motion moved by, uh, proposed by Senator Wortley 
and I have a few remarks to make. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I do second the motion thanking His Excellency the Governor-General for his address to Parliament yesterday. I will also take this opportunity to congratulate the new uh, ministers and parliamentary secretaries uh, who were, uh, uh, took their seats for the first time in the parliament yesterday. And, uh, after two and a half years for me and uh, up to 11 years for some of my colleagues here, it is a great feeling to be sitting on the right side of you today, Mr Acting Deputy President. The uh, opening of the 42nd parliament was a very special day. Uh, for the first time in our parliament's history, we had a welcome to country ceremony. And it's hard to believe that uh, it hadn't been done before. And I think most senators would have been attending for many years conferences and events and government functions where a welcome to country ceremony was expected and always occurred. It's good that we've finally done it here, and um, it's unfortunate that it took so long. Uh, the welcome to country ceremony was a strong sign that this parliament and this government will be different to those of the past. I'm heartened to know that future openings of the parliament will also incorporate the welcome to, uh, welcome to country. In his speech, the Excellency, uh, His Excellency the Governor-General pointed out how fortunate we are to live in a nation where governments change hands peacefully as a result of the free expression of the will of the people. We live in a democracy that is truly democratic where people can safely and secretly vote with the confidence that their vote will be counted and that they have a say in who runs their country. Not everyone in the world is as fortunate as us. It is indeed a feature of our democracy that we change governments peacefully, and it is also a significant feature that our democracy began from the roots up rather than being created by special interest groups. This fact was noted by a South Australian uh, representative Josiah Simon at the uh, time of federation. And while members on the, this side of the House do not share all of Simon's philosophies, he was right in making a distinction between us and the founding structure of the British Parliament, for example, which uh, was uh, frustrated by power struggles between royalty and landed gentry. Uh, although in our early history there was a failure to include Aboriginal Australians, there were at least sentiments expressed about a people's parliament. This historic week in our parliament is a step towards a, achieving a more inclusive system. The political liberty Australians have in being able to change governments uh, democratically and peacefully is one that other nations don't have. Uh, some uh, nations don't have that opportunity nor the opportunity to establish their democracies from scratch. Um, before a democracy can come about, there has to be, in some countries, a lot of pain endured, while regimes, regimes which are not representative are replaced. Uh, one example of such a country is Myanmar. In its recent history, Myanmar has suffered a military dictatorship which has severely curtailed the dem democratic rights of its citizens. And who can forget uh, those terrible images we've all undoubtedly seen? of uh, Buddhist monks and democracy protesters being fired at with tear gas and rounded up to be imprisoned. Pakistan is another example where the fight for democracy is characterised by violence. And less than two months ago, a former Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto, was murdered by extremists. Um, she had shown great courage and defiance in her resistance to extremism as she campaigned resolutely for democracy in Pakistan. Recently, Kenya has also struggled for democracy as it faces civil strife and vote rigging um, and allegations of vote rigging following the recent elections there. And uh, subsequent to those elections, we saw, have seen violence which has claimed the lives of more than 1,000 Kenyans and reported to have displaced more than 600,000 people. Even in the ex-Commonwealth uh, country of Zimbabwe, where the history of the British system and conventions on parliamentary doc democracy would be presumed to be stronger than in some other countries, abuses of executive power leading to, leading to undemocratic regimes uh, occur to this day. <clears throat> One uh, growing democracy which must in time experience the democracy that uh, Australia enjoys is that uh, of East Timor. However, currently this young nation is beset with political instability, which saw the country split following the last election. 
The instability was further expressed in the recent attempted assassination of the country's president and prime minister. I would like to uh, take this chance to remind the Senate that uh, our government is strongly committed to seeing democracy prosper in this, our nearest neighbour nation, and we uh, have deployed extra troops and police officers there in an effort to maintain order at this particularly volatile time. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the efforts of our troops and the Australian Federal Police officers serving in East Timor and indeed in other countries, including Iraq. In contrast to those examples I've given of uh, nations struggling for democracy, here in Australia on the 24th of November last year, Australians went to polling booths and voted with their own free will. Australians used their democratic right and they voted for change. The trust and confidence of the nation has been handed to those in the Labor Party. Those of us in the Labor Party, it is a significant step in a nation to change governments, and with change comes much responsibility for those who are assuming government. A key difference between uh, the new Australian government and the previous one is that under a Labor government, um, the focus will not be on the individual. We have the ability to look at the bigger picture, and we are committed to improving the lives of all Australians. We believe in a fair distribution of the benefits of economic growth, continuous improvement in the welfare and living standards of the Australian people, and the reallocation of resources to meet to those most in need. Labor is very proud to bring these principles with it into the new government. I was very encouraged to hear the Governor-General outline the government's plan for the future. We don't just have plans, we implement them. And when elected, Labor hit the ground running, and we will not be slowing down any time soon. As His Excellency mentioned, one of our first actions as a new government was ratifying Kyoto. From the beginning of the election campaign, Mr Rudd outlined Labor's commitment to the environment and our commitment to addressing climate change. This commitment has been evident since our election to government through not only the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol but also the creation of a new climate change portfolio in our ministry. Uh, that change means that the Minister for Climate Change and Water Penny Wong is able to uh, dedicate herself to that very, very important and fundamental issue. The government has also committed to reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by 60 per cent on 2000 levels by the year 2050. We see that climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our generation, and if the Australian government take, doesn't take action, it will undoubtedly continue to be the biggest challenge to generations to come. The previous government, unfortunately, was full of climate change sceptics, and they made little effort to protect our environment and develop ways to counteract global warning, warming, but we will. Uh, Labor has developed a strong plan of action to address the environmental issues that are currently facing Australia and the rest of the world. As the Governor-General outlined, our plans for the environment include managing the water crisis, as Senator Wortley said, an issue of particular importance to my state of South Australia. <clears throat> for urban areas, the new government will be establishing a $1 billion fund to invest in both old and new water supplies in urban areas. And a number of rebates will also be made available for families across the nation to assist them in making their homes more water efficient. Those in rural areas, particularly farmers, have been impacted the most by uh, the water crisis, and it is for this reason that the government has a drought policy that will ensure farmers receiving government assistance are better equipped to deal with the, uh, with the drought. Uh, that includes climate change adaption programs which support farmers in changing their practices to better deal with uh, changes in the environment. Uh, one area that really suffered during the uh, reign of the Howard Costello government uh, is the education sector. So, Shortly after the election, uh, senators and members were directed by the new Prime Minister to visit schools. Um, these visits were, I have to say, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, invigorating, as it gave us all a chance to get out into the community and find out what was needed in our education sector. Uh, I took the opportunity to visit both public and private schools in metropolitan and rural areas of South Australia, and that provided me with a very good understanding of uh, the issues faced uh, by our schools. 
Um, it was an exciting time to visit um, the schools and to present our education revolution and particularly our di digital education revolution. Everywhere we went, principals, teachers, uh, students and parents uh, have shown great uh, interest in this initiative and are looking forward to improving and expanding the information technology systems uh, in their schools. University uh, students continued to suffer because of the uh, previous government's introduction of voluntary student unionism and because the previous government broke uh, its promise of no more full fee-paying university places. As we know, there are now 104 domestic full-fee university degrees costing over $100,000, three of which cost more than $200,000 per student. Labor believes that everyone has the right to a good education, regardless of their socio-economic background. Therefore, we will be keeping our promise of phasing out full fee paying courses so that by the year 2010, students will be entering university based on merit and not on their household income. Working families have also suffered over the last decade through the previous government's uh, draconian and extreme industrial relations laws. Uh, they've suffered because of the decline in housing affordability and because of the rising cost of living. Uh, those three elements combined have led to a lot of people doing it really tough at the moment. The Rudd Labor government uh, acknowledges those problems and are committed to addressing them. Firstly, I'm proud to say that the government will bury work choices. Changes will include abolishing AWAs, but respecting existing contractual arrangements, providing 10 national employment standards, creating a fair and simple unfair dismissal system, simplifying and modernising some $4,300 3, 4, awards and creating a new independent umpire, Fair Work Australia. Throughout uh, the campaign, we outlined a comprehensive plan on how to address housing affordability and homelessness. And, uh, this plan incorporates the first Home Saver accounts the release of Commonwealth land and talking with state and territories to develop a national housing affordability agreement. And that, that agreement is just one example of the new cooperation between state and federal governments that will bring to an end the so-called blame game that we saw the previous federal government uh, use extensively as an excuse for doing nothing. An area that is of <clears throat> great importance to the government is Indigenous affairs. In the last day and a half in uh, Canberra and in Parliament House have been a unique experience and I feel very honoured to have been part of it. The events that have transpired are truly momentous and are without doubt a highlight of this nation's history. Today's apology um, in both houses of the parliament is but the first step in developing respect and equality amongst all Australians. Our next focus must be on closing the life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Australians can already be proud of this government, as we have already shown strength and energy disproving claims that we would become a Me Too government. The Governor-General referred to a modern Australia in his speech yesterday. A modern Australia can be interpreted as a country which is prepared to be active and not shackled by conservatism. A modern society also sets targets and takes action. Uh, while conservatism is by definition a tendency to resist change, this change of government um, will see a refreshing approach to how we view the world and how we treat our citizens. We do have a lot of catching up to do, um, but um, and one of the areas that we do need to uh, catch up very quickly is the skills shortage and by not acting on, a, on the Reserve Bank uh, predictions of a skill shortage, the coalition, the former coalition has made this country much less able to take advantage of the opportunities in this first decade of the 21st century. Uh, rather than rhetoric, the Labor government uh, has set targets for change and in the Governor-General's address, for instance, we see uh, specific targets and timelines. And I'd just like to outline a few of those timelines. Um, the government aims to deliver a budget surplus of 1.5 per cent of GDP in 2008-09. We uh, aim to provide an additional 450,000 training places 
They will be established over four years, including 65,000 extra apprenticeships, with the first 20,000 places available from April this year. The government has committed to re reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by 60 per cent on 2000 levels by 2050. A major study to help Australia set robust shorter-term emission reductions will report in June this year. A national emissions trading scheme will be established by the end of 2010. And the timeline for an apology to the stolen generations is immediate. Targets have been set for improved education and health among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The government will withdraw all combat troops. Australian combat troops from Iraq at the end of the next rotation due in the middle of next year. And Australia's overseas development assistance will increase to 0.5 per cent of gross national income by 2015-16. There are many other initiatives in the Governor-General's speech, including plans to reform the health system and the building of a world-class education system, as, uh, as aforementioned. Apart from setting targets for a modern and fairer and more efficient and productive society, Labor has de demonstrated already its commitment to being modern, as the Governor-General put it, by addressing contemporary and future issues. Under that banner, banner, there are many other things that those of us in this chamber would like to see the government implement so that the nation is truly inclusive and fair for all. Personally, Madam Acting Deputy President, I would hope that one day soon we can agree on a sensible scheme of universal paid parental leave and stronger legislation to ensure women do not continue to be disadvantaged in the workplace. I would also like to see government legislation amended to remove any provisions that discriminate against Australians because of their race, gender, disability, religion or sexuality. I look forward very much to the term of this government, and I look forward to working with all of my, former sen all of my fellow senators to make uh, a better future for all Australians. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. I move the, uh, the debate be adjourned. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. I have received letters from party leaders nominating senators to be members of committees. Minister? I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. It's leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister? I thank the Senate. I move that senators be appointed to committees in accordance with the document uh, circulated in the chamber today. The question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government business notice of motion number two for the days of meeting for 2008. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move the motion standing in my name. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this motion is to set the days of sitting for the Senate for this year. Uh, as uh, senators would know, but others may not, it is the Senate itself that chooses uh, when it meets um, the days uh, of business. Uh, Sorry, the days that it uh, meets to conduct business. Uh, the Democrats have expressed concern for a number of years about the inadequate number of days that the Senate meets. Uh, under the previous coalition government, we'd seen a consistent decline uh, in the number of days that the Senate meets to conduct business. At the same time, I might say, as a uh, consistent increase in the number of pieces of legislation that are put before the chamber, uh, and it's very disappointing. Uh, that this decline in the number of sitting days has actually continued under the new Labor government. Uh, there's been some media coverage, of course, about the fact that the House of Representatives is now sitting on Fridays for the first time and the number of days the House of Representatives sitting uh, has actually increased. And uh, that's been used to create this perception of the, the new hard-working Rudd government. Uh, as usual, uh, the media has completely ignored uh, the very different reality uh, in the Senate. Uh, I'm not going to get into the debate about what the uh, House of Representatives is actually doing on its Fridays and uh, whether or not that constitutes hard work. Uh, that's a matter for them. But in terms of the Senate, which is, after all, the primary chamber where legislation is actually considered in genuine detail, and uh, particularly after July, uh, when uh, there is no one party or grouping that will have control, of this chamber uh, will be uh, absolutely critical to ensure there's enough time to properly consider different amendments that are put forward to legislation. Uh, 
the parliament and the Senate in particular is a legislature. Uh, it is not a debating chamber to score political points, or it shouldn't be. Uh, it is a chamber that is the primary uh, mechanism for determining the adequacy of the laws that are passed uh, by the national parliament, the laws that affect uh, every person in this country and indeed many people outside this country. Uh, and we should be ensuring that there is adequate time to properly consider those proposed laws and, I might say, of course, any other matters that deserve proper consideration. Uh, we have literally thousands of pieces of uh, regulations and ordinance, ordinances, um, subsidiary legislation. Uh, we also have hundreds of reports that are tabled in this chamber that rarely get consideration. Uh, but uh, my primary concern is the inadequate time to, to properly consider legislation itself. Now, of course, we have Senate committees that meet outside of this. We have uh, estimates committees that meet in addition to the days here. Uh, but we have had estimates committees for a long period of time and uh, managed to have them meet alongside a uh, much greater number of sitting days than what we are having put forward here. Uh, in total, this year there is just 52 sitting days scheduled in the motion that's before the chamber, only 14 sitting weeks. Uh, that is uh, the lowest in a non-election year uh, that I can see going back at least 30 years. Uh, when the Howard government first came to office in 1996, uh, and that was in a year where the election was in March, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, so we didn't even have uh, those first three months of the year. In that year, when the Howard government first came to office, uh, there were 71 sitting days spread across 16 weeks. Uh, to contrast that with uh, the first full year, and they've had the first, an entire full year uh, of the Rudd government, and they're suggesting just 52 days uh, across 14 sitting weeks. Uh, if you look at um, during the, uh, the previous Labor government, uh, it was basically the norm to have a uh, number of sitting days uh, well into the 70s, uh, back um, from uh, 1983 in the first year of the Labor government, again an election year. Uh, in that year, 63 sitting days um, following after that, 62, 74, 86, 85, 89 sitting days in 1988, um, 92 sitting days in 1989. Uh, to have declined so dramatically down to just 52 uh, in a full year when there's no election, uh, particularly with a new government coming in uh, that, uh, as we heard yesterday from the Governor-General, a, a comprehensive program of reform. And I appreciate not all of that requires legislation, but it certainly does require examination, and uh, there will be a lot of legislation within that. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's inadequate. Um, perhaps it's understandable. Um, although not necessarily still excusable, but it's understandable given real politic that the government only wants 21 sitting days in the first part of the year uh, when the coalition still has a majority, uh, but to only have 31 days in the second half of the year uh, when there is a balance of power situation back in operation I think is, is, uh, is grossly inadequate. Uh, as usually happens when a new government comes in, we've got talk about uh, taking the parliament more seriously, treating it with more respect. Uh, and I don't think this is a good sign of that. Uh, but it's more important than just you know, the, the, the formalities of showing respect. It's important in terms of doing the job properly. And I, I appreciate um, and quite conscious of the fact that um, uh, I won't be here as part of that job that's being done after July, and neither will anyone from the Democrats. So um, to some extent, people could say it's not really um, anything to do with me in particular. But I do think it's a broader message. It's not about any particular party or individual. It's about the job that the Senate has to do, and that job has been, um, certainly from the time the Democrats first appeared, uh, and hopefully will continue to remain uh, after the Democrats have disappeared, that job must remain to hold the government to account and to properly examine what it's doing, and this is the only chamber that can do that. We all know the House of Representatives is not capable of doing that properly, and we do need to ensure that the Senate does meet a sufficient number of days to properly provide that opportunity as well as to ensure that the senators themselves uh, have sufficient time uh, to make fully informed decisions. Uh, and that particularly applies to views and amendments that are put forward by people outside of the government. Uh, and that is something that uh, I would have thought uh, uh, might feel a long time since the election, but I'm sure all people in the government side can remember what it was like being in opposition for all that period of time. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, and I, can show you, I am sure you can recall how frustrating it is to, uh, to not have sufficient time to properly consider amendments, to, uh, to feel like things are being railroaded through. 
I think this is a quite a bad start in that respect. There's, uh, there's other aspects um, of the, uh, the Rudd government's start which I think are quite positive. Uh, and as you know, Madam Acting Deputy President, I always try to take a balanced view on these things. Uh, but I think this particular one is not a good sign uh, to have the lowest number of sitting days quite clearly um, uh, in a non-election year uh, for decades, uh, for at least 30 years and probably many years before that, uh, is unsatisfactory. And uh, it certainly gives the lie to any suggestion that uh, the new government will provide will, will be a, a hard-working one, at least in regards to uh, work done in the parliamentary chamber or the Senate chamber. So I think it's unfortunate. Uh, I uh, have in previous years moved amendments to motions like these uh, when uh, the coalition was in government proposing extra sitting weeks. Uh, I haven't bothered to do that this time around uh, um, because uh, an assumption that it wouldn't be likely to, to receive support. But uh, I think it's quite clear when you look at this schedule that uh, there's a number of spaces where at least a number of couple of weeks, extra weeks could easily have been fitted in. And uh, I think that would uh, give a better signal to the community about how seriously the Senate is about doing its job. But even more importantly than that, it would mean the Senate would actually be doing its job, I think, more effectively than it will otherwise be, um, be able to do. Thank you, Senator. Minister. Just checking that no one else wanted to contribute to the debate, but uh, thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President, the uh, points that uh, Senator Bartlett make—I'm uh, sure I've heard them uh, before in this chamber. But what I can say is, in respect of the program, it is a planned program. What the Senate does do, and it has done in the last uh, couple of years that I'm aware of, we tend to ensure that there's sufficient time for the legislation to be debated by expanding the hours when necessary, by ensuring that everyone does have an opportunity to speak. And given the numbers in this place, I'm sure that will in fact uh, continue, that we will uh, debate legislation properly and appropriately. And we'll also uh, utilise the committee systems, as we have done in the past, to foreshorten debates in the Senate. And of course, the Fridays are reserved for that, uh, for the Senate to be able to meet. And I'd encourage the committee chairs to plan their days to ensure that Fridays are utilised for committees to meet and consider legislation and other matters that uh, committees do uh, look at. The reality is for a new government that the first half of the year for a new government coming into parliament with their legislative uh, agenda can mean that while the new government works on delivering its election commitments and taking the necessary steps to bring forward its legislative agenda then and uh, ensure that stakeholders are properly consulted and the Senate committees can do their work does mean that it's more likely that the second half of the year will be uh, even busier than the first half. However, the Senate has in the past, as I've said, adjusted its program accordingly to ensure that there is sufficient time to deal with the legislative program and in the past uh, that statement has proved correct. The Senate has adjusted its hours, has adjusted its times to ensure that the uh, debate has been uh, had and all of those who do want to speak can speak on these matters. I won't prolong this matter. I do understand Senator Bartlett's uh, uh, point that he makes. I don't agree with it, however, in this respect, that the Senate uh, will determine the appropriate times for sitting, as uh, they will do now. And of course, the program will uh, generally adjust itself to ensure that we can deal with the legislation that comes forward. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Ludwig be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business notice of motion number three for changes to committee names and allocation of departments. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government business notice of motion number four for dates for estimates, hearings and committee groupings. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business notice of motion number five for the, the various temporary orders. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, 
I move uh, the motion uh, dealing with the temporary orders. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business notice of motion number six for a motion to take note of the national apology. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move the motion uh, as circulated in the chamber. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to limit the time in today's debate to 10 minutes per speaker. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the, cl the clock accordingly. And I should move the motion before I lay I'll call you, Senator, Senator Kirk. So um, I'm, I've been told it's OK. So, uh, Senator Ludwig. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, I do uh, seek your indulgence. One, uh, one of the matters that I think it's worthwhile putting down is that I do thank the Senate for agreeing to the way the debate proceeded today. It is important to have the Senate uh, support the process that's been undertaken today. We have uh, this motion does give the Senate the ability to speak on the national apology to the stolen generations. What this motion ensures that today, from both houses of Parliament, the stolen generations receive an apology. And I do thank the Senate for that, for the procedures to ensure that people can speak on the debate today. It is the right thing to do to have the motion moved and passed today from both the House and the Senate. The Australian people do want this parliament to collectively apologise. Senators wanting to speak on this motion, like myself, will be able to do so and ensure that the time uh, will be available for those persons to be able to speak on the debate. Now, to prevent myself from falling into the difficulty of having to speak twice on the motion, I was going to take the opportunity, and I do uh, thank Senator Kirk for allowing me to undertake this today, but I did want to ensure that the motion uh, did receive its proper place and being able to debate it today in respect of this issue. It is with a great privilege that I speak in this chamber on this historic day when the Australian government and the Australian parliament formally apologises to stolen generations and to Indigenous Australians for the wrongs of the past, for the pain and suffering that past policies brought to Indigenous Australians, sorry for the forced separation of children from their families and communities, sorry for the indignity and harm that this brought to those forcibly taken and to those left behind to grieve. I do not pretend to understand the pain and suffering inflicted on tens of thousands of Indigenous Australians who were forcibly removed from their families, their communities and their culture. I do not pretend to know the pain of those who were forced to live their lives in these unjustified, unjustifiable circumstances. But as a parent, I do know the importance of the family and living a life filled with love and support within that family. And I'm proud that the Australian Parliament is now apologising for the forced separation of an Indigenous families and the significant and ongoing challenges that have resulted. For those individuals, families and communities affected by these past policies, I can only commend the apology articulated by the Prime Minister this morning. I add my voice to that genuine and unreserved apology and the nature of reconciliation in which it is offered. The apology today provides a unique opportunity for the Australian people and the Australian government to move forward with a sense of common purpose. The parliament should not allow this moment to pass as a missed opportunity. The importance of today needs to be backed up, of course, with meaningful, practical and effective action from the government. The department for which I am responsible, the Department of Human Services, can participate in a very real way in addressing the practical challenges still facing our community. The department can play an important role as the key service provider in the national effort to address the serious issues still facing many Indigenous communities. I'd like to take a moment to commend the hard work and genuine effort of staff members of Centrelink and the Department of Human Services. They are dedicated public servants who are tasked with the frontline effort to work with Indigenous communities to address the serious challenges we still face. I hope that today's apology can help the Department to further 
our mutual respect for Indigenous Australians. Mr. Pro Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, this is an important day for the Australian Parliament, and it is an important step that we have taken today. It has been a long, hard road to get here, and there is more work to be done. Let us work together in the spirit of reconciliation and mutual respect to meet the challenges that continue to face our community. Let us harness the great spirit of today to work for real improvement in the lives and conditions of Indigenous Australians. We owe it to those who have suffered in the past. We owe nothing less to the generations to come. Thank you, Senator Ludwig. Senator Kirk. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in support of the National Apology to the Stolen Generation delivered uh, this morning by the Prime Minister in the House of Representatives and moved in this place by the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Today, as the Australian Parliament acknowledges the past mistreatment of Indigenous Australians and in particular offers a formal apology to members of the Stolen Generation, their descendants and families, we formally recognise, reflect and acknowledge the experiences and repercussions that past policies and laws have had on these people, the first Australians. In particular, today we recognise the many thousands of Indigenous children who were forcibly removed from their families, communities and countries, country during the mid-1800s right through to 1970, and we say to them that we are deeply sorry. These children, known to us now as members of the Stolen Generation, taken from their families, often solely on the basis of race, and placed into institutional care or with non-Indigenous families, have suffered profound grief and loss. In the words of former Prime Minister Keating, and I quote, we failed to see what we were doing degraded all of us. Madam Acting Deputy President, we now know and today acknowledge that for many this practice inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians and for this we the Australian Parliament are sorry. The apology given today is offered in recognition of and in response to the policies, laws and decisions of past parliaments and governments. Whilst it does not attribute guilt to the current generation of Australian people, in the words of former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating in his Redfern speech in 1992, and I quote, we simply cannot sweep injustice aside, even if our own conscience allowed us to, end quote. The word sorry, as I understand it, holds a special me meaning in Indigenous culture in that it is used to describe rituals regarding death, known as sorry business. In this sense, it is used to express empathy, sympathy, compassion and understanding as opposed to responsibility, guilt or liability. It is my hope, Madam Acting Deputy President, that today's apology acts as a powerful symbol to restore respect to Indigenous Australians, not only on a personal level but also in sending a message to the rest of the country and to the world that Indigenous Australians and Indigenous culture is valued in this country. Removing children from their families on the basis solely of race and attempting to assimilate them with, uh, with children of mixed ancestry into the non-Indigenous non -Indigenous community has impacted the lives of many Indigenous Australians. Not only did children have to contend with the great loss of being removed from their parents, they also lost their connection with their extended family, their traditional land, culture and language. In many cases, as we have now learned, Indigenous children were placed in vulnerable situations at risk of physical, emotional and sexual abuse. We now understand that the experience of many of the children who were forcibly removed from their families has had long-term disabling consequences. Madam Acting Deputy President, I wish to bring to the attention um, the example of one South Australian woman, someone from my home state, and uh, she is the late Doris Cartaneri. Uh, she was a, a woman who was uh, forcibly removed from her parents when she was just four weeks old. Her mother passed away and the United Aborigines Mission came and took her from her father and her siblings in Port Maclay to be raised at the Colebrook home in Eden Hills in, uh, in a suburb of Adelaide. Colebrook housed a number of Aboriginal children, including the former chair of ATSIC, 
uh, known to many, uh, Loitcha O'Donoghue. The children were given a strict religious upbringing in the home which was run by the United Aborigines Mission. In a book that uh, Doris published um, entitled Kick the Kin, Kick the Tin, she wrote about her experiences, about um, her coming to terms with what it meant to be a stolen child. She said, and I quote, the saddest thing is that I really didn't have a mum or family to guide me, end quote. In a poem written by her, expressing her feelings, she wrote, walking through a blue dream, reality calls, but it's not what it seems. Living while the subconscious screams, living to find out what it all means. Doris was a brave ambassador and campaigner for members of the Stolen Generation. Through her openness and candour about her experiences, I'm sorry that she is not here with us today to hear this national apology, um, which would have meant so much to her. To those who grew up at Colebrook in South Australia and to the many thousands of Indigenous Australians who had similar experiences to uh, Doris across this country, we, the Australian Parliament, say sorry. The Bringing Them Home report, which reported on the National Inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children from their families, uh, was tabled in this parliament in 1997. The committee, of course, was chaired by the late Sir Ronald Wilson, and the report brought to the forefront of the national conscience the impact which past governments' policies and laws had on Indigenous Australians. In particular, the report brought to our attention that nationally between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families during the period that I referred to earlier. It's been 11 years since the Bringing Them Home report uh, has been tabled, and during this time all state and territory governments have apologised to the stolen generation. But of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, as we know, unfortunately this parliament has never given a formal apology. The um, Howard government uh, offered an expression of deep and sincere regret in a motion of reconciliation in, in 1999, but there has never been a full formal apology until today. I wanted to make just brief mention of Labor's track record in this area, Madam Acting Deputy President, and um, beginning with my state of South Australia. When um, Labor came to office in South Australia in 1965, the then Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, uh, Mr Dunstan, introduced three pieces of legislation which granted greater autonomy to Indigenous people. Most significant of these was the introduction of the Land Trust Bill, which was the first step by any Australian state government to grant Aboriginal title to land. In 1972, when Labor was elected to government at the federal level, Prime Minister uh, Whitlam set about altering Australia's treatment of Indigenous people through a raft of positive and progressive policy initiatives. The most notable of these was when the Prime Minister granted 2,000 square metres of tribal land back to the Garaninji people. So, Madam Matching Deputy President, I am proud today to be a member of the Rudd Labor government, which has initiated and negotiated today's apology with Indigenous people. I fondly refer to the inspirational speech of former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating uh, at the launch of Australia's celebration of the 1993 International Year of the World's Indigenous People. This speech is commonly known as the Redfern speech. He made the point, and I quote, that the fundamental test of our social goals and our national will, our ability to say to ourselves and the rest of the world that Australia is a first-rate social democracy, rests in how we treat and care for our Indigenous people. I hope, Madam Acting Deputy President, that this apology represents a significant step along the road to reconciliation with Indigenous Australians. It is offered with sincerity, sympathy, compassion, hope and now a greater sense of understanding. Whilst we understand that reconciliation is a journey that remains incomplete, we are keen for the opportunity to build a new relationship with Indigenous Australians and to work together in particular to close the 17-year life expectancy gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians by maintaining long-term action and support in the areas of health, 
education, housing and employment. Madam Acting De Deputy President, I look forward to closing this dark chapter in Australian history and look forward to working together with Indigenous people for a brighter future. Thank you, Senator. Senator Levitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Today I join with others in supporting the motion moved by the Leader of the Government. The purpose of the motion is to say sorry to Indigenous Australians for past misdeeds and apology. It is to advance reconciliation. Laudable, worthy and noble objectives, deserving the support of every senator in this chamber. Previously, this parliament has resolved a similar sentiment in its expression of regret in 1999. The dislocation white settlement had on our Indigenous brothers and sisters is hard to imagine. The differences were phenomenal, be it in traditions, beliefs, technology, resistance to certain diseases and tolerance to alcohol, to name a few. Another is the understanding, or should I say, lack of understanding in how our Indigenous population operated in the sense of a genuine extended family in the nurture of children, which was often misunderstood as child neglect. I commend the statesmanlike speech of the alternative Prime Minister, Dr Nelson, delivered earlier today. Sincere, genuine and visionary. In 1996, I had the honour and privilege to serve as the chair of this parliament's native title committee seeing firsthand the unacceptable disadvantage of our Indigenous communities, visiting them from Coobapedi to Kununurra to the Torres Straits to my home state of Tasmania. In discussing native title, in discussing apologies, a number of themes did emerge. One was the Indigenous community's understandable desire to enjoy mainstream health and wealth, something which native title promised to deliver. Another was the need for local leadership and responsibility. The difference between communities only half an hour drive apart were, something, were sometimes very stark, the differences being in the local leadership. The other was the scourge of white lawyers inflicting their ideology in the name of looking after the Indigenous communities. Not surprisingly, Indigenous aspirations are largely the same as ours. They want a house, they want good health, they want a car, they want security and a future for their children. And so when former Labor Senator Graeme Richardson promised all Indigenous communities flowing water, it was welcomed. That practical help, if carried out, would have been a massive step forward, as is the intervention in the Northern Territory, restoring law and order and protecting women and children. But in the groupthink we currently have, it seems you are socially aware to be angry about not apologising for past deeds whilst condemning those who feel anger about the abuse and misdeeds that currently occur within these communities. I suspect children in danger of being raped would prefer protection to an apology. I trust, I trust we will have both. We can have both and we must have both, the practical and the symbolic. I don't mind admitting that I am more of a practical person or a person in support of substance over the symbolic. But I accept symbolism is important and it's a journey that I have travelled and accepted. Words of apology are important circuit breakers. If accepted and acknowledged with a reciprocation of forgiveness. Apologies will not provide the healing unless the words are accepted and forgiveness is reciprocated. 
In my home state of Tasmania, there was an official apology a decade ago, followed by compensation. Regrettably, I don't detect any change. Indeed, the same activists who called for the apology and, con and compensation condoned the burning of the Australian flag just a few weeks ago. I hope today's apology does not travel the same path. We need to recognise that many Australians are questioning of today's apology. Are they all mean-spirited? Absolutely not. Similarly, not all those advocating an apology are politically cor correct flunkies. Both views come from genuine, sincere Australians. But I must say the Prime Minister's approach is causing some division and cynicism. The, ref the refusal by the Prime Minister to share the wording with the Australian people until a few hours ago suggests other imperatives were at work as is his absolute refusal to share the legal advice on the issue of compensation. Sure, the Prime Minister had the media, the audience, the screens might I add that only showed Mr Rudd, and even the day and hour finally choreographed. But he had all that done before he even had the words in place. And then the parliament was denied the opportunity to fully discuss the issue to keep the self-promotion timetable for the Prime Minister. This is an issue which was developed over 10 years ago and is now brought into this place with indecent haste and lack of consultation and breach of accepted parliamentary practices. We have had the vote before the debate finished. That's fine if you are into the slick media timetable, but not so if you are truly genuine about bringing as many Australians as possible with you. The apology, I believe, has been demeaned as a result. Indeed, the Russian lack of consultation is highlighted by the reported bungle over which group were the traditional owners for the purposes of yesterday's delightful welcome to country and the different representatives for today's activities. I can understand the cynicism of many in the community. I also understand the doubts by many over the term stolen generation. As someone who's read the report cover to cover, including its appendices, and discussing some misgivings I have with one of the authors, Sir Ronald Wilson, in my office, can I say I empathise with those doubts. To assert that people who took vows of poverty and devoted their life's work to serving the Aboriginal community were complicit in genocide is unsustainable and even offensive, even more so after the findings in the Gunner and Cabillo cases. I understand how people feel when a person gets compensation because of their race for being stolen by welfare authorities when mother was doing time in jail for neglect of children, but we don't compensate capable, loving, young unmarried mothers who were defrauded by the same welfare authorities by being told their child had died at birth and given empty coffins to bury. It seems we're allowed to feel sorry for the first, but not the second. I admit when you hear the Labor member for Bass pronounce the apology as a first step and then laugh hysterically when asked what the next step might be shows the shallowness of some. To all those people that have those doubts, see any inequity or express cynicism, I simply say this. I understand those reservations, but nevertheless I plead with you to give this apology a go. Many have asked for it for many years. Many say it will make a material difference for a group in our society that have been undeniably mistreated. So why not give it a go? Time is running short. Very short. Some time ago, a group of Christian Aboriginal women that I shared with apologised for their hatred of the white people. Racism in this country has been a two-way street, but I think most of the traffic's been on the white side. But if these Aboriginal women had the 
had found it within themselves to seek forgiveness from the white community, why can we not find it within ourselves to also offer an apology for past misdeeds? That's what this apology is about. That is why I fully support it, and I trust that reconciliation will be enhanced as a result of this Senator, unanimous decision of this place. Thank you, Senator. Senator Seward. Thank you, um, Madam, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal, of the land in which we meet. I pay respect to their elders, their culture and their law. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Adnan, I also wish to acknowledge all the people who have come to Canberra for this week from all over this country to, as this issue is being discussed in Parliament. People from the Kimberleys, Alice Springs, from New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and Queensland. And to, to, to the new Rudd government, I say thank you for this day. It has been so important to so many people. I was very pleased to finally hear an Australian Prime Minister say sorry on behalf of the parliament and his government. It means a great deal to many, many Australians. I'd also like to say thank you for the opening of the 42nd parliament yesterday with the magnificent welcome to country. I'm sure every member of parliament, a member of the House of Representatives and the Senate today saw all the people that were streaming up to this place to either bear witness and look and take part in the ceremony, either on the lawns or in the Great Hall, or went to all the places around Australia where the, the apology was being televised. In my home state of Western Australia, I understand there was nearly 2,000 people at seven o'clock in the morning on the foreshore of the Swan River listening to the apology. I understand that the feeling there was just as it was here. If you were standing in the Great Hall, you're sharing this moment with the stolen generations. I don't think there's ever been a greater moment for me to actually hear that apology and be with the people feeling the emotion of that apology. It is significant that it is seen to be the very first action of this new government. But we will be watching to see that after this first step of apology and acknowledgement that the government continues to take the second, third, fourth and fifth steps that are needed to address the health, education, housing and representation and opportunities of life to the um, Aboriginal people of Australia. We welcome the commitment of the new government to close the gap on life expectancy and community health, on education and on economic opportunity. We also welcome their stated commitment to evidence-based policy, and I'll come to that again later. We are very hopeful that they will assess and respond to the evidence of the problems with the intervention in the Northern Territory to maintain or increase the commitment of resources, but to make sure that those resources are being properly used, are being used constructively and effectively. And unfortunately, the evidence that we're seeing come in now is not reflecting the ca this case. The Greens also um, again reiterate our support for a full, sincere and unreserved apology for stolen land, stolen children, stolen wages, stolen rights and stolen opportunities. We're sorry for the appalling way we non-Indigenous Australians have treated the first peoples of this land. We are sorry for the way that the removal of children has ripped the hearts out of families and created a legacy of intergenerational suffering and trauma and con contributed, a, contributed to the wider exclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from social, cultural and economic life of the nation. We desperately hope that this will be a new beginning. The Bringing Them Home report, the report on the National Inquiry into the Removal of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children, was brought down on 26 May 1997. The Greens, through Senator Bob Brown, then gave our heartfelt and unreserved apology in the Senate in 1977. My very first action as a new senator was to speak on this very issue. In my first words to the Senate, I acknowledged the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal of this country. I also went on to express my, um, I also went on to say sorry to our Indigenous peoples, and I, and I said that I looked forward to a day when we will acknowledge their voices and do them justice by enabling their true representation in governance of this country. And I also felt it was our shame that we are the only developed nation which has failed to achieve this and that the plight of our Indigenous peoples continues to worsen. 
The Greens believe there is a need for a full audit of the Bringing Them Home report and of the 54 recommendations. We need to measure the progress that has been made on these recommendations and to identify targets and timelines and monetary resources to, to deliver on each and every one of them. To date, our, our audit indicates that most have in fact not been implemented. I also want to acknowledge and remember and pay my respects to Rob Riley, who kicked off the very first inquiry into the removal of children in Western Australia, which then went on to become a model for the national inquiry. I've told Rob's story in this place before, in fact on Sorry Day in 2006. Rob was a pillar of, the, of strength for the local Noongar community in Perth. For many years he headed up the Aboriginal Legal Service, but he was also one who, night after night, went down to the lock-up when one of the Noongar, Noongar street kids was taken down to the lock-up and needed help. When Rob re released the first WA report, he came out and told his story of being taken from his mother at the age of 18 months, of being brought up, being told that his mother was dead and not learning any different until it was too late and she had passed on. Rob unfortunately took his life when it got too much for him. Rob's story gives us a very clear example of the way that removal has very stark impacts on both the health and well-being of children removed and on their families. These ongoing, tangible impacts are the reason that a heartfelt apology on behalf of the nation that is backed up by a commitment to address the wrongs of the past is so important. This clearly includes reparations, which are so clearly and strongly recommended in the Bring Them Home report. For concrete evidence and an understanding of the intergenerational impacts of, the rem of removal on the health and well-being of um, Aboriginal Australians, I draw and the stolen generations. I draw your attention to the West Australian Aboriginal Health Survey, a reminder of the speech given by then Australian of the Year, Dr Fiona Stanley, in Parliament House in May 2005. I also acknowledge the work of Dr Helen Milroy and others on this issue. This survey quantified the relationship between the removal of parents and grandparents, who are now the carers of the current generation of Aboriginal kids, and the health and well-being of those children. One in six Aboriginal children in WA were surveyed. That's over 5,000 kids, the biggest and most comprehensive survey of this kind. Of those um, 0 to 17-year-olds, nearly 13 per cent of their carers have been removed. And while the practice of the force, uh, sorry, um, had, those, those had been removed. Those carers who had been removed as children had higher rates of alcohol consumption, were more likely to have been arrested or charged, were half as likely to have someone with which they felt they could share their problems. They were also more likely to have contact with mental health services. And the children for which they cared were twice as likely to have behavioural and emotional problems, twice as likely to have a high risk of hyperactivity and emotional conduct disorders. And those children were twice as likely to be um, already abusing drugs and alcohol. As you can see, there is very clear links between those people, uh, but between the impacts um, and the stolen generations and the impact of the children of the current generations. Children growing up hearing the stories of officially sanctioned mistreatment of their parents, their mothers and their grandmothers in an environment where these injustices are not acknowledged or, even deni or are even denied can easily be led to despair particularly when they themselves are growing up in disadvantage and experiencing firsthand the impacts of social exclusion and living in a community with a high rate of unemployment in which they face an uncertain future. This is why a full and unconditional apology from the government to the stolen generations on behalf of the parliament and the government is important to not just the children who were removed, but to their children and grandchildren. The health and wellbeing burden carried by Aboriginal Australia an Aboriginal community is huge, but compared to the size of the population of, in our nation of their numbers, their population is, is relatively small. So how can we justify not being able to address their social exclusion and their disadvantage? How can we justify not being able to fix the 17-year gap in life expectancy? It was very disappointing to hear when, the, notion, when the, the discussion around the delivery of the apology was being discussed that the issue of reparation and compensation was, dis was dismissed out of hand. We believe this business is not resolved and finished until stolen generations are properly, properly compensated, until they have full reparation. 
and we Greens are committed to absolutely following that issue and ensuring that the stolen generations are fully compensated and, repara and just reparation is delivered. Thank you, Senator. Senator McEwen. Deputy President, I would uh, like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to the traditional owners of all the lands that make up our nation of Australia. In the uh, long history of the land that we now call Australia, the period of non-Indigenous occupation has been very short, less than 300 years. In that short time, much dam damage has been done to our Indigenous Australians. Some people still try and delude themselves that everything that was done was done with the best intentions. But if everything was so well intentioned, why do our Indigenous Australians still have a higher mortality rate, poorer education outcomes, poorer health, lower home ownership rates, higher unemployment rates and higher incarceration rates than the rest of us? White settlement of this nation brought with it the view that nothing else mattered but the advancement of the new white colony, and that was coupled with a belief that white people were somehow superior. It was an attitude that led to abuse and dispossession of our Indigenous Australians, a beginning from which the nation has yet to recover. As we focus today on the forced removal of children from their families, the stolen generation, there will persist those self-satisfying remarks from some who continue to say that things weren't really so bad and that the stolen generations is a misnomer. An extreme view is that there is nothing at all to apologise for if the actions were seen by the perpetrators to be for the advancement of Aboriginal Australians. Put aside for the moment, Madam Acting Deputy President, that our Indigenous Australians were not even regarded as equal Australians because they didn't have the vote, the families who had their children taken away were not consulted. They were not engaged in any discussion about the matter at all, about whether or not this action would be better for them and their children. They were not engaged and not consulted because they were not considered worthy of such engagement. Some people don't like the word stolen, yet it is very appropriate to use this term when anything is taken without permission and when it is hidden away. The fact that human beings were involved with force and secrecy used to sever ties with family and culture makes it the most offensive and cruel form of theft. The fact that governments condoned, indeed legislated for this to happen, makes it even more regretful. Let's not fool ourselves. While the nation's short history, a short white history, is rich in achievements, some of our past is shameful, and what happened was hurtful. And the hurt of the past continues to the present. And if there is hurt, we must apologise and we must say sorry. This is an Aboriginal as well as a non-Aboriginal custom. To deny an apology when it has been asked for does nothing to help us move on as a nation from a past that allowed racism and discrimination to be sanctioned by governments. Systematic discrimination swept across our country, beginning in Victoria in 1869, when the Aborigines Protection Act Victoria gave the governor power to order the removal of any Aboriginal child from their family to a reformatory or industrial school. In 1897, Queensland introduced the Aboriginal Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, which allowed the Chief Protector to hold children in dormitories. Western Australia, New South Wales, South Australia, Northern Territory and Tasmania then followed suit, giving bureaucrats the power of guardianship over Indigenous children. These laws strip mothers and fathers of their right to, have, to, be, their children, to be their child's guardian and principal caregiver. In 1937, there was nowhere for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to escape from these bigoted policies as the first Commonwealth State Conference on Native Welfare adopted assimilation as the national policy. That policy meant that children could be taken away from their parents not because they were bad parents but because the children were a different colour, because the children had a mixed parentage and needed to be saved from their traditional culture, that is, the black part of their culture. Indigenous children were placed in institutions, church missions, adopted or fostered. Often their new living conditions meant they not only lost contact with their family and friends, but with their culture. A vast majority of the stolen children had every connection severed as they were taken away from their land, their language and their loved ones. Some were able to reconnect later in life, but for many, by the time they were able to find the strength to seek out their mothers and siblings, it was too late because their loved ones had already died or because they could not reconcile the culture they had been taken from. 
Of course, experience varied from person to person, and it's ridiculous to say that all of the people affected by government policies shared the same feelings and the same fate. In the 1997 report, Bringing Them Home, one confidential submission summed up the systematic discrimination of the policies well. When, the, <coughs> when a victim said, lots of white kids do get taken away, but that's for a reason, not like us. We just got taken away because we was black kids. I suppose half-caste kids. If they wouldn't like it, they shouldn't do it to Aboriginal families. It has been argued by some that the children who were taken away were better off in the hands of white people than in their own families. How on earth can you define better off, let alone use it as some justification for wrenching families apart? Who can say that kids who were sent to a home for half-castes or places like Holbrook House in South Australia were better off because they were taught how to cook and clean for non-Indigenous Australians. Only the children and the families of the children who were removed can decide whether or not they were better off. While some Indigenous children may have been removed on genuine welfare grounds during this time, those children were not considered the stolen generation. The stolen generation is the children who were removed solely because of their race and their forced removal did not leave them better off. Many reports from victims of the stolen generation speak of incredible mistreatment extending from inadequate clothing to outright abuse. Almost a quarter of witnesses to one inquiry who were fostered or adopted reported being physically abused. One in five reported sexual abuse. One in six children were sent to institutions who were sent to institutions reported physical abuse and one in ten reported sexual abuse. Claims that the state and federal governments of the day had the best of intentions are hard to swallow. The various legislation that led to the stolen generation was racist and should never have been written. The Bringing Them Home report was followed by the National Inquiry into the Separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children from Their Families. That report made 54 recommendations. A key recommendation was that reparation be made to Indigenous people affected by policies of forced removal and that this reparation should include an acknowledgement of responsibility and an apology from all Australian governments. Since then, apologies have been forthcoming. Every state and territory government, whether Conservative or Labor, have apologised, but until now, not the Commonwealth. The Bringing Them Home report recommended that the first step in healing is the acknowledgement of truth and the delivery of an apology. It is the responsibility of the Australian government on behalf of previous Australian governments that administered this wrongful policy to acknowledge what, has, what was done and to say that we are sorry. There is another excuse used for not supporting an apology, <clears throat> and that is that today's Australians aren't responsible for what happened. The motion that was passed in this chamber today makes it clear that this is the parliament and the Commonwealth government that are providing the, providing the apology in recognition of the wrongs perpetrated by past parliaments and governments. The apology is not an expression of personal responsibility or guilt by individual Australians. Those individuals who do believe or who know they had a part to play in what happened to the stolen generations are still at liberty to apologise or not as they see fit. Government can't and won't do it for us. Now, I'm very pleased that today we have shown the world that we are prepared to acknowledge the wrongs of the past and move to the future. There was some discussion from those initially opposed to or quibbling about supporting a motion such as the one we passed today along the lines of there's more important things for the government to be addressing. I don't think there is anything more important than making an effort to, reduce, to address the wrongs of the past and to plan for and bring to fruition a better future for all Australians. Isn't that what we try and do here every day in this parliament? Whatever motion we're deba debating, whatever legislation we're considering, a better future for everyone is surely the goal. I also would like to uh, thank everyone who travelled here to Canberra today to witness the national apology and to those of the stolen generation. I'm sorry you had to wait so long for it. Now that the acknowledgement has been made, I look forward to building a better future for all Australians, especially our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Thank you, Senator. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of Senator Evans' motion on the national apology to the Stolen Generations, an apology I unequivocally and wholeheartedly support. I and my party have long advocated such an apology. I have waited a long time for this national apology by the full federal parliament and the government of the Australian Commonwealth. Although it is long overdue, it is surely welcome. Importantly, it is also unanimous. 
The great speech of former Prime Minister Paul Keating at Redfern still rings in my ears. His complete acknowledgement of harm done to the Indigenous people of Australia is now rightly followed up by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, both with the apology and the promise of much more remedial action to come. I listened carefully to every word of his address. It was a fine speech, fitting both to the occasion and the importance of this statement. I come to this debate with some understanding of my own of what the Stone Generation experienced, although each individual's experience is different. I was taken at the age of two. I too was taken from my country, but I was reclaimed in later years. As a senator, I have been heavily involved with the problems of children taken from their families. I have read hundreds of submissions, books and articles on these matters. I have spoken all over the country in this cause. After the Bringing Them Home report, in this Senate I lobbied for and initiated further inquiries into the harm done to children who were taken from their families and institutionalised or put in care. As a result, we now have a trifecta of national inquiries that attest to this reality. The reports are the Harry Oaks 1997 Bringing Them Home report, the Senate Community Affairs 2001 report into child migration, Lost Innocence Writing the Record, and the two reports, the Senate Community Affairs Inquiry into Children Raised in Institutional and Other Forms of Care, the 2004 Fault Forgotten Australians report, and the 2005 Protecting Vulnerable Children and National Challenge report. Taken together, the Forgotten Australians report conservatively estimates that there are some 500,000 people in Australia who experienced life in orphanages, children's homes or other forms of out-of-home care last century. They are the 7 to 10,000 child migrants, the 30 to 50,000 Aboriginal Stolen Generations children and the 450,000 plus Australian-born non-Indigenous children raised in orphanages and other forms of out-of-home care. These three cohorts exhibit the intergenerational effects of harming children, whereby if you hurt a child, a harmed adult will often result. The abuse, neglect and assault of children should never be tolerated, not only because it is wrong, but also because of the huge aggregated long-term social and economic effects. Although some survive care relatively intact, far too many live ruined and marginalised adult lives with the painful memories and scars of childhoods lived in fear. Over the last century, thousands are believed to have committed suicide. As adults, people harmed in care have endured lives tarnished by welfare dependency, substance abuse, mental and other health disorders, relationship and parenting problems, and endless searches for identity. To this very day, many continue to suffer from the loss of identity and family, from feelings of abandonment, from a fear of authority, and from a lack of trust and security. The upshot is that this policy of forcible removal directly contributed to the alienation of Aboriginal society today. Its effects have been profound, not only for the survivors, but also for subsequent generations who continue to suffer the enduring effects of the removal of parents and grandparents. It is indisputable that the contemporary problems facing Aboriginal society cannot be understo understood without reference to the shameful history. To my mind, there are two main aspects to apologising for the sin of forcibly removing Indigenous children from their families. One is to apologise for the policy, and one is to apologise for the execution of the policy. The evidence is irrefutable. The Stolen Generations policy was racist in intent. It was not a welfare policy of removing neglected children who were at risk in dysfunctional families. It was designed to get so-called half-caste children out of black families and to begin a process of assimilation into the white community. There were already federal and state welfare laws allowing for the removal of children at risk in dysfunctional families. No other legislation was necessary. But racially based legislation and regulation was introduced for the specific purpose of removing indigenous children from their families, their communities and their country. Yes, there were indigenous neglected children who were at risk in dysfunctional families who were removed for welfare reasons. But most children were removed regardless of their specific home circumstances. Having been removed, if the execution of the policy had been to high standards of care, then that would have been a mitigating factor. But the execution of the policy was mostly bad, and churches, agencies, state and federal governments all failed in their duty of care. If we compensate victims of crime and trauma, we should also compensate those who experience childhoods of fear, neglect and criminal acts. 
Evidence to all three inquiries revealed children experiencing severe physical pain, fear and terror resulting from beatings and floggings. The Bringing Them Home report says at page 161, and I quote, I've seen girls naked, strapped to chairs and whipped. We've all been through the locking up period, locked in dark rooms, in a little room like a cell, and kept keep us on bread and water for a week. Countless stories are told of the sexual and physical assault of indigenous children of neglect, abuse and mental torture. I wish journalists and politicians would stop euphemizing rape as abuse. It is criminal sexual assault. I wish they would stop their easy belief that nuns and priests acted with the best intentions. Yes, some did, but most seemed to just stand by, while others were just satanic. Let me give you an example of the abhorrent behaviour across all institutions that shows why abuse is so weak a word for what too many indigenous and non-indigenous children endured at the hands of those who preyed on them. The vile crime of sexual assault was summed up in the Child Migrant Report at page 75, and I quote, Boys and girls were subjected to sexual assault in a variety of forms while in care. The committee heard stories of boys being subjected to explicit sexual acts such as fondling and gentle touching, of being forced to perform oral sex, of being repeatedly sodomized, and of girls being assaulted and raped. Evidence was also given of boys being pressured into bestial acts. That's acts with animals, for those of you who, of you who don't know what that means. The failure to exercise the duty of care demands restitution. It demands reparations. It demands compensation. In my view, a compensation or redress scheme should not be solely the responsibility of the Commonwealth when various governments, churches, charities and agencies were proportionately responsible. Redress was an important and unanimous recommendation of the Forgotten Australians report. Recommendation 6 of that report stated that the Commonwealth Government establish and manage a national reparation fund for victims of institutional abuse in institutions and out-of-home care settings, and that the scheme be funded by contributions from the Commonwealth and State Governments and the churches and agencies proportionally. The Commonwealth have regard to the schemes already in operation in Canada, Ireland and Tasmania, and I can add since in Queensland, Tasmania and Western Australia. Uh, sorry, Queensland and Western Australia. In the design and implementation of the above scheme, a board be established to administer the scheme, consider claims and award monetary compensation. The board in determining claims be satisfied that there was a reasonable likelihood that the abuse occurred. The board should have regard to whether legal redress has been pursued. The processes established in ass assessing claims be non-adversarial -adver and informal and compensation be provided for individuals who have suffered physical, sexual or emotional abuse while residing in these institutions or out-of-home care settings. Although the Senate committee acknowledged that the Commonwealth generally did not have a direct role in administering institutional care arrangements, it did consider that the Commonwealth should contribute to a national reparation scheme as an act of recompense on behalf of the nation. The opportunity is there for the Rudd government to take the necessary steps to right the wrongs of the past. The opportunity is there for the Labour members of the government, particularly in the Senate, to advocate that in your own forums. It is neither too hard nor is it unaffordable, as evidenced by the international redress schemes in Canada and Ireland and here in Australia by Tasmania, Queensland and Western Australia. The West Australian scheme, uh, which has been most recently announced, uh, amounts to $114 million and applies to all uh, children harmed or adults who were harmed as children in institutions. The amount of money outlaid by the Commonwealth would be expended over a number of years, uh, based on the Irish experience, at least six years, I would have thought, taking into account the application and decision-making process. In sum, it would not be too hard to add to the three states' efforts so far with a national reparations fund that also picks up contributions by those who have not yet accepted their proportional responsibility. In concluding, I want to again state how warmly and strongly I welcome the actions of the Labour government today, and I hope that they can do much more in future, including the establishment of a national reparations fund. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Cormann. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a relatively new Australian, the debate on the apology is a difficult debate for me to be involved in. As I said in my first speech in the Senate, I chose to become an Australian, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I love my adopted country, I admire the Australian spirit, 
I admire what has been achieved by successive generations of Australians, initially in very difficult conditions in a relatively short period of time. And I'm grateful for the opportunities that the efforts and sacrifices of past generations have created for Australians today. I became involved in the political process because I wanted to play a part in helping to make Australia a better place for future generations. In taking note of the motion on the apology, though, I rise to express my reservations and give a voice to the reservations of many Australians on how our government has handled this issue, which has divided our nation for the whole period I have been an Australian citizen. With great empathy and sincere regret for the personal hurt and suffering of those who were unjustifiably removed from their families, I remain concerned about the why we have passed this apology today. I am concerned about the use of the term stolen generations. I'm concerned about us representing this generation of Australians sitting in judgment over the actions and motivations of past generations of Australians. More than anything, I'm concerned about the process, the divisive way our government has handled this sensitive and emotive issue. I'm concerned that the government was not prepared to take all of the Australian people into its confidence before last night. I'm concerned about the secrecy and lack of transparency. And I'm concerned that the wording of the apology when finally released with less than 16 hours to go goes well beyond an apology to those who were unjustifiably removed from their families. And finally, I'm concerned that the government has refused to release the legal advice it says it has, that this apology will not lead to a requirement for compensation. And I'm concerned that two weeks ago, we were told by the chair of the Northern Territory Intervention Task Force that our new government had still not given any direction to them on how to proceed with the intervention aimed at the protection of Aboriginal children from abuse and neglect to die. In short, in my view, the government's handling of this difficult issue has been arrogant, it has been divisive, and it's been insincere. Where Dr. Nelson demonstrated true leadership by directly engaging in the difficult debate with those in our party room that quite legitimately held different views, the Prime Minister, in contrast, arrogantly railroaded this parliament and through this parliament, the Australian people. He railroaded this parliament with a partisan political approach. It is Dr. Nelson who demonstrated true leadership. Without Dr. Nelson's leadership today, it would not have happened. All Australians should be concerned if the approach to this issue sets a tone for this government's approach to other difficult issues for our nation. To be meaningful, an apology has to be sincere. To be sincere, this apology should have the support of the Australian people. The apology was given by the Parliament as representatives of the Australian people. The Government is aware that the Australian people have been divided on this issue. The Government is aware that Australians remain divided on this issue today. And the government must have been concerned about the views of the Australian people. Why else did the government make a deliberate decision to keep the wording of the apology secret until the last possible moment? Why did they, on this first opportunity to be open and transparent, to listen and to be upfront with the Australian people, exclude them from their consideration of what was their first important priority in Parliament? Why did they not engage with the Australian people in a genuine attempt to bring the Australian people together? We will not get healing and reconciliation if we exclude the Australian people from this process. I hope sincerely that moving forward the Government will be engaging in a genuine fashion with all Australians on this and other issues. 
The Parliament today has apologised. It was an apology that had bipartisan support. Now that it has happened, we should and need to move on. We all need to focus on helping to achieve better outcomes for Aboriginal people. The Little Children Are Sacred report confronted us all with our responsibility to focus on the safety and protection of Aboriginal children subject to abuse and neglect today. It continues to confront us and should confront our government every waking hour of every single day. And in the spirit of both the motion for reconciliation passed by the Parliament in 1999 and the motion passed by the Parliament today, we all need to commit as a nation to the cause of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, to work together to strengthen the bonds that unite us, to respect and appreciate our differences and to build a fair and prosperous future we can all share. Thank you. Senator Crossan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm uh, extremely privileged to be part of a federal parliament that took a giant leap of faith in the annals of Australian history books today. I think today will go down as one of the momentous days uh, in the history of this nation when we look back on it, not just tomorrow, and we reflect on the absolute significance of today, but we think about this next week and years to come. When I first uh, stood in this uh, Senate, I offered my personal apologies to the people of the Stolen Generation. Having lived and worked with uh, people in the Northern Territory for more than 25 years, I've heard many stories. I've got to know many of these people. Uh, both at a personal level and at a deep friendship level. Uh, and I know that for decades they have waited for some acknowledgement, not only by the parliament, by but this country, that what has occurred in the past was such an incredible mistake and was so terribly wrong. If you actually think of yourself as a person and what defines you as a person, it's actually your family. It's who you are and where you've come from and who you relate to, what you learn from each other, how you defend and support each other, and at times how you have some massive blues with each other as well. I can't imagine as a mother of four what it would have possibly have been like back in uh, the turn of this century to see your child being removed uh, from your arms or from your camp or from your family existence. I can't imagine the pain that a mother or even her relatives would have felt in, in seeing that occur. We've heard the stories, we've watched the movies, and I think everybody can internalise what kind of impression that would have on you as a parent and, of course, as you as a child. And so we know now, of course, the significance of the 1995 Herriot Report, which was called Bringing Them Home. The term stolen generation, of course, was first used by Professor Peter Reid when he was at Australian National University. And I think it's a term that has stuck with this nation because it's so aptly described what these people were and what they were to themselves. But as a national country and as, as we take pride in our country, we always look at the achievements of this country, whether they're scientific achievements, sporting achievements arts and crafts, and we relish in those, and we're happy, and we celebrate those. We don't do such a good job at recognising the faults uh, and perhaps the flaws in our history and confronting them full on. The fact that children were taken from their parents on the basis of their race is indeed a national shame, and we do have to confront that past act and that admission. And we've done it today, and I think we've done it in a very appropriate, capable way. We've done it through consultation with Indigenous people and through the people who have been concerned. We've done it by talking to members of the uh, National Sorry Day Committee. We've done it by talking to members of the Stolen Generation Alliance. In the Northern Territory, I had the privilege of meeting for many hours representatives from the Northern Territory Stolen Generation Aboriginal Corporation. Uh, members of the Stolen Generation who come from the Redder Dixon home, 
from Croker Island, from Garden Point, from Groot Island, from Carlin, the Carlin Compound, the fostered and adopted group, and members from Catherine. The significance of those names, of course, is they were the names of the homes that children were taken to in the Northern Territory, the Reda Dixon home, to the Carlin Compound, those that were taken to Groker Island or those that were taken to Garden Point. There aren't too many of them left, I have to say, probably around 186 in the Northern Territory. In fact, only three still alive who were taken to the Carlin compound. And of course, Auntie Hilda Muir is one of those. She couldn't be here in Canberra today, but I know she would have been listening in the Hall of Parliament House in the Northern Territory. Can I just say that what people were after was a final recognition from this parliament that the acts and the actions uh, back then were wrong. But they were very clear to me in their discussions that they wanted this day to be about the beginning of a new era. They wanted to be very clear that this was about not a closure or an end, not about signalling further action or assistance, but about a brand new day about bringing peoples together, about confronting the past and acknowledging how severely wrong that was, and everybody moving forward and taking a step forward. They wanted to ensure that it was made on behalf of the Australian Parliament and not the Australian people. They lay no fault at any one particular person, not then and not now. They wanted to ensure that this parliament acknowledged that the acts of this parliament were wrong, and we've done that. And of course, that has particular reference to the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory Aboriginal Ordinance Act of 1911 applied specifically to families in the Northern Territory. They were directly affected by this. Uh, they, unlike any other non-Commonwealth legislation in various states, the Commonwealth Aboriginals Ordinance Act had a direct effect uh, and a specific effect from the families in the Northern Territory. They wanted to ensure that the policy was to be to the people affected by the laws, policies and practices of forcible removal. In fact, what they were hoping for was that Recommendation 5A of the Bringing Them Home report would be specified and enacted today. And that uh, is what has happened. Recommendation 5A said that all Australian parliaments, and now all Australian parliaments have, officially acknowledge the responsibility of their predecessors for their laws, policies and practices of forcible removal, because these children were forcibly removed, uh, and that make appropriate reparation as detailed in the following recommendations. And so that's occurred. Uh, we've had the start today, of course, with uh, Prime Minister Rudd setting up a commission to look at housing and uh, preschool education. It's a beginning, and it's a new beginning, and that's exactly what the members of the Stolen Generation uh, wanted. They were also concerned that this apology must acknowledge their Indigenous mothers. And I noticed that today the Prime Minister, in his speech, did exactly that. They wanted to acknowledge that their mothers who were left behind when the children were taken suffered the most unkind and cruel impact that you could possibly imagine as a parent. They also want us to acknowledge that when they were removed from their families, they incurred an incredible loss of language, a loss of culture and, of course, a loss of land, because a lot of these people would have been the next senior people in their communities and camps, and the next line of traditional owners. All of that, of course, has been denied of them. These children were discouraged from family contact. They were taught to reject Aboriginality. Their institutional conditions were harsh. Their education was often basic. Many never received wages. Physical punishments were often common. They were at risk of sexual abuse and the authorities failed to care for and protect the children. And we know, of course, and we've had documented in the Bringing Them Home report, the lifelong effect that some of these people have endured. The loss of primary carer in infancy, uh, the fact that 
forcibly remove people were no better off, despite the fact that's what the policies intended. Their parenting skills have been undermined. Their next generations are at risk. There's a loss of heritage, and there has been massive effects on those left behind, particularly the loss of language, culture, and land. These people deserved this apology today, uh, and I am glad to have been part of it. I just want to say, in finishing, one of the strongest memories I have of my time in this Senate is walking over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And I just want to place on record today my thanks to non-Indigenous people who have walked the journey with the Solon Generation uh, people over the years, uh, people out there in the broader community who have worked hard to achieve the sorry uh, apology we've had from the federal parliament today, and to those members of the Stolen Generation who are wandering around at morning tea this morning with thanks on their T-shirts. This has been a very significant day for them and a very significant day for our nation. And I sincerely hope that we can all now work, walk forward together in a new era of reconciliation. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, I am deeply and genuinely sorry for the way in which uh, Indigenous Australians have been treated uh, for many years. I can apologise for the fact that in the time that I've been in Parliament, uh, we didn't do enough to address many of those problems. I'm also very sorry uh, that some of the initiatives uh, that we implemented for Indigenous people in the Northern Territory, the only jurisdiction over which we have control, have already been placed in doubt by the new government. I am desperately sorry about the treatment of Aborigines even as we speak. Uh, stories abound in my state of Queensland about uh, sexual abuse of young Indigenous people and worse than third world health and education services provided by the state government. The state government seems incapable or uninterested, uninterested in addressing those issues. Daily in Queensland there are reports of these tragic uh, incidents. All the talk all the symbolism, all the hand-wringing will not address the appalling situations that many Indigenous people still find themselves in today. The work that the Howard government started should be accelerated, but already the politically correct brigade are stalling that work. And I mention just one instance, uh, the actions of the Northern Territory and Commonwealth governments in reversing the opening up of communities to other Australians which seems to be to be so essential to involve Indigenous Australians in the wider community and to let the wider community interact uh, with Indigenous Australians. And in this regard, I share the concern of prominent Australians like Mr Warren Mundine, the former president of the ALP, uh, who has, uh, as well as I do, concerns about bringing back the permit system. Uh, many of the uh, issues implemented by Mr Brough should have been duplicated around Australia but it served the purposes of Labor state governments not to accept those solutions. I'm desperately sorry for the plight of many Indigenous people who find themselves in the revolving door of poverty, substance abuse and sexual abuse, and parents who are simply incapable of bringing up their children. The forcibly separated generation of Indigenous people were separated by well-meaning people decades and decades ago. I don't believe that I or other Australians can apologise for actions taken by former generations in different circumstances at time of different attitudes, laws and Christian beliefs. I venture to say that all the missionaries, churches and state government officials did what they did, believing it to be the best uh, for those involved, for the children they believed to be at risk, for the children they believed would never be able to enjoy what they believed would be a civilised way of life. In today's thinking, all that has changed and would not be repeated. Having said that, though, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, one only has to look at the everyday occurrences in the non-Indigenous communities today when young people seen to be at risk are forcibly taken from their parents because those parents are simply incapable of dealing with young children at a particular age. I know about this because I have family in this situation. But if apologies are to be uh, given and compensation paid, I think it behoves the government to look wider than just the position of Indigenous people. I want to refer the government to the report of the Senate Affairs References Committee entitled Forgotten Australians, published in August 2004, which gives a damning account of young non-Indigenous Australians who were forcibly taken from their parents in the 1930s and 40s. I'm indebted to a Mr John Walsh from Roma in Queensland who contacted me 
and alerted me to this report into the terrible situation in which he and many other young Australians found themselves in the last 70 years. In many cases, uh, the father had volunteered to join the Australian Defence Force to go overseas in defence of our country and the empire. Their spouses left with young children who, when they'd asked for assistance from the government of the time, had their young children forcibly removed from them. Horrific stories abound of how these young people were molested by monsters, how they were uh, transferred from one orphanage to another and at an early age made to uh, work for their existence. If apologies are to be made and compensation paid to Indigenous people, they should, in my view, also be made to all those Australians, be they Indigenous or otherwise, who have suffered through the forcible removal of children from their parents in years gone by. I am deeply sorry on what happened to those people, and I do believe uh, that those still alive who suffered and continue to suffer uh, should uh, receive uh, the same uh, uh, treatment or should be treated in the same way as those Indigenous people also forcibly removed. I would assume again that those who perpetrated the acts of separation in the 1930s and 40s uh, did so not out of uh, malice uh, but out of what they believed at the time was the correct way to deal with the situation as they found it. We can look back today and say how inappropriate and in fact devastating those actions have been, uh, but again I remain to be convinced of the worth of a formal apology by the Australian government for actions perpetrated by another government in another time. Uh, nothing will ever prevent me, having learnt of their plight, from being deeply sorry for them as I am for those Indigenous people who were forcibly separated and suffered as a result. But a formal apology, I think, does not take the matter further. The day after the formal apology, life will move on for most Indigenous people. I want to see out of this debate continuation of the good work started by the Howard government uh, that, uh, so that in that way we can really do something to address the problems that confront Indigenous people. Formal apologies have been offered by churches and state governments uh, in the past and what has been achieved. After all, actions speak louder than words. State governments have uh, responsibility for safety, protection, education and health and have failed and words will not fix these deficiencies. It needs real actions. I draw the Senate's attention to the uh, motion passed by Parliament in 1999 where the Parliament expressed its deep regret and sincere regret that Indigenous uh, Australians suffered injustices under the practices of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many of these Indigenous people feel uh, as, and continue to feel as a consequence of the, those uh, practices. Uh, those words, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, back in 1999 were actually followed by action which culminated in the Northern Territory intervention, the first real attempt to right the appalling conditions and circumstances of Australia's Indigenous people. If the apology takes that any further, then I'm very happy. I doubt that it will, however, and what we need to do from this government and is to, what we need to get from this uh, government is not more rhetoric and hand-wringing, but real action of the sort that Mr. Mr Bruff introduced to try and build the situation of Indigenous people to what other Australians accept, rightly so, as a matter of right. I also urge the government to look at the plight of the forgotten Australians and any other persons, Indigenous or otherwise, who have been forcibly separated from their parents by the authorities over the years. And whilst on the subject of uh, actions of past generations, which are unthinkable today, I wonder what the government has planned for those South Sea Islanders uh, taken not only from their families and loved ones, but also from their own country. They were taken by what was then acceptable conduct according to the laws and norms of those days, but actions which today we find totally repugnant and abhorrent, uh, not to mention unlawful. I'm desperately sorry for what former generations did to these people, uh, but uh, with the benefit of uh, hindsight, uh, I do so from a much more enlightened era. In fact, I'm desperately sorry what former generations of governments, churches and welfare agencies uh, did to uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and to South Sea Islanders, to name but a few of the peoples of Australia who have every right to feel distraught and resentful. I apologise for any hurt that I myself may have ever brought to the uh, uh, people of Indigenous Australia in my lifetime. I hope there isn't anything that fits that description, apart from my reticence to pillory state governments and former Australian governments who have ignored the problems uh, of uh, Indigenous people. And I'm also sorry that we didn't move with action like the Northern Territory intervention uh, earlier than this. I am not in a position 
to apologise for the actions of Australians in past generations who took actions which in most cases were well-meaning. If symbolism and words do solve the, the hurt, uh, then as I say, I'll be very happy. If, however, they are just words of political expediency that mean little and have even less impact, impact on the real solution, then I won't be uh, happy. And Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, I conclude with again, as we did in 1999, a, a express the Parliament's deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practice of past generations and uh, also apologise uh, for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continue to feel as a consequence of those practices. And Mr President, I conclude with the final paragraph of that 1999 motion uh, that the Parliament believes that we, having achieved much as a nation, can now move forward together for the benefit of all Australians. Thank you. Senator Stotter Spoyer. Deputy President, it is with great pride that I uh, speak to and support the motion before us today and, of course, acknowledge on this uh, day of history uh, the traditional owners of this land. Uh, my colleagues and I support this motion in its entirety and, as you would be aware, we did not support amendments because today is not a day for quibbling. Today is not a day for political point scoring. Uh, today is an occasion that must not be marred. I am so proud to stand in this chamber today and I support the eloquence of the words chosen by the Prime Minister and I support the way he spoke those words. And it is very rare occasion indeed that I can say he spoke for me today. I don't know if I've often been able to say that of a Prime Minister in this place. And I'm only sad that I feel that I'm leaving this place just as the government seems to be getting it right on these matters of history and of such great importance. That's not to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the Democrats nor I feel strongly about the issue of compensation. Of course we do. And I feel it is quite right that these issues of compensation and an apology be dealt with and dealt with separately. But I do think that as a matter of principle and of fairness, I can't reconcile how any government uh, can acknowledge the error of the policies, that is, of a stolen generation, and the pain and the suffering that these policies have inflicted, yet rule out any form of reparation. So yes, that debate will come, but today uh, is an important day for an apology, just as yesterday's welcome to country was a remarkable uh, and historic event. Uh, and uh, I found it a wonderfully moving ceremony yesterday, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. It felt like we were moving as a country in the right direction. I think the Prime Minister was talking about carpe diem. Uh, today it's about ex unitate vires. We are united, united as a parliament and hopefully united as a people in moving ahead and healing wounds. It is an honour to speak as a South Australian, representing, of course, the, uh, the descendants of those who have walked this land for many thousands of generations before us, members of an ancient and proud culture unique in its longevity and its character. And, of course, many people would be aware of the many, many different um, Indigenous Australians who are represented in South Australia, my home state. But is one generation in particular, Mr Acting Deputy President, to whom today I direct my thoughts, my sorrow, my empathy and my words. To a generation who suffered unspeakable wrong, a generation who were torn from that which they held most dear and thus were doomed to confront a life without the healing and the guiding that a family love can provide. As a senator for the state of South Australia, I echo the words and endorse the words of the motion without detraction. I am sorry. I am sorry that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were removed from their families, their culture, their clans. I'm sorry for the suffering and the hurt of those stolen generations, their descendants and their families left behind. I'm sorry for the pain, for the sorrow for the degradation that was inflicted on these generations and their families by successive government policies. I'm sorry this pain was inflicted by policies determined by former members of governments that, of course, we now represent.
to those who have campaigned relentlessly for many years, for decades, to reach this moment, I offer my congratulations, my solidarity and my admiration. I know many thought that this day would never come, and may well it not for the tireless efforts of um, many organisations, Mr Acting Deputy President, many individuals. Um, Reconciliation Australia is one example, the Sorry Day Committee, and of course there are so many individual Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who have worked so hard. I wear a scarf today given to me by Luicia O'Donoghue many years ago as we um, debated this, uh, uh, of this issue and worked together on it. I, um, I think there are many, many people who uh, are enjoying this particular occasion and feel that their efforts have not been totally in vain. I offer my encouragement for, although the magnitude of this occasion cannot be understated, as is made clear by the words of this apology, it is but a first step towards a shared future built on mutual recognition and empowerment. And of course, there remains much work to be done, as has been acknowledged, I think, by all in this place. It's true that the divide between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians represents a blight on this nation still. Indigenous Australians live 17 years fewer, are 17.5 times more likely to be in jail or fail basic numeracy and literacy tests, three to four times more than non-Indigenous Australians. But much has been made of the symbolism of this act in the face of such figures. And symbolism is important. It does matter. As Reconciliation Australia has said, the divide between so-called symbolic and practical aspects of reconciliation is a false and dangerous construction, one which fails to recognise that the apology is fundamentally about building mutually respectful relationships as the foundation for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians moving forward together, acknowledging our shared history and looking to a shared future. Mr Acting Deputy President, I do congratulate this government on the initiative it's shown and for imbuing this apology with the priority that it deserves by making it one of the foremost acts of their 42nd, the 42nd parliament. This should not be, and I don't believe it has been about blame. I think this has always been about healing and about moving forward. And hence uh, the Democrats' strong belief that an important part of this, as indeed the Bringing Them Home report acknowledges, that compensation and reparation is an important part of that. It's about ensuring that we acknowledge that pain and suffering. It does not do justice to the Bringing Them Home report, um, and it doesn't bring an end to this unfinished business if we just have the apology. But for today, it's a fundamental and important first step. Uh, to the government and to opposition colleagues, uh, those of us on the crossbench and to all elected members in this place, and especially the new ones, I think, through whom uh, some of us will live vicariously over the, uh, the coming years, I urge you to seize this cooperative uh, spirit, you know, use this, the spirit of this movement to move forward, um, hopefully and often in circumstances such as these, the collective goodwill of the movement can be lost in semantics and cynicism. I hope not. I say to you now, let's declare here and now that such a faith will not befall this parliament, and the generations of the future will look back on this moment as the birth of a united and mature nation that's been big enough to recognise the mistakes of the past while simultaneously moving forward to a better future. Mr Acton, Deputy President, uh, I wholeheartedly support the motion, and I commend my Senate colleagues to do likewise. Thank you. Senator Hurley. Mr. Acting Deputy President, it is a great pleasure to follow um, my fellow South Australian Senator, um, Senator Stott Despoyer, um, to, uh, to support this national apology to the stolen generations. Um, in May 1997, I spoke to a motion in the South Australian Parliament as a, a member of that parliament at the time. It was a motion of apology and reconciliation. And I indicated then that I thought it was appropriate, would be appropriate that the federal parliament make a similar apology. Now, it has taken more than 10 years, um, and I hope that this occasion means that Aboriginal people will finally have the sense 
of a complete and heartfelt apology from all of the uh, nations of Australia, because all of the states and territories now, I, I think, have delivered an apology for their role in the administration of, uh, of the rem forcible removal of Aboriginal children. But it is, um, it is very pleasing to see that the national parliament the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition and uh, all of the um, uh, minor parties here in this chamber have now joined in one voice with the states to, to speak that apology to those people who have suffered the pain and, and the devastating consequences at that policy which was aimed at assimilation of Aboriginal people. Um, so it, um, at, at the time, um, it was, um, uh, we, we gave the apology in uh, the South Australian Parliament. It marked the anniversary of 30 years since the 1967 referendum to give the Commonwealth special powers to be used for the benefit of the Aboriginal people. And I'd just like to um, reiterate a short part of the remarks that I made at the time. I said, it is not enough to recognise and acknowledge the mistakes of the past. We must also make a commitment to avoid those mistakes in the future. In 1967, the Australian people voted overwhelmingly in favour of that referendum in a country where very few referendum questions get up. The Australian people did that, I believe, because they thought it was a fair thing and a recognition of the rights of people in this country. We take for granted that our government is set up to make laws for our benefit, even if we do not agree with those laws. But Aborigines have no such confidence based on their past experiences. The rights of Aborigines as citizens were denied, rights such as life, liberty, property and dignity. They deserve an apology for those past mistakes and deserve to be told that we will ensure that it will not happen in the future. And I think that that is still precisely what this apology is about now. In, in, in my view, it is about um, it is about um, apologising for the past and making sure that these mistakes do not happen in the future and doing something about it. Um, Senator Macdonald quoted a friend of mine, uh, Warren Mundine, earlier about another issue, but I'll, I'll quote him. I saw him just now at lunchtime and he said that this apology is essential because it will raise itself again and again. And just get in the way of what we do in the future. So that's another reason why it's important. We must, we must have this as the, as the starting ground before we can go forward and rectify those mistakes. Um, and I think really it is in, re in rectifying those mistakes, we must first of all ask ourselves why we're doing that. And this is about um, the dignity and respect that we hold for the Indigenous people in Australia and the acknowledgement that we will treat all Australians with justice and equity. We don't treat them all the same, but we treat all Australians with uh, justice and equity and respect their rights as individuals. And in uh, moving on to the future, the, the government, the Prime Minister in his speech today talked about um, targets in education and health. And I want to, to, um, to support those targets, but with the understanding that that is with the full cooperation and consultation with Aboriginal people and not have these targets decided for them, because we must um, give Aboriginal people the dignity and respect that we give to all Australians people and give them the choice the say in their life and their lifestyle and never deny that to them. Um, because um, it won't work, basically, if, if we don't do that. And, and I am no expert. I have spent some time working and living in outback uh, areas of South Australia and the Northern Territory. I spent um, some years in Alice Springs working in a pathology lab at the hospital there. And, and therefore had um, some experience of the Aboriginal communities around Alice Springs. And I have a, a sister who's worked for 30 years in education in the Northern Territory, particularly with Aboriginal children. So I don't claim any particular expe expertise, but this is my assessment of, uh, of where the Aboriginal community is, 
is positioned, that before we can move forward, we need to have full cooperation with that community. They must make the choice uh, in, in which direction they want to head. And um, the, the Prime Minister referred to that in his speech this morning. He said there is no one-size-fits-all approach to the hundreds of Aboriginal communities around Australia. He said what we are doing is setting a destination, and along the way, along that destination, uh, we should be asking the Aboriginal people to come along with us. Aboriginal people have been here on this land for many, many thousands of years. Uh, we came and we built our country and our wealth on their land. And in doing that, we displaced and or disrupted um, many Aboriginal people. That means, in my view, that we have an ongoing obligation to, for care and consideration for those that continue to suffer the consequences of that trauma. And that is the way that we should be addressing ourselves in the future, in providing compensation, ongoing compensation for that. And that this small proportion of our wealth should not be paid with any sense of paternalism or, or someone with a better knowledge of things coming in to provide for those communities. It should be paid as a just and a right uh, contribution for the displacement that the, those Aboriginal communities have suffered. Well, certainly, um, uh, just in conclusion, it has given me great pleasure to be uh, here as a representative of uh, South Australia in the federal parliament to, to be part of this national apology. And from the many people I've seen around Parliament House uh, today, it is, um, it is quite clear that it has given pleasure for many Aboriginal people to receive um, that apology. And I think that that is a wonderful start for the future for, for relations between um, Aboriginal people and uh, the Parliament of Australia and the people of Australia. Thank you. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Senate is debating the motion of a national apology, apology to the stolen generation. Today is about honouring Indigenous Australians, reflecting on their past and apologising for laws and policies which fail to render uh, the, and honour the uh, Indigenous Australians. We say sorry today. We do not know ourselves the grief and the pain of forced removal and separation from family and community. We know of it and we have listened. Today I also want to acknowledge that there were a lot of dedicated people from religions and non-religions that gave a great deal of their life to man missions or make or work with Aboriginals. In these distant communities, the Lutherans at Hopevale, the Brethren at Dermagee, I know the Catholics were represented and so were the Methodists, to look after the welfare, the education and the health of Aboriginal communities. In passing this motion, we must in no way denigrate their efforts and their lives work. We see by your reception of this, of this apology how much it was needed. Today there will be celebrations aplenty. The sorry motion was telecast live from many media outlets. There was cheering from the crowds outside and in, and in Parliament House, and people watching from around Australia. I know that today is all these wonderful things, but there are many Australians who will be thinking that tomorrow, in some remote and isolated Indigenous communities, there will still be no work, lots of alcohol and violence, child abuse and neglect, and intolerable levels of sickness and disease. Apologies for the past are meaningful if they lead to a renewed vigour to do more and to do better. The past cannot be undone, but the future can be remade. There is a genuine mood in the nation today that we can do better, that we must do better and that we will do better. One step in this process 
to do is to do more and to do better, is to look again at how remote communities can be made sustainable, where they are not reliant on government handouts and welfare, but are in control of their own choices and destiny. For example, Indigenous communities in Queensland have large amounts of land and water not being used to grow anything. They could grow and, in some instances, have negotiated forestry agreements to grow trees, creating employment and hope for their community to establish a forestry industry in those communities that have lots of land in North Queensland. Queensland has other good examples of success such as contracting businesses in the cotton industry at St George and Goodnawindi. Many of the Indigenous people have their own businesses there and contract out to the cotton growers. And mining and transport at Mount Isa. Mining companies also offer employment in remote Australia. Some communities are developing their own tourist villages and caravan parks. These are but a few examples of how sustainability can create and ensure a better future for those Indigenous people and their communities. With this apology, we now need to ensure that our efforts are renewed and refocused to ensure the mistakes of the past are learnt from and never repeated. I hope this apology assists in the healing process of those who have suffered from past decisions. I also hope that the momentum for a better future for our Indigenous community is continued with examples like I have described in Queensland and with the Northern Territory intervention. What worries me is that one day in the Parliament of the future, senators may vote to apologise for what this generation has failed to do for our Indigenous people. We will fail if we do not focus on practical help to forge healthy, educated, law-abiding and sustainable communities. Today, maybe we feel good about ourselves because we apologise for the past mistakes. But tomorrow, we must assume responsibility for our own mistakes and make action, not rhetoric, our weapon of choice. I cannot let this debate go by without recognising the frustration felt by many decent Australians when it comes to Indigenous policy. Their sincere and generous desire to help Indigenous Australians has been backed by a huge amount of public funds, yet it seems to many ordinary Australians that there is such a long way to go. The willingness to see Indigenous Australians succeed is wholeheartedly felt across the nation, but the disappointments have been many. Cross-cultural misunderstandings and internal politics, black and white, have contributed to the difficulties. Sometimes there was conflict despite everyone having the common under underlying aim of improving life for Indigenous people. It is right that there be joy and tears today. It's right that we say sorry. It is also right that we move forward as a nation. The present and the future demand our attention. The world sees the huge abyss of despair in some Aboriginal communities. Australians want to help. They want to stop clouds gathering over the young children. So let there be jubilation today. Let the victims of injustice breathe easier. But please, God, let the leaders stand up and insist on a mutual responsibility as included in this motion. Thank you, Senator Boswell. Senator Nettler. Fantastic day today. I was um, riding my bike into Parliament this morning, and there were just hordes of people walking towards Parliament, wanting to be here out the front of Parliament, watching on the big screen. And in the in the Great Hall, people were streaming out the back just to be there, to be present on such a historic and 
and really important day. And it's just fantastic to know that that was occurring, not just here in Canberra, but we've heard all the reports today about the people who were filed into Federation Square in Melbourne, into Martin Place in the rain in Sydney. People gathered at Burke High School to watch on the big screens there and to hear from local Indigenous leaders about what this apology meant to them. And close to my house at the block in Redfern, there many people gathered there as well and were a part of watching the apology that occurred in here. So it's a fantastic day for all of us to be here and to be participating in. And I really um, think that having an apology in the name of the parliament today um, feels really special to us, but the people that it is meant for and that today is really for are for those people who make up the stolen generation. Um, and, and I really hope that today is an opportunity for them to start that process of healing. We've all acknowledged it's just the first step. It's the beginning of a long process of healing. And I hope that today and the activities here in Parliament can, can contribute and assist that process of, of trying to start the healing process. Much damage has been done. Um, and it's only really when we acknowledge that damage and work together that we can start to forge a better future um, for this country. And there were two young schoolgirls, three young schoolgirls, who um, were at the block this morning in Redfern. Um, they were on their way to school and they came because they really wanted to be there. And I heard them on the radio just earlier today and they were saying they were being asked about what it meant to them, what did the apology mean to them. And they said, well, we know one thing, it's been a long time coming. And, um, I thought if, if those schoolgirls can understand that, then perhaps that's some insight into the sense of frustration that many people have. It really has been a long time coming. It's over 200 years that this country um, was first invaded and occupied by um, colonisers. And there's a lot of recognition that needs to occur. It's not just about saying sorry to the stolen generation. It's about saying sorry for the colonisation of this country, for so many things that have happened right the way to, to the most recent Northern Territory intervention. Yesterday we had the fantastic opening of Parliament with um, a long overdue welcome to country. Um, and, and that was really pleasing to see. We also had an, a tremendous gathering of people out the front of parliament um, who were talking about the negative impact that the Northern Territory intervention is having. And I think, I think that the history of black and white relations in this country um, are such that if we can learn one thing from it, it's that it doesn't work to impose things on Aboriginal Australians. And that's why we're here now with the parliament saying sorry for people may have been well-intentioned government policy, but look at the heartache it's created. And on the day when the Northern Territory intervention, when the former Prime Minister made the announcement about the Northern Territory intervention, I was in Rachel Seawitt's office, um, our Green Senator from Western Australia, with a group of women from the Northern Territory. They were in Canberra because they own the land where the former government wanted to put uh, nuclear waste dump sites in the Northern Territory. And one of those women turned, they, they would say so they were lobbying here about that issue, and it happened to be the day when um, former Prime Minister um, made the announcement about the Northern Territory intervention. And they said to me as I was leaving Rachel's office, they turned to me and said, I'm from the stolen generation. And it was a real look of, I've seen this before. And it just made me think, I don't want us to be here. I don't want us or political leaders to be here, decision makers in 10, 20, 15 years' time, saying sorry for well-meaning decisions being made now by the former government, supported by um, the, the Labor Party as well. People were tr trying to do things and feeling that they were doing the best interest of children, and yet that's what happened with the stolen generation. More damage was done. Now, if what is going on in the Northern Territory isn't done in cooperation with Indigenous Australians, the same thing will occur. When you impose things, it doesn't work. When you give Indigenous people the opportunity to drive their own future, to create their own opportunities, then that's what works. And there's so many positive examples of that. In New South Wales, I've visited schools in Aboriginal communities run entirely by Indigenous staff who do fantastic work in engendering in the young people a sense of cultural importance in the dance, the activities that they can be involved in. There are so many success stories. And those success stories, be they um, the snake condom program, for example, that's happening in parts of Victoria, that's Indigenous people running their own programs about the importance of safe sex. They, 
These are the programs that work and they're the programs we should be supporting. So we can't have a, an intervention which is exempt from the Race Discrimination Act, so it can be racist, imposed onto a group of people in the Northern Territory. It's got to be a cooperative action. And that's why I so support the demands of the protests that happened out the front of parliament yesterday about the Northern Territory intervention. We have to work together in order to achieve things. That's been the history and the legacy of um, so much of the black-white relations in this country. And if we're going to turn the new page, if we're going to start, then it's about working together. There's a whole lot of studies and research that people have done, and people in here know the figures about the disadvantage, about the 17-year gap in life expectancy, about the experiences of Indigenous Australians have had. Well, we need to look at that work that's been done, the Bringing Them Home report. We need to implement all of the recommendations, not just an apology, but fair and just compensation, reparations for Indigenous Australians. We need to go down the path of implementing all of those recommendations, reparations not just monetary sense, but also in a health, education and housing sense. We need to be holistic about the way in which we make reparations work as a whole so that as a country we can forge this new future that we all want to be a part of. There are so many things that, that need to be done in this area and um, recognising sovereignty, putting in place negotiations around a treaty, it, the land rights um, movement that has been so important for this country. We need to look at these issues again, ensure that they are done in a way that Indigenous Australians are leading the way. So there is so much that needs to be done, and, and this is just the first stage. And we need to see, as I said, all of those recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. There's also recommendations outstanding from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which also need to be implemented. And there are far too many Indigenous Australians in prisons right across this country. And we need to look at working with Indigenous communities to ensure that those people are given the opportunities that mean they can have a really positive um, life that allows them to contribute to our society rather than finding themselves in prison. So not only do we need to see those recommendations from the black deaths in custody um, occur, but we also need to be ensuring that we don't have such horrendous representation as we do um, currently of Indigenous communities in our prisons. So, so many of these things need to occur. And there are issues that Greens and other people in here have worked on for many years, um, but we need to continue to do all of this work. I just want to take a couple of moments um, to share with the Senate the story of a, a young woman. Um, she, I think she'd be 41 maybe this year, um, a woman by the name of Charmaine Clark. She ran uh, to be in the Senate um, for the Greens in the federal election of 1998 it was. I, I met her a couple of years beforehand. Um, Charmaine as I say, she's quite young, a couple of years older than me. Charmaine is a member of the Stolen Generation. When she was three, she was taken into care, along with four of her brothers and her sisters, by social workers when she was being looked after by an aunt while her mother and father were out looking for work. She ran away from that care to rejoin her mother when she was 14. And much of her family history is still missing. It's many years ago that Charmaine told me the story about her experiences and the experiences of the other members of her family. These, Charmaine's just one of many people um, who have had a hurtful experience because of the um, actions of the Australian government. And I hope that today's apology can be a part of the healing and the repair for them and for this country so that we can forge a bright future together and a future together is the most important part. Thank you, Senator Nettle. Senator Furavanti Wells. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today's apology is an acknowledgement of guilt which we will have far which will have far reaching implications for current and future generations both in Australia and internationally. It stems from the 1997 Bringing Them Home report, which found that nationally Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and communities between 1910 and 1970 to be placed in institutions, church missions, adopted or fostered where they were potentially at risk, that welfare officials failed in their duty to protect Indigenous wards from abuse, that under international law from approximately 1946 the policies of forcible removal amount to genocide 
and that from 1950 the continuation of distinct laws for Indigenous children was racially discriminatory. A key recommendation was that reparation include an acknowledgement of responsibility and apology for all Australian parliaments, police forces, churches and other non-government agencies which implemented policies of forcible removal. Guarantees against repetition, restitution and rehabilitation and most importantly monetary compensation. On 26 August 1999, then Prime Minister Howard moved a motion of reconciliation which reaffirmed commitment to the cause of reconciliation while acknowledging past mistreatment and expressing deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practices of past generations. Given the divergence of views in Australia, that motion struck a fair balance. A motion in similar terms went before the Senate. The primary justification for an apology is inextricably linked to the notion that a policy of genocide was deliberately instituted against our Indigenous community. As coalition senators noted in their dissenting report in the inquiry into the stolen generation, many Australians would not agree that there are direct parallels between the separated children experience and the sort of gross violations of human rights found elsewhere in the world, such as torture, genocide, slavery and executions. The apology follows that acknowledgement that children were removed forcibly. This critically satisfies those international conventions that a policy of genocide was enforced against our Indigenous population. Therefore, an apology will support a tide of claims for compensation, reinforced by an acceptance that human rights were breached. A flurry of legal activity will be driven by the principle stated in the report that states, breaches, that states breach their obligations when they fail to prevent human rights violations by others, as well as when human rights are violated by state action. In either event, the victims have a right to reparation under international conventions such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Let's understand the extent of potential claims. Recommendation 4 requires reparation be made not only to the individuals but others whose ties with them were affected by the removal, such as family members, descendants and their communities. The Senate inquiry into implementation of the report also advocated a reparation tribunal, a powerful precursor of what is likely to materialise. The advocacy for compensation remains strong and is driven by a diversity of stakeholders who say that a symbolic apology without compensation is meaningless. In recent memory, our nation has sought to expunge our psyche with notions of political correctness and divisive policies designed to overwhelm us with symbolism, but which fail to deliver tangible and practical solutions to complicated challenges. Any objections about an apology in no way negate the tremendous need to support support our Indigenous uh, population. The disparity between their living standards and their mortality rates is cause for great concern. Many remain destitute in a lifestyle surrounded by violence, addiction, poor health and low levels of education. A situation I saw growing up one block away from an Aboriginal community in the Illawarra. These challenges can only be addressed through practical responses such as Northern Territory intervention. My concerns about the motion are, one, it exposes the taxpayers to potential ambit claims of compensation, including under international law. Two, it solidifies an acknowledgement that a policy of genocide was deliberately instituted against our Indigenous population. Three, it leaves an indelible mark on our history by supporting the notion that Aboriginal children were stolen and thus imputing some criminal intent on the actions of good men and women whose actions were motivated by rescuing or saving children from appalling conditions. Four, it tarnishes our nation's reputation and imputes guilt on the current generation for alleged transgressions over past policies and practices. And it creates an in five, it creates an environment whereby generations of students will be inculcated through a curriculum that Australia once adopted a past practice of violation of human rights of Indigenous people. Remember that some very good men and women from churches and other organisations acted legally and with the best intentions to remove children from appalling conditions where they had been abandoned, abused or neglected, many of whom, though, who went on to make important and varied contributions. What about their children? 
What about the children and the grandchildren of these good men and women? How are we making them feel? Whilst many Australians may regret any injustices suffered under past practices, they do not believe that this constituted stealing for which this generation should say sorry. A vocal coterie of interests has effectively created a pressure cooker environment designed to stymie debate over an emotive issue stoked against our collective national interest. As Professor Winshuttle recently said, one thing, though, that this coterie has kept to themselves is that the major pieces of legislation underlying these past practices were all passed by Labor governments. As a lawyer with the Australian Government Solicitor for 15 of my 20 years in public sector employment, I saw instances of collective activism egged on by unscrupulous lawyers who had no intention, um, who had no intention encouraging no hesitation in encouraging plaintiffs to pursue spurious claims against the Commonwealth, knowing that, at the very least, go-away money, together with their costs, would be paid. Naturally, prospective plain plaintiffs may have legitimate common law rights to sue, such as Mr Trevorrow, who was awarded $525,000 for breach of duty of care by the South Australian Government. Such legitimate legal rights, of course, continue to exist. Should we go back into our history and consider reparation for other alleged injustices committed, however well-intentioned or well-founded? What about the many white children removed from appalling conditions for the same reasons of being abandoned, abused or neglected? Are they entitled to compensation for forced removal? What about those law-abiding migrants who suffered when interned during the war for no other reason than their nationality? Should they be compensated? Will we see emerging other groups who may legitimately argue that they too should be compensated for an alleged injustice? Should we now find these aggrieved people? Where do you draw the line? And more importantly, as Andrew Bolt recently stated in the Herald Sun, will the fear of liability for reparation mean that welfare officials of today are too scared to remove Indigenous children from dangers from which ordinarily children of any other race will be saved? On the other hand, will we see future claims for reparations where, with the best of intention, Indigenous children are today removed from circumstances of sexual abuse, neglect and other atrocious instances? It is incumbent on us to remain true to our convictions and maintain the cohesiveness of our nation by enacting initiatives designed to benefit all Australians. The motion omits compensation and reparation. It is illusory to think that an apology itself will be sufficient. Many will want compensation, and given the potential claimants, I believe reparations will run into billions of dollars. Rest assured that in the future we will be called upon to consider compensation legislation. Compensation calls by key figures in the debate is only the beginning of a sustained campaign. Some claim today's motion provides finality and closure, but many believe it is the beginning of the next phase where this and future generations will be made financially responsible for past and potentially current actions towards Indigenous Australia. There are very diverse views on an apology held by Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians ranging from strong support to outright opposition. I know that my concerns and reservations are shared by many Australians. For this reason, I left the chamber when the motion was carried on the voices, thereby abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Senator Ferrovanti. Well, Senator Moore. I don't always begin speeches in this place by acknowledging the tra traditional owners, though many people know that in most places I do. But I think today, in this discussion, it's a time when we can, because acknowledgement today is the focus of our discussion. The word sorry has been said. And it's been said a number of times here, and it has made a difference, and that's the important element. But the word that I want to use most in my short contribution is thank you. Thank you to the many Australians, Indigenous and not Indigenous, who have kept this issue on the agenda. From the time that the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission began their work on the, what then became the Bringing Them Home report, there was a raising of awareness across our community on these issues, on the issues of our history, of what really happened to Indigenous Australians who were caught up in a period of our history which we didn't tend to acknowledge. 
It also acknowledged what happened to people who were not Indigenous, people who were, as many speakers have acknowledged, doing things that they were accepted. However, through the Bringing Them Home report, and I know many people in this chamber and in the other place have read that report in detail, individual people had the courage and the support to tell their stories. And through that storytelling, an amazing awareness came across a large sector of our community. And out of that report came individuals who then took their stories wider. And through that process, through various reconciliation networks across our country, there was genuine engagement. And that engagement spread from school groups to pensioners groups, community areas, where there was time and space provided for people to share their stories. And that is the real value of the journey on which we are taking our own place today. We have an awareness now that was not accepted in the past. We cannot hide from what did occur, but we have an opportunity to move forward with this awareness by taking the step. Anyone who saw the candlelight display in front of Parliament House the other night and could see that statement, sorry, first step, indicates that the debate is not over. The discussions that were started through the Being Them Home report over 11 years ago, through working across all areas of Australia encouraging people to come forward, that will keep going. That's the strength that saying sorry today has given all of us, because we have acknowledged that the journey must continue. But by having sorry publicly stated, that communication given today, we have put one extra step into that infrastructure on which we can build. And that's why we're excited. That's why today is not the day to talk about all the other things that have to happen. This is not the day to actually set up contrasting divisions to be competing about who is more disadvantaged than whoever else. Today is the day, as we should together agree, to make the statement our Parliament House, our government, all Australians together, Indigenous and not Indigenous, making this statement but acknowledging that the journey continues. No one believes that there's going to be some magic effect today that everything is going to be better. Anyone who brings that argument into the debate is actually continuing to hide from the core issue. What we are doing together today is acknowledging the first step, acknowledging that there is so much more that has to be done. And one of the key elements of that forward action is keeping in history all the stories that were told through the Bringing Them Home, all the contributions that we have shared in this place and the other place today. We keep that together as a constant reminder of from where we have come, where we are today and where we must go into the future. So that is the hope. But when you actually mingle with the people who really are the owners of today, those people who had told their stories, who now have got the strength of support from their parliament, they have the strength now to help us move forward with them. That must be where we go from today. But I do urge people from across all parties to actually give the time and the space today for some celebration for some acknowledgement, and then we can continue, maybe in different ways, about what should and shouldn't happen in the future and what the legal implications are in the future. That debate will continue. It must. But today is the day to acknowledge the sorry statement. That recommendation from the Being Home report was not the only recommendation. It did not say that by making an apology that would be the end of the issue. What the Bringing Them Home report said was one element, one threshold element of our job was to make the apology, and we can do that. In fact, it has been done today, and we are in furious agreement that that was a good thing to happen. What we can now do is actually join with the people from Indigenous communities across the country, most importantly deal with the school kids who have had the opportunity today to watch what has been going on in this place, to regather the energy, because one of the things that often happens in this place is that something that is really important today, then its future life is on a bookshelf, in a library or pushed aside. 
That cannot be the legacy of our Sorry Statement. The legacy of the Sorry Statement must be the joint commitment to future action. And what we can achieve today is that future action will be able to be done in a more positive way, in a way that engages all of us and doesn't have this element of unfinished business. We've actually put together through the process in the lower house and in the Senate today in the agreed decision to make the statement, which has now become part of our government history, our parliament history and our community history, that we have acknowledged what went wrong in the past. We have said that we think that that was wrong and we as a parliament, as a government, have said sorry. That is the challenge for all of us. In terms of where we go next, I'm sure that there's going to be extreme discussion in various ways about what the next step should be. And when we, when we actually achieve those uh, commitments, when we look at what must happen, and when people have the opportunity to hear the contributions, read the contributions that have been made by various members of parliament and senators today, we'll be able to have a framework for where we move into, into the future. I am very, very glad that we have made this statement today. I think that the joy that has been expressed by people who were those that told their stories in the Bringing Them Home report, that joy alone must give us the, um, the courage to take the next steps and remember that there are next steps. We hope that today's activity will be commemorated in a permanent way in this building in our history so that the people who wander through parliament and see the ways that our government operates will be able to see this moment of time so that they will be able to learn about what has happened in the past and be able to share in whatever our community chooses to do in the future. The word sorry is important. The statement of sorry is important, but I think that what we need to do is understand that from tomorrow the words we should be looking at are action and also in terms of how we can work together. The reconciliation story circles that came out of the Bringing Them Home report engaged on that process. They had an engagement education phase, but they also had an action phase about what we do next. That is for the future debate. Today we can celebrate, we can acknowledge and we can share with the people to whom we owe as a community the apology. Sorry and thank you. Thank you, Senator Moore. Uh, Senator Joyce, I'd, I'd suggest in view of the fact that it's nearly two o'clock, I mean, it idea. might be wise to delay your contribution until later. Senator Bryan, or, sorry, Senator Faulkner. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the, Senate, uh, the sitting of the Senate be suspended until 2pm, if that would assist. Is that uh, motion agreed? Uh, those that appear say aye, against say no. The motion is carried. Thank you, Senator Faulkner. President, you can on strike or something, do you? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Good
Questions? Senator Minchin. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to Senator Evans, as the minister representing the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. President, Australia has a very strong record of working to ensure stability and security in East Timor. As such, events this week have disturbed everyone in this chamber. Uh, will the minister therefore update the Senate on the security situation in East Timor, given the assassination attempts on President Jose Ramos Horta and Prime Minister Guzmao, and the present condition of President Horta? I note that with bipartisan support the government has responded by deploying an additional company of ADF personnel and AFP officers to East Timor. Will the minister further outline to the Senate the role of our ADF personnel and AFP officers in ensuring a return to order and security in East Timor? Senator Evans. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Minchin uh, for the question. And I think I speak on behalf of the whole uh, Senate when I say uh, that uh, the events in East Timor over the last few days are, are very, very uh, uh, distressing. The attack on the democratic leadership of that country, the attempt to assassinate its two, uh, two most senior leaders is, I think, a, a very dark day for East Timor. And I think uh, uh, both uh, the Prime Minister Guzmo and uh, President Ramos Horta are good friends of Australia and not a, not a bit, lot of uh, senators in this chamber will know them personally and have worked with them over many years. Um, the Australian government is resolute in support of the people and the democratic elected government of East Timor at this time of challenge. Uh, the Prime Minister has indicated he will visit East Timor later this week to discuss the situation uh, with the East Timorese government and security forces. It's obviously important that uh, calm prevails in East Timor and to that end uh, the arrival of Australian police and defence force, uh, forces um, uh, should help, and I'll come back to that. Um, I understand uh, President uh, Ramos Horta remains in a serious uh, but stable condition, and uh, uh, senators would be aware that um, Mr Smith, the Foreign Minister, uh, travelled to Darwin on the 12th of February and conveyed the Australian government's support directly to family members, uh, family, family members of the president. Of the president. Um, on the 12th of February, the Australian Defence Force deployed a company to Timor-Leste as part of the government's response to the 11th of February attacks on Timor President Horta and Prime Minister Gazmo. The Army uh, continually maintains a company group ready to move at short notice on such contingencies. The status of this ready deployable company is rotated between uh, different formations and different uh, bases so that troops uh, can be rested. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, government is uh, is uh, prepared to do what it can to uh, support the uh, the East uh, East uh, Timorese government and uh, the various uh, contingents of defence and uh, and police personnel will assist in restoring uh, stability in that country and uh, I hope <coughs> see a return help see a return to normality and the progress of the, Australia, of the East Timorese democracy, which is obviously very important for the future of that country. East Timor is a good friend to Australia. We've got to be a good friend to them, and we're hopeful by this uh, support at this time that we can ensure the continuation of peace and democracy in East Timor. Supplementary question, Senator Minchin. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank the Minister for, answer, for his answer, and of course the opposition supports the government's actions to date. Um, but I note there are reports today that mention the criticisms from East Timor about the actions of the UN force immediately following the shooting of uh, President Horta. Uh, can the minister provide details on the actions of the UN force in the immediate aftermath uh, of the assassination attempt? Senator Evans. Look, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sen Sen Mr. President and Senator Minchin. I don't have uh, a detailed brief on what the actions of the UN force were immediately following the, uh, uh, the attack on the elected leaders of East Timor. Um, I, uh, I am happy to get that for you as soon as possible. So uh, I'll take that part of your question on notice, Senator Minchin, and ensure as soon as possible that the, uh, the <coughs> detail is, is provided to the Senate. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister in this chamber, the leader of the government in the Senate, in the Senate Senator Evans. Minister, or Mr President, in light of the Reserve Bank's latest warning about inflationary pressures 
and the challenging conditions of the global economy, can the minister inform the Senate what action the government is taking to address the challenge of inflation? Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Bishop for his question and acknowledge his long interest in uh, economic uh, matters. <laughs> Mr. President, while we face economic challenges, the government is optimistic about the future of the Australian economy. Mm, Unemployment is low, and we're enjoying our 17th year of growth. Now, the RBA's latest quarterly statement, however, highlights that inflationary pressures are the main risk to the domestic economy. It is public enemy number one. And I'd encourage all senators to have a look at the RBA report. Its, uh, its statement revises the inflation forecast upwards. Underlying inflation is forecast to remain above the target band until the end of 2009. And while the Australian economy is in fundamentally good shape, we are well aware that it faces two conflicting currents, increasing uncertainty about the global outlook and the challenge of, of domestic inflation. <coughs> Now, the severe downturn in the U.S. housing market and associated fi financial market volatility poses significant challenges for global growth and the Australian economy. Recent movements in the Australian financial market show we are not immune from turbulence in the United States. The RBA noted that the likely period of weak growth in the U.S. economy will be accompanied by slowing of other major developed economies. We're confident Australia can withstand the fallout from international volatility arising principally from the fallout of the US subprime crisis, though we are not immune. However, all the advice the government is receiving is that Australia is well placed to withstand that. The growth of the Asian economies, combined with the fast growth of emerging economies, is compensating for the fallout in other areas. Strong demand for our resources is expected to remain high and to sustain uh, commodity prices. But the complacency of the opposition while in government to build our capacity has left the economy ill-equipped to deal with this inflationary problem. In fact, the Reserve Bank repeatedly warned, Order. repeatedly warned the Howard Order. Costello government Order. of the need to address skill shortages. Time and time Order. again, the RBA, the, the Reserve Bank warned the then government about the skill shortages, the lack of capacity, and the infrastructure constraints in our economy. And what do they do about it? Nothing. They spent like drunken sailors, Order. but they ignored Order. the warnings of the Senator RBA. Evans. Senator Evans, so resume your seat. The Senate will come to order, and then we'll continue. Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. So each warning from the RBA was, RBA was ignored, and so the inflationary pressures, pressures have slowly increased to produce the highest rate of inflation in 16 years. Highest rate of inflation in 16 years. That's the Howard Costello. Howard Costello legacy. Inflation is our most depressing domestic challenge. It hurts working families and businesses, eats away at savings and threatens our national prosperity and puts pressure on interest rates. The December CPI data released in January showed underlying inflation at 3.6 per cent, the highest rate for 16 years. Figures like that steal the government's determination to win the war on inflation. This government will not sit back and watch inflationary pressures rise until it overflows. Now, look, we didn't create this problem, but we do take responsibility for it. We did do take responsibility for it. Well, if the opposition think inflation pressures started uh, on November the 24th, I'd be very surprised. The Prime Minister is implementing a five-point plan to fight that inflation legacy. We will, we will tackle it head-on, and, and, and the opposition may want to deny it. But well, that is the greatest challenge facing our economy. It does have to be tackled. We have a, fan, a plan to fight inflation. We will take it seriously, because unless it's tackled, Australian families will suffer. Senator Abetz. Now, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Innovation, Industry, Science and Research, Senator Carr. I refer the, uh, to the Minister's proposal to set up an inquiry into Australia's automotive industry. Can the Minister rule out appointing former Labor Premier Steve Brax to head the inquiry, and can he rule out paying Mr Brax $2,000 a day to conduct the inquiry? Order. 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 Order on my left. 
Senator Carr. I thank uh, the uh, Shadow Minister for his question, and I look forward to uh, dealing with him on a number of these issues for some years to come. The uh, point that he has asked me relate to a review of the automotive industry is one that we are publicly uh, committed to and have stated on numerous occasions that we will establish a review into the whole industry, the sustainability of the whole industry. We have indicated last year that a review would be established which would go beyond, would go beyond the, the statutory review required under the ACES legislation. Which, and in terms of the, uh, the review, it would look at all aspects affecting the competitiveness of the industry. This is a review that is long overdue. The fact of the matter is this. There have been 7,000 jobs lost in this industry over the uh, 7,000 jobs lost in this industry through, since 2002. This is an industry that is facing acute challenges. But what we have seen from the previous government was a government that was essentially on automatic pilot. Because despite the fact that the fundamental, the fundamental premises that underpin the uh, structural programs, the assistance programs, had changed dramatically. This government, the previous government, chose not to, chose not to change the policy settings. What you had was a government that essentially thought that manufacturing industry in this country should be put on palliative care, and took the view that an industry, despite the fact, despite the fact that it employed over 60,000 Australians, was strategically vital to a wide-ranging number of industries, from the ICT sector right through to aluminium, to plastics, to textiles, to every component of the manufacturing sector. The previous government chose to sit on its hands as these challenges grew. We are about, we are about to announce the details of the review. We are about to announce, we are about to announce the personnel associated with that review. But what I would advise the shadow minister is that unlike, unlike the reviews that you undertook into the Bureau of Meteorology, where the sorts of figures that you have used were in fact paid to the reviewers, the figures that you have quoted are wrong. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Supplementary Order. question. Yes, Senator Betts. In that case, how much will Mr Brax be paid per day, seeing that that was not denied that he was going to be appointed? Will he share with the Australian people how much Mr Brax will be paid? If Mr Brax is to be appointed, is that not a breach of the Prime Minister's promise not to appoint uh, boys to jobs, labour boys to jobs, jobs for the boys? And more importantly, did his department not advise him that the inquiry should be undertaken by the Productivity Commission? Ah. Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr President. I uh, indicate to the Shadow Minister that perhaps he should go back to his sources and check his facts. And one of the great joys of opposition is that you often are advised of things which are incorrect. And if you're stupid enough to repeat them in here, all the best to you. Order. 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 Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the Minister update the Senate on any recent improvements to broadband services in Australia? And can the Minister outline why a national broadband network is still necessary? Order. 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 Senator Conroy, wait till you're, Senator Conroy, wait till you're called, please. Order. Senator Conroy. Thank you. Ensuring the Australian population has access to fast and affordable broadband is a key priority for the Rudd Labor government. We are keen to work with the telecommunications industry to ensure Australians have access to the best available broadband. When Telstra approached my office last year, 
after the election, ensure, seeking regulatory certainty in regard to fixed line broadband services, I was quick. I was quick to act and overcome the stalemate, the stalemate that had arisen between the former government and Telstra. As regulatory certainty is rightly a matter for the ACCC, I sought their advice. The chairman of the ACCC, Mr Samuel, brought to my attention a number of very consistent public statements relating to the regulation of wholesale access to ADSL services. I then wrote to Telstra and informed them of my position. In particular, I noted in agreement with the ACCC that I believe there is a high degree of regulatory certainty in relation to the ACCC's approach to wholesale ADSL 2 plus services. A high degree of certainty. The letter that I wrote to Telstra is publicly available for all to see on my department's website. I was pleased that the government was able to provide assurance to Telstra in regard to regulation. As a result, Telstra announced on February the 6th, on February the 6th that they would switch on high-speed ADSL 2 plus broadband in 900. That's right. 900 telephone exchanges servicing almost two and a half million, two and a half million homes. Telstra has already made ADSL 2 Plus available from 370, 370 telephone exchanges in the past week. In the past week, 370 telephone exchanges serving approximately 1.8 million households. That's right, 1.8 million households. Within the next two weeks, within the next two weeks, 132 exchanges serving over 230,000 households will start providing ADSL2+. That's right. Over the next 200 days, Telstra will install ADSL2 Plus in a further 405 exchanges across Australia, covering another 330,000 households. 330,000 households. As a result of the decision, download speeds of up to up to 20 megabits per second will now be available in more cities and towns across the country. And I noted with great interest that the former Minister for Communications, Senator Coonan, has claimed that she offered Telstra a letter of comfort. This is despite the fact, despite the fact that Telstra's general counsel, Will Irving, has denied this was the case, stating she never signed any letter, she never sent any letter, and that she's again just living in a bit of a world of her own, to be honest. Now, as I said before, as I said before, the Rudd Labor government will drag, drag Australia out of the digital dark ages, reforming the telecommunications sector for the benefit of all Australians. Order. order. Senator Brandis. Sorry, point of order, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I wonder if the minister could please be asked to table the laptop from which he was reading his ministerial <laughs> statement. That is, that is order. 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 There. Order. Order. There is no point of order. Senator Brandis. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Does the minister recall that in his speech on the occasion of the opening of the parliament yesterday, the Governor-General made a commitment on behalf of the new government that laws relating to government information will be enhanced by promoting a culture of disclosure and transparency? Can the minister explain how the Prime Minister's refusal to release legal advice obtained by the government 
concerning the potential liability of the Commonwealth to compensate members of the stolen generation fits in with this new culture of disclosure and transparency. Will the government now release the suppressed legal advice? If not, why not? Senator Evans. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Brandis uh, uh, for the uh, question. Um, this government is committed to much more accountability in government. I think uh, the Australian public will notice a marked difference in style in terms of accountability uh, to the previous government. And we are committed to improving, improving accountability. Senator Brandis's question goes directly to the question of legal advice. And I'm sure I've been lectured by Senator Brandis in the past in this chamber, along with a lot of other former ministers on that side of the chamber, how impossible it is to release legal advice because it is confidential legal advice to the government. It is quite different, a quite different uh, circumstance to, uh, to being open and accountable in terms of government decisions. The government has made it very clear that we think the apology uh, does not require us also to offer compensation. The government will not be offering compensation to the stolen generation and has committed, in addition to the apology, to redoubling efforts to provide practical measures to assist Indigenous people through health, education and other measures. And I hope we enjoy the support of the whole chamber in pursuing those. But the question of legal advice remains uh, uh, the same as it did under the previous government. The confidential legal advice to the government is not released publicly. Uh, uh, Senator Brandis, who I understand is a, uh, they're not Queen's Council anymore, they, what are they now? SC. SC, as an SC, would know that far better than I, and I'm in, I, I am quite surprised that he, that he asked such a question. Order, order, supplementary question. Se Senator Brandis. I'm sure, um, through you Mr President, I'm sure Senator Evans is also well aware that the confidentiality of legal advice can freely be waived by the client or the recipient. Yeah. Given that the government has that right, how does the minister consider that suppressing advice on the rights of Indigenous people advances either the culture, the culture of transparency and disclosure or the process of reconciliation? Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, there is no question of suppressing information, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether Senator Brandis is now arguing uh, for compensation for Indigenous people, given that he had to be uh, dragged kicking and, kicking and screaming merely, merely to uh, make the apology, let alone compensation. And I'm sure I saw Mr Abbott on the television last night saying the coalition wouldn't entertain the prospect of compensation. But there has been no suppression of information. What we have indicated is that we have legal advice that compensation is not, uh, is not payable as a result of the apology. We've made that public and consistent with the previous government's, consistent with the previous government's policy. We're not releasing that advice. Senator. Order. Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education. And I refer to the Prime Minister's promise today to see that every Indigenous four year old in a remote Aboriginal community attends preschool. And I ask, will the government ensure that these preschools are bilingual? Will it also insist that secondary schooling is made available where, primary, uh, where currently only primary schools exist? And what measures will the government put in place to see that teachers are better equipped for Indigenous education in remote areas? And what will your government do to increase the number of Indigenous teachers? Senator Carr. I thank the uh, senator for her question. And, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the commitments, the the, the, the uh, uh, what, what I'll say, Order. What I, I, thank, I thank the uh, senator Order. for the question. Order. 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 Members on my left will come to order. Senator Carr. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the senator for her question, and as you can tell, we're having some difficulties locating the, the formal brief on this. But, and so I will make sure that the. The minister that I'm representing here um, has an opportunity to view the question and see whether or not there are other matters she wants to raise. But in the context, I will say this. I will say this. 
This is a government that is committed to ensuring that the, there is genuine equality of opportunity in our education system. This is a government that has set itself very stiff targets to meet. This is a government that understands the importance of education, particularly for Indigenous people. This is a government that has acknowledged, has acknowledged our obligation to not only make an apology for the past wrongs that have been committed against Indigenous people, but also has made a commitment to ensure that we bridge the gap in terms of educational opportunities that do exist in this country. This is a government, unlike our predecessors, that is actually serious about changing life's opportunities for Indigenous people in this country. What we have also we have undone is to make sure that these targets are realistic and will be met. I just note, I just note that in all the educational reports over the last five or six years, in terms of educational attainment, the key indicators in terms of socio-economic equity and in Indigenous education, we saw a decline. We saw a decline. Now the previous government ought to hang their heads in shame at what happened in terms of their quality of opportunity in this country across the full range, the full range of, of socio and economic indicators in terms of educational attainment. Order. Order. Senator Allison, supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Allison wishes to ask a supplementary question. Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do have a supplementary question. In fact, I have a number of them. And uh, I ask the minister: Does he also consider that state governments responsible for some of this mess should hang their heads in shame? But before getting to that, um, can I uh, ask the minister to request information from the minister? to do with the presence of local Indigenous preschool workers. Is, it, is the government aware that they significantly increase attendance? Is the government aware that preschools serving 70 per cent of Indigenous children do not have a local Indigenous preschool worker? And will the government uh, promise to fix this problem as well? Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I can indicate to the senator that this government understands just how complex the issues of early childhood education are. We understand that in terms of the Commonwealth's interface with state governments on this issue, there are fundamental difficulties in even getting to talk to the one department across this country. This is a government that also appreciates the need for us to attend to these questions. Now, there is no doubt, there is no doubt in terms of the performance in early childhood education is one of the areas of great weakness in our education system across this country. And I know I've been on delegations with Senator Allison in which we have been to various communities and seen just how deplorable conditions are, and particularly in terms of early childhood provision. I have seen circumstances personally where very young students, four years of age, are clearly indicating all the health deficits that so undermine, so undermine the capacity to achieve educational Order, Senator Carr, outcomes. The time for answering the question has expired. Senator Scullion. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to Senator Evans, representing the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. The government has stated uh, that it is committed to consulting widely over the initiatives in place in part, as part of the intervention in the Northern Territory. Can the minister please advise the Senate why the government has chosen to ignore the advice of the first ever Indigenous Labor Party President Warren Mundine by reintroducing the permit system in the Northern Territory? Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I uh, thank, uh, thank Senator Scullion for his question. And in doing so, uh, I apologise for not recognising his uh, election to the leadership of the National Party the other day when we, uh, when we dealt with such matters. Uh, I congratulate him on his, uh, on his, uh, on his appointment. But I, it always, uh, I never quite understand how one can be a leader of the party one doesn't belong to, but, uh, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> it might say something about the rest of the party, but I won't go there. Look, um, Mr. Mr President, um, when the, uh, when the former government introduced its uh, intervention into the Northern Territory legislation, uh, the, the former government received the support of the Labor Party in that regard. 
and we gave bipartisan support to the emergency intervention in the Northern Territory because we did accept there was a crisis, uh, that we did see that there was widespread uh, child abuse and those, ta those issues needed to be tackled. But during the debate on the bills, the Labor Party raised a number of issues where we diverged with the government, where we urged uh, the then government to uh, take a different stance. And one of those was on the question of the permits. And you, uh, Senator Scullion will recall that he and I were involved in that debate at the time. And the Labor Party has taken the view that the permit system is an important part of protecting those communities from exploitation from outside uh, forces. And uh, I think at the time there was support from a very senior Northern Territory uh, police spokesman for the fact that they wanted to be able to control who went into those uh, very vulnerable communities. And uh, we've accepted the argument, the Rudd Labor government have accepted the argument that the permits play a useful part of an overall protection system to ensure greater law and order and stability and protection in those communities. Now I know there's a divergence across the chamber about that. We've had that debate a number of times, uh, but the Labor Party and the Labor government are committed to uh, reinstituting uh, a, a permit system uh, which, uh, which has, uh, which has um, the capacity to allow those communities to have some say over who comes into those communities. And as Senator Scullion would be well aware, there have been a, a la large number of incidents over the years where, where uh, inappropriate and, uh, and uh, people of uh, disrepute have sought to access and exploit those communities and take advantage of those people in those communities. Now, uh, Mr Mundine uh, and I worked very closely together when I had the Indigenous Affairs portfolio. I have a lot of respect for Mr Mundine, and he understands, I think, the complexities of the issues and makes a, a very good contribution to, uh, to the Indigenous Affairs debate in this country. But the Labor Party policy was when we were in opposition to support the permit system, and it will remain so in government. Supplementary question, Senator Scullion. Uh, I, I thank the minister for confirming that they've taken the word of a, uh, a police officer heading up the Police Federation in the Northern Territory over a senior Indigenous leader. And I just wonder if the minister could then confirm, in fact, is this the very first step in the systematic dismantling of the intervention in the Northern Territory? Senator Evans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think the import of uh, Senator Scullion's uh, supplementary was that. He urges everyone to take the advice of a former president of the Labor Party over police figures in the Northern Territory, um, which I find an unusual stance for a, uh, for a uh, member of the uh, coalition. But nevertheless, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we do uh, maintain the view. We do maintain the view that uh, that uh, the permit system serves a useful purpose and that it will be a contributor to the uh, overall objectives of the Northern Territory intervention, which we supported immediately, gave bipartisan support to immediately, that Prime Minister Rudd committed to at the time uh, the then Prime Minister John Howard announced that intervention. We remain committed to that intervention, but we do do something slightly different, Senator Scullion. The government has changed. We have a different approach to you. The majority of the measures will be maintained, but in terms of the uh, permits, in terms of the CDP, there are a number of, uh, of issues on which Senator we have a different Evans, approach. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Human Services, Senator Ludwig. Can the minister confirm that the government is implementing its Savings for Labor's Better Priorities policy as it affects the proposed access card? Will the minister inform the Senate how cost savings achieved by not proceeding with the access card will ease the pressure on interest rates? Senator Ludwig. Senator Ludwig. I thank uh, Senator Polly for that excellent question. Mr President, I can confirm that the, that the government has terminated the Liberals' much flawed, much flawed access card. Labor has had long concerns about the access card and, in particular, concerns about the protection of privacy and those matters that went with it. The Liberals claimed that it was not a national identity card, yet it bore all the hallmarks of one. It, bore, it was to have a photo, it was even to have a signature, and it was vaunted to even include biometrics. It was not compulsory, as they said, to have the access card, yet one would have to actually 
have the access card to be able to access services such as that provided by Medicare and Centrelink. It was, in actual fact, an ID card by stealth, and the opposition knows that and they should fess up to it. It was one of those products of an opposition that was focused only on the card and not the outcome. In opposition, we were also concerned that the Liberals had underestimated the cost and overestimated, that is, overestimated the potential savings of the project. The KPMG report on which it was based estimated potential savings of $1.6 billion to $3 billion over 10 years, compared with the costs of at least $1.3 billion. The legislation, of course, governing the access card regime was already delayed once by the previous uh, Minister, Senator Ellison, demonstrating the likelihood of further blowouts in both time and money. This was a matter, of course, if you look at Senator Ellison's uh, history in this, it's not surprising that an IT project of this size he then put the brakes on and, in fact, started to backpedal quickly. His last, I, his last IT project, the customs debacle, which blew out, which blew out from 30 million to in excess of 400 million, and almost brought our wolves to a standstill. Almost brought our wolves to a standstill. So this is what the government, this is what the government is, will do. We will ensure, we will ensure that that money will be returned to savings for Labor's better priorities policy, rather than be squandered as it was going to be by the opposition. That's why I'll return almost $1.2 billion to the budget for the Australian taxpayers. I might note that the savings under the Charter of Budget Honesty were estimated at $1.149 million. I'm proud to be able to say that my department has identified an additional $29 million in savings for the 2007 2008, bringing the total to $1.78 million. These savings amount to a significant reduction in public demand, which will help put downward pressure on inflation and then downward pressure on interest rates. It's the financially responsible thing to do. It's the responsible, it's the fiscally conservative thing to undertake. Some of the money will also, some of the money will also ensure that the Rudd Labor government's policies on the education revolution to improve services in public hospitals, what the opposition, when they are in government, did not do. Instead, the Rudd Labor government will ensure those priorities are met, that the education revolution will proceed. We are focused on the practical things that will make a real, a real difference, like online services, the coordination between agencies, and data matching and data sharing. That's what the Rudd Labor government will focus Order. on, rather than a card. Order, Senator Ludwig. Your time has expired. Senator Barnett. President, my question is uh, also to the Minister for Human Services, Senator Ludwig. Uh, I refer to the failure of the Rudd Labor government, and in particular the federal member for Bass, uh, Jody Campbell, uh, to honour their pre-election support for the coalition's promise to expand Launceston Centrelink call centre thereby leaving 150 northern Tasmanians without jobs. Does the minister agree with the assessment of the Labor Premier for Tasmania, who said in a media release yesterday that I have with me today, he said, uh, he said in his statement that this is a bitter pill, quote unquote, and that the Rudd Labor government is taking northern Tasmanians for granted? Or does, or does the minister agree with the assessment of the former federal Labor member for Bass, now state member for Bass, Tasmanian Minister for the Environment and the Arts, Michelle O'Byrne, who also backs the coalition promise and who said these decisions are not about money but people's lives and the ability to live, work and raise families? The blame game is back. Order. Order. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the uh, senator for their question. It is well worth the opportunity of putting the record straight from the from the position that's been put around by the opposition in respect of the call centre. The expansion of call centres in Coffs Harbour, Hobart, and Launceston were promises made by the Liberal Party during the 2007 election year. It was a matter that was made by the Prime Minister at the time. But the Prime Minister made that commitment 
without any funds tied to it. No the funds. Liberals know that. No the funds. Liberals know that that the promise was made to these communities. It was not worth the paper it was written on. With no funds. When Mr John Howard announced these promises, he did not provide any funding. The Liberals' promises they were expected to be absorbed, absorbed at the time by Centrelink as an operational cost. But the Liberal Party knows, the Liberal Party knows that Centrelink's funding goes up and down depending on the total number of clients because that was the model that they used in government. What that meant was that their promise at the time by the Prime Minister was reckless and unsustainable. It was an unfunded at the time and the people of Launceston went to vote on the federal election with an unsustainable and unfunded promise. And now the Liberals have leapt upon the disappointment of the families in Launceston and tried to turn it to their political advantage. That is shameful. You are playing politics with people's lives and you should cease and desist. Order. 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 Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Centrelink said in its press release yesterday the general manager, Hank Georgian, today announced Centrelink's decision regarding the proposed expansion of its Launceston, Hobart and Coffs Harbour call centres. This is what he said. Like any business, Centrelink needs to respond to changes in its environment to provide a good return to taxpayers' investment. Our primary source of government funding comes from, as the Liberals know, from delivering USART and other workforce aid payments to customers as this group requires more intensive one-on-one -on -one support from staff. However, this also means that while the economy is strong and unemployment levels are low, Centrelink receives a commensurately lower level of funding to deliver its services. As a result, we have unfortunately had to withdraw our plan to recruit additional staff at our, La at our Launceston call centre. That is what the Centrelink press release said yesterday. Our budgetary situation also means that we can't proceed with our planned expansion of our Coffs Harbour and Hobart call centres, although existing staff will relocate to new offices as planned later this year. I want to stress that this is a business decision based on a number of factors. It is not something Centrelink has done lightly. We have only come to the conclusion after exploring every available option. That is the, that's the position we have come to. As the recruitment process for Launceston was already underway, we do understand that the decision may be disappointing and upsetting to applicants. We do understand that. We also understand that it may be upsetting to the Tasmanian government. But they should also be clearly where the blame lies in the respect of this. And of course, it is not the case that we would blame anybody. You need to then provide the facts of the circumstance. The facts are clear. The facts are very clear in this. The funding model upon which the opposition sat around their cabinet table on and agreed to meant that Centrelink's funding would be adjusted according to the unemployment rate. So what that meant was the Centrelink funding then would, with Order. employment growth strong, Order, Minister, would go down. Order, Minister. Your time has expired. Supplementary question, Thank Senator you, Mr. Barnett. President. Is the minister aware that the town Launceston is pronounced Launceston? Uh, secondly, if, uh, if, if this decision by Mr. the former Order. Prime Minister, if Order. Mr. President, Order, 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 to resume Mr. your seat. Yeah. Point of order, Senator Ludwig. Well, there is no, there is no question there. Uh, there, there is no, no point, question. There is no point of order either, because uh, Senator Barnett was just commencing his supplementary question. Senator Barnett. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if the decision by the former Prime Minister, Mr. Howard, on the 13th of July last year was reckless and unsustainable, why was it? Why was it supported by the federal Labor senators and state Labor uh, members of parliament at the time? Se secondly, is the minister aware of the statement by Mr Lennon yesterday, the Premier of Tasmania, where he said that the, the, the decision was especially harsh given that federal Labor gave every appearance of supporting the Centrelink, Centrelink jobs when announced by John Howard well before caretaker conventions were triggered in July? 
further, is the Minister aware of a media release of his own colleague, Minister for Finance and Deregulation, Lindsay Tenner, where it refers to the savings that would be made and a reversal Order. of Senator measure Barnett. sent to link further Order. calls Senator to Barnett, you must resume your seat. Your time has expired for asking the supplementary question. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It seems that he's packed more into the uh, supplementary question than into the question itself. But in respect of the three matters, well, firstly, he needs to check his facts, Mr. President, because his facts might actually expose the misinformation that he's putting about. What I can say in respect of the third matter that he did raise, in respect of the Maifo, October 2007, I could draw, I could draw the opposition to the Appendix A policy decision taken since the 2007 and 2008 budget, where the $5 million was provided for. And this is what it said, not what your media release said, Senator Bardet. Mr President. It said the government will provide an additional $5 million in 2007 08 to ensure Centrelink is able to better meet peaks in demand arising from clients making increased use of call centres and a trend towards longer and more complex calls. Funding under this measure will, provide, will be provided through, provided through policy departments for call Order, centre Senator services Ludwig, to be delivered by Centrelink. Order. It is, it Order. Is Resume your seat. Order. Your time for Point, point of order. The point of order is that the minister referred to my media release. I referred to the minister of uh, Lindsay Tanner's media release, and I tabled the media release to clarify any concerns. It's the media release of the 6th of February. I remind you, February. Senator Barnett, that you need leave to table. I seek leave is, is to leave table granted? Lin Sorry? minister's oh. media release. Order. Is leave granted? Oh, he said yes. Well, Senator Evans has said yes. Senator. Order, order. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change, uh, Penny Wong. Given that the European Union policy responses to climate change are underpinned by the agreement, their agreement, that global temperature rise of more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, 1750 will cause dangerous climate change and unacceptable risk to this and future generations. Has the Rudd government decided what degree of global warming poses an unacceptable risk to this nation and to the planet? If so, what is it? If not, has it uh, asked Professor Garno to provide a specific answer to that question? Following on from that, will the government move immediately to reduce emissions by ending the Howard government's tariff arrangements that favour imported four-wheel drive vehicles and Hummers by giving them half the uh, tax rate for imports that apply to um, climate-sensitive and saving hybrid cars. Order, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Brown for the question and for the interest that he shows on the issue of climate change. Uh, an interest that, unfortunately, those opposite whilst in government seem to not have for far too long. And we will look back at the history of the Howard government as a time when we could have dealt with, could have dealt with as a nation, the issue of climate change, and we failed to do so. In relation to the specific issues raised by the honourable senator, first was the issue of what degree of global warming. Now, can I, can I uh, indicate our position on this very clearly? Uh, unlike those, those opposite. Uh, we do not quibble with the science in this area, and we recognise that scientists around the world have been warning governments of various political persuasions about the need to put in policies, to put in place policies and measures to tackle climate change. That is why we went to the election with a policy to tackle climate change, but we will do so, Senator Brown, methodically and responsibly. Uh, we went to the election with a commitment to the. With the <laughs> We went to the election with a commitment to put in place an emissions trading scheme, uh, and I've already outlined uh, in another, uh, on another occasion the parameters that we propose for the design of that scheme. Uh, on the issue of medium-term targets, which is really, I think, at the heart of the first part of Senator Brown's question, as I indicated in Bali and have subsequently indicated on a number of occasions, this government will not set a medium-term target until we have fully and carefully considered 
Well, point of order, Senator Brown. Yeah, my question was not about medium-term targets. It was about acceptable uh, uh, temperature level rise for the planet, which would pose a dangerous danger to this and future generations. So it's a specific temperature rise question. Two degrees, the European Union says, and scientists say. Does the government accept that, or has it got in train? So, what's your a, point a, of order, Senator Brown? I'm, I'm just helping the minister to no, ensure she, she answers the answer. question. I want to know what your point of order is. Yeah, it's a um, the order, 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 order on my left. There is no point of order, and the minister may answer the question, your original question, the manner she chooses, provided she's being relevant. And I believe she was being relevant. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, I'm happy to uh, respond directly to that um, point of order. Uh, as, Senator Brown, I would, as Senator Brown would, I hope, be aware, uh, the European Union discussion is in fact the justification for their mid-term target proposal. Uh, that is the basis on which they arrive at the mid-term target proposal. Uh, clearly, there are a range of projections about what the climate change uh, parameters that we currently have could do in terms of future temperature rise. The IPCC report, which I assume uh, Senator Brown is aware of, uh, does set out a range of projections, uh, and they are the best efforts that scientists around the world have come to in terms of the impact of current emission levels, of future temperature rise, and of different trajectories of emissions uh, might have on, on future temperature rise. Uh, let's be clear, this government absolutely recognises the need to tackle da dangerous climate change. Uh, all, all in this chamber know this was a significant issue at the last election. I would hope, notwithstanding the differences between the government and Senator Brown on a range of issues, he would at least not acknowledge that the very first act, the very first act of the Rudd Labor government was the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. The very first fact of the Rudd Labor government was the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. Something those opposite failed to do, failed to do despite being party to the agreement and quibbling for years and years and years about whether they should ratify. So our commitment to tackling this, this global challenge is clear. We recognise it is a global challenge. It must be tackled globally. Domestically, we will implement our policy agenda, but I will very, make it very clear to Senator Brown we will do so responsibly and carefully and methodically on the basis and on the basis of inputs such as Treasury modelling and, uh, and uh, Mr. Gar Professor Garneau's report. Supplementary, Senator Thank Brown. You, uh, uh, President, you will have heard that the minister totally failed to answer my question about the two degrees being the acceptable or unacceptable level of climate change, and then about the uh, tax impost put on to hybrid cars as against Humvees and four-wheel drives. Today, the uh, City of London has imposed a $53 tax on all polluting vehicles, heavily polluting vehicles in central London in a bid to halt the slide to catastrophic climate change. I ask, will the Australian government set a lead here by reviewing the list of cars available to members of parliament so that gas guzzlers are taken off that list, and by uh, reformulating the, the priority so that new government fleet cars include hybrids and fuel-efficient vehicles only? Order. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, on two issues which were raised, or three issues. First, again, the two-degree issue. Uh, Senator, Brown, Senator Brown, I would have thought would understand that the usual way in which these issues are discussed, certainly in the context of international agreements, is uh, in the terms of the emissions reductions targets which nations agree to. Uh, this government has already committed to a 60 per cent reduction on 2000 levels by 2050, and as I have repeatedly said, we will set a mid-term target, but we will do so after receiving the appropriate evidence. On the issue of uh, the taxation issue to do with cars, I should refer uh, Senator Brown to the responsible minister, which I assume might be Senator Carr or possibly the Treasurer. Uh, and on the third issue, uh, I do refer uh, Senator, Senator um, Brown to the, the, the uh, policy with which we went to the election, which was to leverage investment in a green car industry here in Australia. Senator Ian Macdonald. Uh, Mr. President, my question is also to the uh, Minister for Climate Change and Water. Did the minister have any input into the so-called razor gang cuts announced by Mr Tanner last week? Um, 
Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, as the uh, Chamber will be aware, there were a range of savings measures which the government announced uh, recently, and uh, we did so because we are a government that is conscious of the need for fiscal restraint. Uh, as the Leader of the Government in the Senate has previously outlined in answer to an earlier question, uh, as the Australian people know, uh, what we uh, have been bequeathed and what they have been bequeathed by those opposite is, of course, the inflation genie. And what are the ways in which we have to respond? What are the ways in which we have to respond is to ensure that we exercise appropriate fiscal restraint. In relation order, to order, the Senator Wong, order, resume your seat. Point of order, Senator Macdonald. The question was very, very simple. Did the minister have any input into the raise again cuts? Um, can I say that the minister is only 40 seconds into her answer, and she may be developing an answer, and I will give her a chance to, uh, to elaborate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in relation to the specific measures. Uh, which were the subject, and I assume this is where Senator Macdonald got his information, was from an article in the newspaper. I don't assume it was from any other, any other independent research. But I do want to just make this point. Firstly, in relation to the Asia Pacific Network for Energy Technology, I do want to make it clear that is in Minister Ferguson's portfolio. Uh, that it, the indication is there that the Department of Resources, Energy and Tourism will be funding those measures out of its existing budget measures. In other words, uh, they dread will continue to source funds internally uh, to, to work uh, on the implementation of the Asia-Pacific Network for Energy Technology. I also refer to the Future Gen Alliance membership, which was another one that the savings measures alluded to by Senator Macdonald in, his, in the context of his question. Uh, I do want to advise Senator Macdonald Order. that the United Senator Wong, States— Senator Wong, resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. I won't be verbal. I didn't allude to anything. I simply asked the minister whether she had any input into the actions by Mr Tanner in announcing those uh, cuts by the so-called razor gang. I haven't alluded to anything, and I asked the minister uh, not to verbal me. Senator Macdonald, it's not a point of order. Uh, S Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, I apologise to Senator Macdonald if uh, the fact that I'm referring to savings, which he actually talks about in his question, is something I shouldn't be responding to. But I propose to respond to that because these are important issues. Uh, he clearly, he, he wants me to deal with the savings measures to which he's referred to. So, in relation to the Future Gen Alliance, which is another measure uh, which was the subject of the savings decision, uh, I should advise the Chamber that that will now be funded from the government's $500 million clean coal fund. Uh, in relation to the Asia Pacific Forestry Skills and Capacity Building Program, which is in Minister Burke's uh, portfolio, uh, we will now fund that from uh, uh, $200 million in relation to the International Forest Carbon Initiative. So there are ways in which we are seeking to ensure, seeking to ensure that the government continues to deliver important climate change programs, but they do, they do occur in a context of a government that is determined to exercise responsible economic management and appropriate fiscal constraint, fiscal constraint particularly given the legacy with which we were bequeathed and the Australian people were bequeathed by those opposite. Supplementary question, Senator Macdonald. Well, Mr President, I asked the minister then, did Mr Tanner lie in suggesting that they were cuts to the budget and would save the uh, government money? And as the minister has very perceptively um, uh, 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 thought uh, through, right, how did or, order, Senator Macdonald? Point of order. Point of order, Mr. President. I thought you would have dealt with this yourself, but uh, I think uh, the, uh, by implication, the senator made uh, a slur against Sen uh, Mr. Tanner that he lied. I don't think that's an order, and I'd ask you to rule it out of order and ask him to rephrase his yes, question. Sir, um, order. Senator Evans, I had intended to raise it at the end of the question and not interrupt the question, but uh, Senator Macdonald, uh, you should I think you should withdraw the imputation that a minister is lying. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, I rephrase the question. Then, uh, uh, did, did, no, did the I've... minister, uh, Mr. Tanner, and the government deliberately mislead the Australian order. public? Order, in... order, Senator Ludwig. Senator Ludwig. The, uh, Senator Evans has asked that you rule on, and which you ruled upon, to withdraw that imputation. And I have not heard that imputation to be withdrawn. He has now commenced rephrasing the question. 
which is an entirely different matter altogether from the withdrawal of the imputation. The senator should withdraw the imputation as you have ruled accordingly. I'll uphold that point of order. I'd ask Senator MacDonald to withdraw I, the I imputation. Withdraw, Mr. Minister President, uh, and I uh, ask uh, the <coughs> minister then, did her government deliberately mislead the Australian public in suggesting that there would be savings right, okay. from uh, no, reductions right. announced to the Asia-Pacific Network for Energy Technology and Low Emissions Technology Abatement Program, the reduction in the no, no, Renewable Remote Power Generation Program, the slash funding for the CSIO research vessel, the Southern Surveyor, and the cutting of funding to the Asia-Pacific Forestry Skills and Capacity Building Global Initiatives on Forest and Climate Change, and further, how do cuts to those uh, uh, areas, if they happened, or if they didn't, I go back to my first question, if they did happen as cuts, how does that help uh, uh, addressing climate change? Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, I would first just indicate that um, uh, Senator <laughs> Sherry actually represents the uh, Minister for Finance in this chamber, if um, Senator Macdonald wasn't aware from that, of that. Uh, the, second, the second point I make is I've outlined in, in relation to the savings measures the, the ways in which those measures will be funded from alternative programs. Clearly they are savings measures. Uh, can I say in relation to the issue of climate change, it is quite extraordinary. It is quite extraordinary for those of us on this side of the chamber who have listened to the sceptics on that side, from the leader of the opposition in the cha this chamber down, quibbling about whether or not climate change was, it was occurring, being dragged kicking and screaming to addressing this issue prior to the election. It is extraordinary that now you come into this place and talk to us about the implementation of climate change Order. programs. Order. On relevance. My question had nothing to do with climate change sceptics. It was simply about uh, did the Labor government mislead the Australian public on suggesting there were cuts when the minister is now saying, A, in her first answer, there weren't cuts. In her answer to the supplementary, right. she's saying Senator, there is cuts. Senator, Which is it, Minister? Order, order, Which is order, it? Order, Senator Macdonald. Just starting to debate the issue. Um, Look, the minister uh, has, has the right to answer the question in the manner she sees fit, as long as it is some relevance. And in the past, we have allowed a reasonably broad interpretation of that. And I do believe that the minister was relevant. Have you concluded your answer, Senator? Evans? Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be taken on notice. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, during question time, I indicated that the ICT project blew up by 400 million. It was actually a blowout of 200 million. I also uh, said the savings of the Aztec Hard project had increased by 29 billion to 1.78 billion, when I meant to say 1.178 billion. I may also add, of course, the response regarding the five million call centre funding and the MyEFO statement concerning the funding made no mention whatsoever of Launceston. Are there motions to take? Oh, sorry, Senator Evans. Mr President, uh, I want to add to my response to the question asked me by Senator Minchin, uh, which I undertook to do. Um, Mr President, we are aware of the media reports referred to by Senator Minchin in relation to the situation in East Timor. The East Timorese government, the UN mission in East Timor and the International Stabilisation Force are currently in the process of ascertaining the full facts and details of the tragic events in uh, Dili on the morning of the 11th Senator February. Evans, order. Thank you. Just resume your seat. Senator Evans is addressing the chair, and there's too much conversation, Senator Macdonald. Senator Ian Macdonald, there's too much conversation around the chamber. People are leaving. Leave quietly. Senator Evans. Um, thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, um, uh, we're in the process of ascertaining the full facts and details surrounding those tragic events. And the Australian government will be very careful not to rush to judgment about the details of those events on the morning until the full and final facts have been determined. Yeah. Um, motions, any motions to take note of answers? Senator Abetz. Yes, there is, Mr Deputy President. And I uh, move that uh, the Senate take note of answers uh, given in question time today by ministers. Mr Deputy President, it is very hard to believe that Prime, Ministers Rudd, that Prime Minister Rudd promised the Australian people that his ministry would be solely appointed on the basis of merit. The performance we witnessed today shows that clearly many other factors were at play rather than merit. And in particular, Mr Deputy President, 
I want to focus on Senator Carr's performance today, which was both pitiful and arrogant, but more importantly, obfuscating. He, his Prime Minister's uh, own standards of ministerial ethics say, in part, at paragraph 4.4, ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of the exercise of public office in response to any inquiry by a member of the parliament. The first question asked of Minister Carr sees him breach this much vaunted new standard. A simple question, rule out the appointment of former Labor Premier Brax, and he is unwilling to do so. He's going to make the announcement tomorrow. He knows who is going to comprise the uh, Commission of Inquiry, whether it's going to be the Productivity Commission or his mate Steve Brax. But he was unwilling to rule it out. All that he was willing to rule out is that Steve Brax would be paid $2,000 a day. But then, when asked how much is he going to be paid, he arrogantly refused to answer the question. He's unable to deny that his department suggested a product Productivity Commission inquiry instead of a Brax gravy train. And so, confronted with that difficulty, he resorted to the old Labor tactic of raising the decibels to avoid the answer. He resorted to the blame game as well, which Prime Minister Rudd said would not be part of this government's approach. He resorted to the blame game and he foolishly resorted to his old opposition tactic of trying to blame the difficulties in the automotive industry on the previous government. Can I remind him that when he was confronted with the Mitsubishi closure, he very sensibly said, I'm not going to pretend that you can wave a magic wand and have this problem go away. I agree with him, and that is why I make no criticism of him. But yet, when confronted with some hard issues, he reverted back to his silly opposition tactic. And of course, what he did uh, that for was to try to obfuscate around the fact that undoubtedly Mr Brax has been chalked up for this inquiry. I hope that as a result of today's exposure, Mr Brax will no longer be appointed and the Productivity Commission will deal uh, with the issue because those that are involved in the automotive industry deserve nothing less. They need a highly professional Productivity Commission inquiry, not something, uh, not something led by a defunct Labor Premier and union hacks and a few other mates from the automotive industry. Now, on Mr Rudd's own standards, we have seen the appointment of a jobs for the boys situation with Mr Brax. We have seen indecent fees. We have seen the rejection of departmental advice, all in the first decision of this minister, all enunciated in the very first question that this minister has been asked. And of course, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, the Prime Minister would have us believe that Senator Carr was appointed on the basis of merit. You look through the ministerial list and you've got a doctor of economics, Dr. Craig Emerson, as his junior minister. Are we really saying that the hapless Senator Carr is in fact more skilled and competent than Dr. Craig Emerson? I think we know the answer to what occurred. Senator Carr is the spear carrier for the left from Western Australia, and by that virtue alone he had to be appointed to Cabinet, and people like Dr Craig Emerson had to be avoided. But, Mr Deputy President, coming back to the issue here, we have had on this very first day a refusal to deny jobs for the boys' appointment at an indecent fee and, Mr Deputy President, a refusal to acknowledge that departmental advice was rejected, and all those factors suggest Your that something has is expired, at play. Senator, I hope the is Senator Forshaw. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, the Australian pe people made their judgment about merit on the 24th of November, and the, the right. reduced representatives that sit on the other side of the House of Representatives and the reduced representation that will sit on the other side of the Senate after July demonstrates 
that on the issue of merit and performance, the coalition failed. Failed dismally. And the Australian people looked to Kevin Rudd and the Labor team to fix up the mistakes and take this country forward. And they voted for us overwhelmingly. Now today we have Senator Abetz get up and ask a question about jobs for the boys. I mean, why would any coalition senator ever want to go there? I mean, it would take me a lot longer than the five or minutes or so that I have to go through the list of all the, you know, the appointments made by the, the then coalition government while they were in office. All the mates that they put on to conduct inquiries. I just mentioned one, Mr Eston's the communications inquiry. But we could go on and on and on. But what about the real, the real important issues that they really don't want to raise, you would think, in the first taking note of question, answers to questions? Climate change, as our minister Penny Wong said, the Labor government's first action to ratify Kyoto. Our presence, our standing in the international community went up enormously in Bali at the climate change conference because of finally Australia joined the rest of the world to tackle the issue of climate change by signing Kyoto and then going on forward to establish the Gano inquiry. On the issue of the economy, you know, we were lectured so often by the former Treasurer and the former Prime Minister and other leaders and other representatives in this House and the other one about you know, they were the great economic managers. The coalition government that delivered a 16 interest rate rises during their entire time in office and seven of them in the last term. And we're now having to deal with the runaway inflation as a result of the, you know, the just unrestrained um, spending by this government in the last couple of elections endeavouring to buy their way back into office. And finally, the Australian people said enough's enough. We're not going to cop any more of these bribes in an election campaign. You know, these decisions made, these ad hoc decisions made on funding commitments. Despite that temptation, that carrot, they said enough's enough. We've had enough of this coalition government. We're going to give a Labor Party, so brilliantly led by Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, with a meritorious team of ministers the opportunity to right the wrongs. Yes, and backbench of <laughs> Senator Marshall. You know, the amount of talent and merit that's there on the backbench struggling to get on. I mean, we should enlarge the ministry, but unfortunately we can't. But I digress. But the issues of interest rates, of inflation, of doing something about the skills crisis in this country. Skills crisis that, that, that affect, affects so much of our manufacturing industry, including the vehicle industry. And Senator Carr, who was, you know, this pathetic attack by Senator Abetz on Senator Carr, who has undertaken to, to look properly and broadly at the manufacturing, the motor vehicle industry in this country. We've just had this, this um, announcement by Mitsubishi to close down. That's the problem that's been lumped on our desk at the very outset of getting into government after you people have been in office for 11 years. And Minister Carr has taken the issue on board and we're going to deal with it. So don't you come in here and lecture us. You've been sitting around for two months since the last election trying to figure out what, you know, what issues you can raise to attack us on. Well, you have none. You have none. Cost of living, you know, all those issues. The housing crisis. Education, we are, where we have made announcements in terms of what we're going to do to, to give young kids in this country greater educational opportunities. I could go on and on, Mr Deputy President, but my time's expired today. But I look forward to further opportunities to once again get up here and remind you people of what a pathetic bunch you really are. Um, I just remind honourable senators that during the motions to t take note of answers, I expect to hear the speaker in reasonable silence. I can understand that from time to time there will be some interjections, being, uh, uh, with human nature being what it is, but uh, normally people are entitled to silence. 
Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, an answer given by Senator Evans in his no, capacity. The, the, the motion has already been moved to take note of all answers. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'd, I'd like to raise um, some points in relation to an answer given by uh, uh, Senator Evans in his capacity as Senator as Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, and specifically about the rollback of the permit system, which the Labor Party has already announced as its, um, as its policy in Indigenous communities. This is a very important day for Indigenous Australians. Um, the, the debate and the discussion that has taken place and the, the uh, motions that have been presented to this chamber and also to the other place have demonstrated that. The attendance of um, hundreds of people, if not thousands of people outside and around Parliament House um, relay the significance of this day for Indigenous Australians, for many Indigenous Australians. And yet Senator Evans has suggested that the permit system, the rollback of the permit system, is going to somehow preserve and protect Indigenous Australians from those that seek to prey upon their vulnerabilities. I uh, take issue with this because it's simply absurd logic to suggest that the instigation of a permit system is going to prevent people who are already to prepared to break the law in so many other ways um, is just absurd. These people are pedophiles. These people are sly groggers. They're porn peddlers. They are the undesirable filth of Australian communities. They do not care two hoots for the law. They go in there and they will pursue their, their, their nefarious uh, aims irrespective of whether a permit system is in place or not. This is a very serious issue. What we don't need in this country is a return to a separation where one part of our land is only for Indigenous people and lawbreakers, whereas the rest of Australia is prevented from being in there. What we need is an open system where people within these communities can be held to account, where the people that seek to prey on their vulnerabilities are going to be held to account. We need a system where police can go in and check, where health workers can go in and check on the welfare of people. We need a system where journalists can go in and continue to hold um, uh, the conduct of those within these communities to account. Now, the importance of this is not simply in my mind. This is something shared, as Senator Scullion pointed out, by the first Indigenous leader of the Australian Labor Party. And whilst I normally don't quote um, Labor uh, uh, organisational figures, I think that Mr Warren Mundine, as a former national president, sums it up pretty well. He told the Weekend Australian that the move to reinstate the permit system could kill any chance that communities had of economic development. They could, it could kill any chance that Aboriginal communities had of economic development. He also went on and said the permit system didn't stop crime. In fact, he suggested that crime has flourished under the permit system, so it's a fallacy to say that it helps law and order problems. So I'll acknowledge that Senator Evans has a deep and meaningful interest in the plight of Indigenous people in this country, but who is better qualified to talk about it and make an objective assessment of it? An Indigenous leader who led Senator Evans' party or Senator Evans himself? I would suggest it's the former. And this is a very serious issue but because the very future of Indigenous people in our country is at stake. And Senator Mac uh, Minister Macklin has simply decided to roll back the clock on Indigenous affairs, pursuing some, some you know, determination that's existed within the Labor Party for the last 20 years and not acknowledging for a moment that we need a new approach. Today is a very symbolic day. It's a day about moving on. It's a day about moving forward. It is not a day that we should be have to, forced to talk about rolling back the system that is starting to make meaningful benefits for Indigenous people in this country. It is appalling that on such a day that Minister Evans, uh, Minister Evans representing Minister Macklin, is prepared to undo a lot of the symbolic uh, gestures that have gone forward, and I would encourage the Labor Party to revisit this policy because it is an appalling one that is playing politics with people's lives. It is simply an ideological uh, quest to uh, pursue 
uh, on behalf of the Labor Party. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And isn't it marvellous today, and I thank Senator Abetz for moving the motion to take note in the way that he does, because it allows me to deal with the range of questions asked by the opposition in question time today. And the elephant in the room, the question of the economy, the issue that the coalition claims was their issue, was absent from their questions list today. Indeed, they were offended by the truths which were put by Senator Evans in answer to a question which we put to him today. We actually expected that this, this opposition would try and uh, defend its record from when it was in government, but they weren't game to do that today. They avoided the question of the economy because they know that everything that Senator Evans said in answer to his question today was correct. You see, the inflation is our most pressing domestic challenge, and it is an inescapable fact that under the coalition our rate of underlying inflation grew and grew and grew to the point where, for the first time in an election campaign, we saw the Reserve Bank increase interest rates. Such was the pressure on the economy from growing inflation, inflation which was in effect caused by the inaction of the coalition when in government in relation to capacity constraints on the economy. And there were 20 occasions on which the Reserve Bank warned their government that those pressures were leading to problems in the economy. So we saw the December CPI data released in January showing underlying inflation at 3.6 per cent, well over the danger threshold so far as the Reserve Bank was concerned. The highest underlying inflation, in fact, in 16 years. So right through the coalition's time in government and a substantial part of the time of the previous government, that rate of underlying inflation hadn't been reached. But the pressures in the economy, the economy under the stewardship of the coalition had grown to the point where it is now clear that we not only have just seen a further rate increase in interest rates and we're seeing pressures from outside our economy increase interest rates, but we're also seeing the prediction, in fact, that the, the probability of an, interest, int, an additional interest rate rise being predicted at 70 per cent. They're the challenges that the Labor government now faces, taking the reins of this economy. And the fact that the coalition were not prepared to ask one question on the economy today, their first opportunity in this chamber, indicates that they realise that they made a shambles of the economic management of this country under their stewardship. They ignored the warnings from the Reserve Bank, 20 warnings about capacity constraints, and we're now paying the price. And indeed, unfortunately, homeowners and those with credit cards and other debts are likely to pay the price for some time to come. And it will take some time for this government to manage the economy and to get it back under control after this, gov this opposition, when in government, allowed it to escape its control to the point where the Reserve Bank, as I said, for the first time in history, increased interest rates during an election campaign. Such was the nature of the pressure that the Reserve Bank felt was coming on this economy. Let there be no doubt that Labor in government has a steely determination to win the war on inflation. We will take responsibility for fixing the problem, a problem which Labor did not create. And that's why Prime Minister Rudd has outlined the decisive action we will take by implementing his plan to fight it, implementing his plan to fight the inflation legacy that we have inherited. And we have noted that the opposition now denies that the highest underlying inflation in 16 years is a problem. And frankly, if they can't see it's a problem, it's no surprise that they allowed the problem to get out of control when in government. The fact is that homeowners, as I said, credit card holders, Anyone with a debt in this country, except those who were fortunate enough or wily enough to lock in interest rates in the past, will now pay a price in the immediate future and perhaps for some time to come 
on the debts that they have, the mortgages they have, the credit card debts that they have, and they will have the coalition government, the, the Howard government, to thank for the pressures that they're facing. Senator O'Brien, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise and am pleased to support the motion to take note of all answers given today. I do so particularly wishing to focus on Senator Evans's answer in relation to Indigenous affairs. But before I get to that, I'd just like to dwell for a moment on Senator O'Brien's remarks about the economy. Because, Mr Deputy President, no amount of hyperbole from Senator O'Brien or Mr Rudd or Mr Swan or Senator Ludwig or anybody else in this chamber or elsewhere, Senator no amount of hype from them can indeed change the reality of the great economy, the great economy that the Labor Party has inherited. 35-year lows in unemployment, strong growth in GDP, strong and stable inflation within the Reserve Bank's target range. No amount of hype can change the reality of a strong economy inherited by those opposite who indeed are a very lucky and fortunate government to have inherited that economy. And what people like Senator O'Brien and Mr Swan in particular need to be very mindful of is that their commentary now can change and influence the economy we get for the future. And Mr Swan in particular needs to stop urging the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates, needs to stop creating this inflationary crisis of his own making and needs to be very careful and mindful and judicious in the comments he makes as the Treasurer of this country. But, Mr Deputy President, as I said, in particular I wish to address Senator Evans's response to the issue of our Indigenous communities. And I do so on these days that are very symbolic both yesterday and today. And I welcome and embrace the changes that have been taken in the opening of the parliament yesterday, the very sincere apology given by both houses of the parliament today. And I hope that these symbolic acts will ensure that we take a very positive step forward as a nation towards reconciliation and healing and forgiveness between Indigenous peoples who feel that they have been wronged over the years and the rest of the Australian community. But that symbolism must be matched by the practical as well. We have seen the Rudd government already high on symbolism across a range of areas, starting with the signing of Kyoto and, of course, now in the Indigenous communities. And while I embrace that symbolism, I expect to see real action that backs it up, real action that in Indigenous communities addresses the fact that we have great disadvantage, real and great disadvantage that this government recognised and acted on very sincerely, disadvantage that sees, of course, such low educational standards, low life expectancy, poor health standards, low social capital, poor housing. These are the challenges that need to be met and confronted head on. Instead, we have a government that appears as though it's going to take us backwards in Indigenous policy. This government, the previous government, took some great steps last year in trying to tackle endemic disadvantage in our Indigenous communities, and particularly those communities in the Northern Territory. We now see a government that is committed to rolling that back, to rolling that back by reintroducing a permit system that was discredited and a reason for the harm that was, a reason for the harm that was created and festering in many of these communities, and a government that's going to reintroduce CDEP, a program that provided sit-down money that didn't encourage the economic development of the communities. We heard from my colleague and friend Senator Bernardi before some of the comments of the Labor Party's former federal president, Warren Mundine, in regard to this. The fact that the permit systems didn't stop crime, that it's a fallacy to say they help law and order. And indeed it is. Senator Evans claims that reintroducing permits can help protect these communities. Well, that was not the case for the decades after decade on which these permits were based and existed. So Senator Evans needs to reconsider the logic of his argument there, because as The Australian wrote on the 18th of January this year, history shows that pedophiles, sly groggers, porn peddlers and other undesirables either ignore permits or collude with the gatekeeper. The permit system did not work. 
Labor claims that they'll help the development of communities. That also is shown to be a fallacy. Galawoy Yinapingu, former Australian of the Year and land rights campaigner last year in relation to the Howard government reforms, said, I believe this new model will empower traditional owners to Order. control the Senator development of towns and living your areas. Your time has expired. Senator Allison? Uh, no, uh, the motion was to take note of all answers, so you're automatically in order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Senator Lynn Allison. Um, I, I wish to take note of the answer provided by the minister representing the Minister for Education. And uh, I want to firstly say that we're pleased that the Labor government is moving on preschool, but I was disappointed in the minister's um, uh, ability to answer the question concerning the many other issues that plague uh, Indigenous um, education. Uh, and even if you uh, just focus on preschool, there are some huge problems to be addressed here. So it's not enough to say, well, um, all four-year-olds need to be in preschool in remote areas. Uh, what we know is that, uh, that there are measures that need to be put in place to see that they thrive in these circumstances, one of which is that they, be, uh, that they have made available to them bilingual education, and that certainly needs Indigenous education workers who are locally based, because the evidence shows that they will attract attendance and they'll be much more successful in the transformation from childhood through uh, preschool into school. But um, as I said, there are, there are huge problems both within um, preschool education and beyond. And the Senate inquiry in 2004 of the Education Committee had, uh, found, had an enormous um, number of uh, very serious and worrying findings and made 34 uh, recommendations for action. And I think pretty much none of those recommendations has been, was taken up by the last government, and I would hope that this new government would, uh, would make an announcement as soon as possible that it will do so. Uh, if you just look at some of the health problems associated with Indigenous education uh, on our many inquiries into this subject, um, uh, diseases like otitis media, which, which if untreated, can cause deafness, complete deafness in fact, and this is a major problem for uh, children attending school. If they can't hear anything, then they're not likely to turn up day after day. Uh, we also know that uh, there are very, very high levels of trachoma. A study recently conducted showed that in northwest Australia, uh, up to 50 per cent and more of children have what's called active trachoma, and that can lead to blindness. So, as with so many other issues for Indigenous people, it's not, it's not wise and it's not possible to solve problems by simply taking them one at a time. That it's to do with, in the case of education, uh, the availability of teachers who are properly skilled in Indigenous education in these remote areas. It's to do with, uh, with as I say, the necessity of, uh, of providing a learning environment which is in a, both a culturally suitable environment and one which, uh, which includes the language of the, of, uh, that, that which is spoken by that child. And we need to fix some of those health problems, which frankly can only be fixed if we fix the housing problems. So this, the, the extent of the problems in Indigenous communities are such that uh, cherry-picking bits and pieces and coming up with bright ideas on, uh, such as Labor has done, and uh, again, you know, I welcome it, but uh, what we want to see from Labor is a much more comprehensive approach which will solve some of those educational problems from across the board. Let me just mention a couple of the other problems we discovered. Uh, in the Northern Territory, there are parts uh, of uh, com um, Aboriginal communities where there, there are substantial sized primary schools but no availability whatsoever of secondary schools. And why the Commonwealth has allowed the Northern Territory to get away with this for so long, I can't imagine. There are schools that are poorly equipped. Uh, frankly, you wouldn't put your dog in some of the ones that I've been into, and yet we've seen no substantial increase in funding for infrastructure. Uh, we have the Northern Territory still, as I understand it, funding schools on the basis of average attendance. So, in other words, at the beginning of the semester or when 
the weather is right, when it's not the wet season, um, there may be uh, too many students to even fit in a classroom. Uh, because they're funded for the average, they'll be huge class sizes. Necessarily, these students drift off. Uh, they become disinterested in education, if they were ever interested in the first place, and they disappear. So that has to be fixed. Um, Housing, as I said, it's not uncommon in indigenous communities for 20 people to be uh, in the same in, in one house, and uh, this means there are very few books for children. There's no order, time for quiet order. study Your or advancement of their expired. education. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Betts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. Petitions, Clark. Petitions have been lodged in accordance with police circulated to senators. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion? Senator Nettle. Thank you. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Marriage Act of 1961 to create marriage equality for all relationships regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity and for related purposes. Any further notices of motion? Senator Ludwig. Uh, uh, sorry, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the bills as set out in the list circulated in the Chamber. I table statements of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have these statements incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Uh, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the following bill be introduced, uh, a bill for an act to provide ex gratia payments to be made to the stolen generations of Aboriginal children and for related purposes. Further notices of motion? Senator Seward. Sorry, Deputy President, I had my hair cut again. Uh, <laughs> Senator Seward, I have never complained about that. <laughs> I seem to remember having problems last time I had my hair cut. Deputy President. Deputy President, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate notes um, takes note of the evidence provided to the government by its ship, the Oceanic Viking of Wales, being slaughtered in Australia's Antarctic territorial waters, expresses deep concern at the continued killing of these whales in our waters, urges the government to take immediate action to ensure an end to the slaughter of our whale population, including through the commencement of legal action. Further notices of motion, Senator Nettle. Thank you. Um, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate notes the comments of the Commissioner-General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency on 29 January th this year that the blockade of Gaza has incarcerated 1.5 million Palestinians, reduced to barely subsistence levels their supplies of food, medicine, fuel and other necessities, and has generated fear and fury and distress amongst Palestinians through the airstrikes, incursions, assassinations and other military action that regularly takes civilian lives, and calls on the Australian government to make representations to the Israeli government to immediately lift the blockade of Gaza. Further notices of motion? No further notices of motion. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice No. 7 to the 14th of February, General Business Notice No. 10 to the 14th of February and General Business Notice No. 5 to the 14th of February. Right now I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business and in doing so I intend to leave, um, to go through the red in order, uh, leaving the possibility of number six under general business notices of motion till the end. So, if I can proceed with government business notices of motion number seven. Uh, thank you, Deputy Senator President. Ludwig. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that government business notice. Of motion number seven relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for tomorrow be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Ludwig. Thank you. I move the motion. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Ludwig be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, I think the ayes have it. 
Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. I ask that government business notice of motions numbers 8 and 9 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to these motions being taken together and as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that the following bills be introduced. A bill for an act to give effect to the model law on cross-border insolvency of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and for related purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the law relating to the financial sector and for related purposes. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ludwig. Thank you, Deputy President. I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed without formalities and be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Cross-Border Insolvency Bill 2008 and an associated bill. <laughs> Senator Ludwig. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 1116, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to the next day of sitting, which is more than 14 days after today. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that these bills be listed on the notice paper as a separate order of the day. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Minchin. Uh, thanks, Mr Deputy President. Um, I ask the general business notice of motion number one, standing in my name for today, relating to the death of Trooper David Pearce, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Minchin. Thanks, Mr. Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number two, standing in my name right, for the day. You're putting the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you've got to move. I, I move that motion. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Minchin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against aye. say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Minchin. Thanks, Mr. Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number two, standing in my name for today, relating to the death of Sergeant Matthew Locke, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Minchin. I move the motion, standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Minchin. Uh, I ask the general business notice of motion number three, standing in my name for today, relating to the death of Private Luke Worsley, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Minchin. I move the motion, standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Fielding. Thanks, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number four, standing in my name for today, relating to the restoration of bills, the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Fielding. Mr President, I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Feeling. Uh, oh, sorry. That's a restoration. No, you're right. Now, we'll deal with, um, I think the next one is number 12. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 12 standing in my name relating to the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Defence Act 1903 to provide for parliamentary approval of overseas service uh, by members of the Defence Force. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you. I present the bill and move that the bill proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Defence Act 1903 to provide for parliamentary approval of overseas service by members of the Defence Force. Senator Bartlett. 
Uh, I move that the bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table the explanatory memorandum to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Lynn Allison, I think that leaves your motion as the only outstanding motion for consideration under formality. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask the General Business Notice of Motion Number Six, standing my name for today, relating to the United Nations Mine Action Coordination Centre for Southern Lebanon, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Lynn Allison. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. Noes have it. No further motions for formality. Any MPI urgency motion? There being none. Tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I present additional information received by the Finance and Public Administration Committee relating to additional and budget estimates. Any any other any other reports? For Additional estimates. Uh, there is uh, Senator Faulkner. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. I table particulars of proposed expenditure as well as the issues from the advance to the Finance Minister as a final charge for the year ended 30 June 2007 and the final budget outcome 2006-07 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to legislative and general purpose standing committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I move that a the documents I have just tabled be referred to uh, committees for examination and report, and b consideration of the advance to the minister, the finance minister, in committee of the whole be made an order of the day for the day on which committees report on their examination of the additional estimates. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I table portfolio additional estimate statements and a portfolio supplementary additional estimate statement for 2007-08 for the portfolios and executive departments in accordance with the list circulated in the chamber. I can report, uh, Mr Deputy President, that copies are available from the Senate table office. Any ministerial statements? Presentation of documents. Presentation of documents. I present the report of the Commonwealth Ombudsman for 2006-2007 on activities in monitoring controlled operations conducted by the Australian Crime Commission, Australian Federal Police and the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. Any presentation of documents by ministers? By the clerk. None. Committee memberships? Any committee memberships? No. None, at stage. None at this stage. All right. Messages from the House of Representatives. Any? Messages have been received from the House of Representatives transmitting for concurrence resolutions relating to the formation of joint committees. The Leader. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I move that consideration of the messages be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of the day. Motion to take note of the national apology to the stolen generation. Resume debate. Um, well. I, I was advised, thank you, uh, Senator Joyce. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I'm pleased to be the uh, 
uh, final speaker from the Democrats on this motion. All Democrat senators have spoken to it in noting the, the very significant uh, motion of apology that was passed by this Senate chamber without dissent uh, earlier today, as well as, of course, in the House of Representatives. Uh, it is a very welcome motion, uh, like all motions uh, that are drafted by others. You could always pick a word or two where you think, uh, well, I would have expressed it differently. But uh, as the Prime Minister himself has said, uh, this uh, motion, this resolution is not uh, about politicians, it's about the stolen generations themselves. And to me, this motion has clearly been drafted uh, with a lot of consultation uh, from uh, Indigenous people, who all, of course, have their own individual views uh, about this, as with every other issue, uh, and, of course, um, put forward in a way that seeks to uh, receive unanimity to give it maximum strength and maximum significance. And I think it has clearly been put forward uh, in the right spirit. And it is, I think, a very strong and powerful motion, and it's one that I'm very pleased to give support to. Uh, it has often been said that uh, words uh, are not sufficient, and of course that is true, but words are very important. Uh, we'd be in a bit of trouble here in this chamber if words didn't have importance, because that's about all we do here, is speak. Uh, and we speak of important things, we put important things on the record, uh, we pass laws that are made of words, and uh, we as with all human beings, uh, provide a large, uh, a large component of our uh, communication using words in various forms. And these words are very powerful and they're very important. And I know that uh, they will provide uh, real meaning, real comfort um, and a uh, real positive sense of uh, relief and of uh, thankfulness about the clear recognition that is provided via the words uh, of the motion that the Senate has passed. Uh, I'd also suggest that uh, whilst, of course, uh, passing a motion, any motion, uh, does not provide health care, does not provide in itself uh, resources, does not provide better education, does not in itself uh, provide uh, the concrete assistance that is needed by so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, but I, I do think it's misleading to say that uh, a motion in itself does not have any practical effect, does not have any positive benefit in itself, because it clearly does. Uh, there is no doubt that a significant part of the difficulties faced by so many Indigenous Australians today uh, result in part uh, not all, but in part, from uh, the unresolved uh, emotional and spiritual trauma that they, so many of their families, of their peoples, have suffered over so many years. And there is a real problem with uh, mental health issues, with spiritual health uh, for many Indigenous Australians, in part because that trauma has not been acknowledged, has not been fully recognised, has been continually downplayed or dismissed. Uh, so it does have a direct positive effect for some people, not for everybody, but for some people, uh, to adopt resolutions like this if they are done in the right spirit and with genuine intent, and I believe that has happened today. Uh, there is, I think, no doubt that for some people this will be a significant part of healing for them. And healing is not imaginary. Just because it's in the heart, it's in the soul, it's in the mind does not mean it's imaginary. Uh, so this does provide direct positive benefit for some individuals, and that should not be dismissed. Uh, of course more needs to be done, as the resolution itself says. Uh, when it says the time has come, for righting the wrongs of the past. Uh, this motion, at least as I read it, does not say, OK, we've passed it, all the wrongs are now righted. Uh, this is part of turning that page. Uh, this resolution goes not just to the stolen generations, but for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments, and I would say also uh, of, uh, of views of so many in the general community. Uh, actions across the board that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss uh, on Indigenous Australians, uh, not just stolen generations' practices themselves. 
Uh, so that is also acknowledged in the general, if not in the specific, in this resolution. Uh, but it is not sufficient, and that's why I do also welcome the fact that the Prime Minister took the opportunity in speaking to this resolution to not just support the words in it but to set goals uh, of uh, commitments for his government and for this parliament, I would believe, not just the government but for this parliament and I would hope the wider Australian community to seek to bridge and remove those gaps, those inequalities. Uh, this provides a platform for that and it's up to all of us to make sure we take advantage of that platform. It doesn't matter what words you put in here, the task is still before us to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity that's provided. And I'd have to say one of those tasks is the need to address the significant level of antagonism towards Indigenous Australians that clearly still exists among a significant proportion of the Australian community. Uh, you only had to look at uh, letters to the editor, comments on websites, talkback radio, uh, quite clearly. Uh, a significant number of Australians uh, are still very antagonistic towards any sort of recognition of uh, the unique role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who had a problem with uh, a formal apology is antagonistic to Indigenous people. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that it's quite clear from the specific comments, uh, I think the, the uh, um, bigoted and prejudiced comments that a number of Australians make in regard to this issue since it's been raised that there is still a serious problem there and it is, it is not un-Australian, it is not um, uh, unpatriotic to raise that. I think it is actually unpatriotic to continue to ignore that uh, and that means that there is a job for all of us in, as community leaders, not just in the parliament but across the board to address that antagonism, not just by going out and saying everybody's a bigot and a racist who doesn't agree, uh, but you do need to nonetheless acknowledge that that, um, that bigotry exists and to tackle head on the uh, clear uh, falsehoods that are put forward by some people uh, to justify uh, that bigotry uh, and to address some of the ignorance that still lies uh, out there in the general community uh, and the ignorance that still exists in so many of us uh, one of the uh, issues or one of the statements of the former Prime Minister that I often agreed with uh, was his uh, comments that we needed to learn more about Australian history. Uh, and one area where so many of us are still woefully ignorant uh, is the reality of the history of Indigenous Australians, history of Indigenous Australians before um, British arrival and uh, before that, uh, before British arrival, of course, other Europeans arrived here and before that, of course, uh, others from Asia arrived here. Uh, but of the history even prior to that, but of course even more so the history since colonisation, because there is still a lot of ignorance about that. And of course there are a lot of positives there, but there are some absolutely appalling atrocities uh, that we simply refuse to acknowledge. Uh, I do wish to take the opportunity to repeat my long-standing view and the Democrats' long-standing view that there is still a need to revisit the other recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. Um, particularly in regard to compensation. This resolution uh, of an apology is a standalone thing, as it should be, and I don't believe it should have addressed the issue of compensation. It doesn't in itself open up compensation. There's no doubt about that, despite some of the furfies put around. But I believe there is still a linked need to address the issue of compensation. If you go back to the rationale for the apology and the recommendation, recommendation number three, page 282 of the Bringing Them Home report, it makes clear in coming to the rationale of that recommendation that it is a package. An acknowledgement and apology goes hand in hand with guarantees against repetition, measures of restitution, measures of rehabilitation and monetary compensation. And that is based upon long-standing international principles regarding reparation and acknowledgement, uh, named as the Van Boven principles that are detailed in that report. Uh, they are intertwined and we should not seek to just slice them apart. So I would repeat my call uh, that that issue be re-examined uh, by the Senate, as the Senate committee did after this report came down in the late 1990s. Uh, and I think it's unacceptable that the federal government has just dismissed that out of hand without even re-examining it. Uh, and that's what I call for and I will reintroduce my legislation uh, that seeks to provide one example of how compensation could be provided. 
that is another issue we can go on with. But we should all celebrate this resolution that was passed here today. Senator Joyce. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, look, it's, it's an interesting day today, and when walking around, you meet some very decent uh, people, um, Indigenous people. And so everything you say, you have to temper in the fact that there is no point in insulting people, and there's no point of uh, uh, making a statement of belligerence uh, for the purpose of what. The concern is today that uh, even today you could see in, in, the, in the, the way the question time is going that the issues move on. And the biggest concern is that this issue will move on and, in fact, um, will be left behind. And in a year's time from now is when we truly can judge whether this was just a rhetorical day where, uh, where there was a great, a great sense of um, presence and possibly a sense of theatre, but it never actually delivered anything. Uh, in a year's time is when we have the ability to look back and say, well, did, it, did anything actually really get better for Indigenous people? Were their lives improved? Did we make uh, concrete statements to go out to, to where these people live and, and pick up the economies of those areas so as to pick up the health and the education and everything that goes with it? I know there are Australians out there who have serious doubts about this issue. Uh, I know that. I know everyone's drawing their, their, their affinities to the Indigenous issue, but uh, having, coming from Danglemar and going to uh, primary school in Woolbrook and having lived in Moree and Charleville, currently living in St George, I think I'm the furthest senator from the coast, um, having a house in Weiris Creek, I suppose I spent most of my life um, around um, Indigenous people and, and probably enriched because of it. But there's always a sense that Sometimes things turn into junkets, and if this thing turns into compensation, it'll turn to a junket where money just gets poured um, in all sorts of directions, but generally in the directions of solicitors in Sydney and Melbourne. And, and who does it profit at the end except them? Now, who, who's the actual benefactor of it at the end except them? We saw that in so many of the, the land rights issues. And that is an eternal frustration for so many people in regional Australia that see that uh, so many of these statements are made down here. With all, the, with all the right atmosphere and all the right intentions, but where it all ends up is nowhere. And that is one of the frustrations I hope does not become evident after this process is, is finished. Um, there are certainly things in our history that you know, we need to uh, be concerned about. I, I can recollect stories that people have told me. I can think of the one where one person told me how their father went out and shot Aboriginals and uh, then grabbed the children by the back legs and smashed their head across a rock to kill them. Now that is a story that I heard. And uh, the person who was telling me had no reason to lie, and uh, I was extremely disgusted and, uh, and disturbed by, by what he had said. I know, obviously, this, we all know the stories of the Mile Creek Massacre, of uh, the putting of arsenic into flour. We also know the stories of retribution, where uh, Aboriginals were driven over cliffs um, to, uh, to try, well, basically just to kill them. And now those things, I am truly, uh, you know, offended that, you know, of, of any association that, uh, the, of any people with that. But it was never an association by the government. It was never an association by the government. It was an association by individuals who are criminals, not by the government. So I don't believe that. The government put forward policies with malice aforethought. That the government put forward policies that were distinctly um, targeted to be some sort of final solution. Because in some of the scripting, that's the way these things are, are, are seen, and I don't think that is right. They may have been misguided. They may have been wrong. They may have need to be corrected. But were they policies with malice aforethought? And that is—I don't know whether that's a blemish that we want. On our nation, we, we have every right to correct. We have every right to say, in a greater light, we have better knowledge, and he shouldn't have done it. But this is uh, not something I suggest that is the case. Um, in this process of going through this debate, it has to be said that a very dangerous precedent was created in this whole debate. This idea that we, are, like I am, I'm discussing an issue now, but the vote's gone. The vote's over. And we know it's a very important issue, but we've, we've, we've created a very dangerous precedent um, that 
um, once you've created it once, it becomes the excuse for others. And I think that needs to, needs to see the full light. And after this day has cooled down and after the, you know, the media have ha had their uh, time with it, I think we should really reflect on what we did today. That was ha carry a vote um, without actually acknowledging that the, the debate can influence people. If you respect this chamber, you must respect the belief that people can say things that influence you. And today I've had the capacity to walk around and talk to Indigenous people, and they have influenced me because I'm a human being and, and you're affected by what people say to you. But to circumvent the process of the Senate and say there is a reason for that is, is really opening yourself wide up for things that may happen in the future. And I, don't think, I think that should be acknowledged. I don't think we, we should ever do it again. And I think people should be brought into question as to whether we could have conducted this in a better way so as not to circumvent and disrespect the process of the Senate. Um, Another flaw, I think, is we see the world in 2008 is, 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 is a world, but the world of 2008 isn't the world of when the initial acts were written in 1869. It was on the premise of an 1864 act. Um, it's a different world even to the 1970s. And we've got to be very careful that we don't start judging people's views of then by our views and values of now. Uh, there are people who did the wrong thing, but I don't think that. Uh, Certain nuns who, who honestly would have believed they were trying to advance the, the condition of uh, fellow Australians who are Indigenous, I, I don't think we should target them with the word stolen because I don't think they believed that they were stealing anybody. I don't believe that they thought that they were doing a criminal act. And the pejorative term stolen st sends that the people who did it were criminals, and they weren't. And so this is, uh, this is an issue that I also think needs to be, in the cold light of day, reflected on. And we've had a lot of symbolism here today, but we all know that symbolism neither feeds nor clothes nor cures anybody. And the issue of this will be judged whether in Wurrabinda or Kanamala or Burktown or Doomaji or maybe in Walgett or Tipperborough or White Cliffs, that the pe lives of the people actually get better. That will be the real judgment of what happens here today. That will be the real judgment. And um, if it becomes a, 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 a lawyer's feast, if, uh, when, uh, unfortunately, I would have liked to have seen the legal advice tabled, not because of political point scoring, but if this turns into a legal feast, then that just completely um, disavows a, a whole uh, clarity of what we were trying to do. And it also opens the avenue for other people to just be financial benefactors of the Indigenous issue. And that's happened so many times. So many people basically, uh, to be quite honest, white solicitors with harbour views become the, the financial benefactors of these issues by turning them into sort of a, a legal morass. And if that happens because of this, then that, I think, is, 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 not, a, is not a good issue. But in summary, um, uh, and to close, uh, there is a feeling, there is a, an immense sentiment in the nation, I acknowledge it, and I have changed my view of a sense of uh, reconciliation, true reconciliation, where people are talking to one another and acknowledging the humanity of one another and, seeing th and, and putting aside uh, their conceits and, and maybe some of, some of the views they had prior to this. And maybe that inception has happened today. And if that happens today, that is a good thing. If that is a true inception of reconciliation, of me understanding someone better th than I did before, and possibly them understanding myself and, uh, and uh, other views, then, then that is a great step. I hope that, that, view, that unfortunately, that view of uh, reconciliation has already had, in some instances today, the winds of animosity blowing through it and uh, blowing out the candles of reconciliation. And I hope that doesn't happen. If there's one good thing that happens from today, it's that we all go on a path together where, as a nation, we make lives not better just for Indigenous people, but for all Australians in general. Senator. Have we got Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. Deputy President, Australia changed this week. And I think it's really a very emotional and exciting week for this country. When I was first elected to this parliament in 2004, I gave my inaugural speech the following year. And I said then 
What gives me hope is the increasingly loud and urgent cry from the heart of Australians everywhere for a return to what we know in our heart of hearts is country, a return to the spirit of the land and the expansive values of goodness, honesty, justice, fairness, equality, generosity, freedom and ecological stewardship that are for Australians inherent in the concept of country. I went on to say that I'm, what I was talking about in the concept of country is a precious insight we've learned from our Indigenous people. It incorporates the land and their stories. It's not jingoistic. In talking about country, we must as a nation progress reconciliation with Indigenous people. We must also progress our own reconciliation with country, our own sense of place and identity. And driving here this morning, I couldn't help but being quite overwhelmed and very emotional as I came around the front of Parliament at half past seven in the morning and people <laughs> were streaming to the Parliament at that hour. I, I have no recollection of any other time in my experience where people were coming from all over the city to the Parliament to join Indigenous people from all over the country who had already arrived here for the convergence yesterday. And they were lining up in dignified silence but quiet yearning and excitement about the fact that at last this parliament seemed to be in touch with the feeling of the nation. And as I, I witnessed that, I thought this is actually a nation-changing event. It is something that I had hoped would have that impact, but I felt that as I saw all of those people coming towards the parliament. And after the official apology given by the Prime Minister this morning around in the coffee shop here at parliament, I had the um, good fortune to meet an Indigenous woman called Lois who said to me, I am proud to be an Aboriginal woman in Australia today and it's the first time I have been able to say that in my life. So things have already changed. And yesterday at the convergence, speaking to Luigia O'Donoghue, she said of the rain yesterday as the welcome to country was taking place, it is the tears of joy of our ancestors, referring to the fact that we, the elected representatives of the people of Australia, were seeking permission from the indigenous owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people, for permission to meet and walk on their land. That is what changed. It is, it is extraordinary and it is, it's a really deep yearning inside indigenous people for recognition and for an expression of sorrow and regret for what has been done to them but it's also a breaking down of the damn wall for all the people across Australia who have marched for reconciliation, who have moved right across the country for re uh, recompense and restitution for the wrongs that have been done to Indigenous people, and it hasn't happened, and now there's a sense that it might happen. I feel particularly humble as well because I was in balance of power in Tasmania in 1997 and I helped to negotiate the apology to the stolen generation in the Tasmanian parliament with a liberal minority government. And we did it in a tripartite way and we brought onto the floor of the House Tasmania's indigenous people. And Annette Pearden responded for the indigenous Tasmanians and for the stolen generation. And it was a particularly dignified occasion and Tasmania has moved on because of that ownership of all political parties of the apology, of the recognition of the wrong that had been done, that it has been now moved to a smooth process of compensation. And the same is occurring in Western Australia and it can and will happen nationally. There are terrible stories of what has happened. For example, an Aboriginal boy runs through a Hobart street carrying eight and a half pints of stolen milk. The milk has a value of nowadays $1.12. It is the 1960s. Within days, 
Not only the boy, but the family's three other children have been rounded up and made wards of the state. In court, a welfare officer says the boy's behaviour is typical of, quote, people of their origin. I cannot imagine, as a, as a mother, what it would feel like to have your children taken from you in this way, in any way, but in this way. I cannot imagine the loss of living one's life and going to your grave never knowing and the loss for the children who never know the love of their parents. And in fact, the children um, in, in the, one of the submissions from New South Wales in the Bringing Them Home report said this, we may go home, but we cannot relive our childhoods. We may reunite with our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunties, uncles, communities, but we cannot relive the 20, 30, 40 years that we spent without their love and care and they cannot undo the grief and mourning they felt when we were separated from them. We can go home to ourselves as Aboriginals, but this does not erase the attacks inflicted on our hearts, minds, bodies and souls by caretakers who thought their mission was to eliminate us as Aboriginals. The Greens have said sorry in the parliaments around this country but I am, I am very grateful for the opportunity to say sorry again and to support the Rudd government in making this official apology uh, to the stolen generation. I think of, in particular of people like Archie Roach, who have campaigned for this day for many, many years as one of the stolen generation himself. His famous 1990 album, Charcoal Lane, in which he, he, his song took the children away, moved the nation, and still does. And in that song he says, they taught us to read, to write and pray, then they took the children away, took the children away. The children away, snatched from their mother's breast, said this is for the best, took them away. The welfare man, the policeman said, you've got to understand, because we'll give to them what you can't give and teach them how to really live. Teach them how to live, they said, humiliated them instead. And they taught them that and taught them this and others taught them prejudice. They took the children away, took the children away, breaking their mother's heart, tearing us all apart, took them away. And today I note that Archie Roach has said, like many Aboriginal people, he hoped the apology would be a beginning rather than an end. Once this is done, he said, perhaps we can then make an inroads into other issues. I understand that an apology is not going to solve all the problems or the plight of Aboriginal people, but it's going to help. It's going to help people to feel a bit more free to go ahead. It will help me and my children. That is something which I find incredibly humbling. Uh, what I find in particular so overwhelmingly humbling is the the dignity and the tolerance and the wisdom and the nobleness of the Indigenous people who are accepting this apology and accepting it in good faith as a first step. And it must be a first step. It must be a first step to reparation, to compensation, and it must be a first step to say to Australia's Indigenous people uh, that we are serious about reconciling with them and coming home to country and assisting them to come home to their country and, as Australians, recognising that this is a brand new day. In the words of um, Ujiru Nunakal, look up, my people, the dawn is breaking, the world is waking to a, bright, uh, to a new bright day where none defame us, no restriction tame us, nor colour shame us, nor sneer dismay. This is an historic day and I am so pleased to be able to be here to say sorry to the stolen generation of Australia's Indigenous people.